the fide, rebirth and resistance. I am against boys becoming heroes at 10. Against the tree flowering explosives against branches becoming scaffolds against the rosebeds turning to trenches and yet. When fire cremates my friends my youth. And country how can I. Stop a poem from becoming a gun? Our Ashid Hussain, opposition. IAELs. Lightning. Victory in the sixth day war followed a month of dejection and demoralization in face of Nasser's bellicose maneuvers. Immediately afterward, things of course looked very diff, front. In addition to taking the Golan Heights from Syria and the Sinai from Egypt, Israel's forces had driven Jordan's Arab Legion from the West Bank and the Egyptian army from the Gaza Strip, uniting the territory of the old Palestine Mandate and bringing the majority of Palestinians under Israeli control, see Map 6. Over 600,000 West Bankers could now resume contact with the more than 300,000 Palestinians in the Strip and with a similar number living in Israel's pre-1967 boundaries. One, the war also precipitated an other exodus of Palestinians from Palestine. Approximately 250,000 fled for the remnant of Jordan, the East Bank. The war is one of several events in the latter half of the 20th century, others be in the dissolution of the French and British empires and the So-Viet Union, and the reunification of Germany, that radically transformed the world map. Its results were correspondingly momentous for both Israeli Arab citizens and Palestinians in the newly occupied territories. To everyone's surprise, the nature of the conflict in which Jews and Arabs were embroiled was now different. After 1948, the conflict had seemed largely international, the armistice agreements, continuing border tensions, the Suez War in 1956, all involved sovereign states. From this perspective, both to its own Jewish citizens and to a larger world public, Israel seemed small and beleaguered, sir, rounded by much larger, hostile states that refused to accept its right to exist. Following the 1967 war, the focus gradually drifted back to the communal problem, as in the days of the mandate, two peoples, Jews and Palestinians, claiming the same piece of soil. Israel's image thus shifted, much to the frustration of its supporters, from Bali, Gewer to all-powerful. With the territory of historical Palestine reassembled under a sin, GLE authority for the first time since 1948, the bulk of the Palestinians once more stood face to face with the Jews, their long-standing enemies, representing an alien culture and religion. The reality of what was an almost perfect reversal of the two communities' proportions in the last years of the mandate, three million Jews now ruling slightly more than one million Palestinians, has been shrewdly and succinctly captured by poet Samai al Qasim. Ladies and gentlemen, we are here on a crossroad. Two, the Palestine Liberation Organization, led by Yasser Arafat and his Fater faction, would now become the institutional vehicle for. Lebanon, Golan Heights, Acre Hafer, Sea of Galilee, Syria, Nazareth, Mediterranean Sea, Jenin Chilkum, Nablus, West, Tel Aviv Jaffer, Lyalod, Bank, Ramallah, Israel, Ramla Jerusalem, Jericho, Jordan, Gaza, Gaza Strip, Bethlehem, Hebron, Bishbur, Negev, Occupied Sinai, Eilat Akaber, Gulf of Akaber, Map 6, Israel and Occupied Territories of the West Bank and Gaza Strip, Attracting and Directing the Charged Emotions of the Palestinians. It would shape their self understanding although stumbling when it tried to mobilize their society under the single ideological umbrella of Palestinism and under the noses of hostile governments. But der, spite its centrality, it was the resources of that society that would en able the organization to play such a prominent role. Reflecting this interplay of leaders and followers, the Palestinians developed three heroic images in the face of the difficult post-1967 conditions, the fide, lit, one who sacrifices himself, was a mod, earn metamorphosis of the holy warrior. 
Sacrificing himself in the battle against Zionism, he was portrayed with head wrapped in the distinctive checkered Palestinian kefia, gripping a Kalishnokov. The image drew on memories of those who had manned the rebel groups from 1936 to 1939 and on idealized portraits of peasants as salt of the earth, even though the membership of the PLO, which heavily promoted the image, was primarily cosmopolitan and from the cities, its early popularity bolstered the PLO claim to be the sole legitimate Palestinian representative. The image of the survivor also evoked the fast-disappearing feller. But this was a more passive hero, demonstrating sumud, or steadfastness. Enduring the humiliations imposed by the Khan, Kuer, he confirmed his sumud by staying on the land at all costs, a bitter lesson learned from 1948. Eventually, even those not tilling the land but simply staying in the occupied territories came to Epit, Amir's sumud. Finally, the survivor's counterpart was the child of the stone, often exemplified through portraits of the Shaheed, or martyr, offering his life for the national cause by fighting against all odds. Modeled partly on the role of the Shabab in the 1936-39 re vault, this was the adolescent willing to confront the enemy through rock-throwing, tire-burning, manning shoulder-mounted anti-tank rockets, and so forth. At the end of the 1960s and in the 1970s, the Fide dominated the Palestinian symbolic universe, as Palestinians groped for a response to the new conditions wrought by the June War. In the 1980s, images of the survivor and the child of the stone became more prominent, challenging what had become basic tenets of Palestinian society. Fater. As two of his biographers put it recently, the ordinary facts of Arafat's life, his place of birth, his parents, his childhood, his adieu, lessons, lay buried in the soil of his distant homeland, three later, this vagueness would fuel myths among the Palestinians, hungry for a larger-than-life leader. One common story is that Arafat was born in Jerusalem, although more reliable evidence indicates he was actually born in Gaza and grew up in Egypt, another is that he was part of the Husseini clan, a connection that might have benefited him at one point, but became a liability as the Ayan were discredited. He is also said to have been a member of the Muslim Brotherhood, and in fact, the Egyptians arrested him on such grounds in 1954, in connection with an attempt on Nasser's life. What is certain is that he ended up in Cairo in the early 1950s, studying to be a civil engineer and working hard as the head of the Palestinian Students' Union, which he founded with a small group of collaborators. For in the 1950s, the political and cultural center of gravity in the Arab world, and an ideal site for the Union, was Cairo. Nasser swept to power, drastically altering the tenor of Egyptian and Arab politics. In the midst of Cairo's intellectual currents and cross-currents, Arafat and his trusted colleague Salah Khalaf, who, under the name Abu Iyad, would remain Arafat's chief aide-de-camp until his assassination in 1991, probably at the hands of Iraqi agents, fashioned an agenda for the Palestinian people. Their thinking can be summed up as follows, first, the Palestinians had to take responsibility for their future, only an autonomous organization of their own could reverse their fortune. Second, their chief aim needed to be the Liber, Asian of Palestine, taking precedence over the goal of Arab unity, the key to the Nasserite revolution. Indeed, the liberation was a necessary precondition for that unity. Third, the key means to achieve liberation was armed struggle, undertaken by Palestinians themselves. And finally, Palestinians would work hand-in-hand hand with other Arabs and international forces on the basis of equality to help achieve the goal.5. Caliph would later recall those early days at Cairo University. App. Approached by Arafat, who was attempting to recruit him for the union, he found a welcome refrain in Arafat's approach, we knew what was damaging to the Palestinian cause. We were convinced, for example, that the Palestinians could expect nothing from the Arab regimes. We believed that the Palestinians could rely only on themselves. Six when Arafat, in the growing fashion of educated Pal, Estonians, moved from one exiled community to another, he transported this approach with him. But by the time of his forced move to Kuwait in 1957 to take up an engineering post, it had taken some hard knocks. Arrested earlier by Nasser, 
He was now harassed by him because of promises made to the Israelis to secure their withdrawal from the Gaza Strip following the 1956 Suez War. And Arafat found himself caught in the turmoil of Iraqi Egyptian competition for Arab regional leadership. Seven. Despite the fact that the British kept their protectorate in Kuwait until 1961, Arafat and his colleagues found its Arab leaders offering them a relatively free hand to establish an organization based on the Cairo principles. They also found the growing oil wealth provid, in resources unimaginable in Egypt. Their underground cell, which in 1959 became fater, officially, the Palestine National Liberation Movement, began to take shape a few months after Arafat's arrival. Khalid al-Hassan, a Palestinian who had risen in Kuwaiti politics, joined the cell, giving it badly needed organizational skills. In time, Hassan became the leading ideologue of the right wing of the Pales, Tinian movement. The cell also began publishing a magazine, Philastinuna, Our Pales, Tyne, The Call to Life, which appeared every six weeks or so for the next five years. Eight, its primary purpose was to put forth Fatah's strategy of provoking the Arab states into a war that Arafat was sir, Tyne would eventually end Israeli control of Palestine. In a less ambi, Shisvain, editor Khalil al Wazer, Abu Jahard, Arafat's longtime aide and close companion, also saw the publication as a critical for rum for diverse ideas about how to promote the Palestinian cause. Nine, this worked well, and the magazine's success distinguished Arafat's small clandestine group from countless others forming in various Palestinian communities. Both Fater and the other groups drew their strength from the deep misery of the Palestinian situation, and from points of reses, tans elsewhere in the Arab world. Nasser's successful challenge to British control of the Suez Canal and the anti-French agitation of Algeria's FLN suggested it was possible to reverse the verdict of his, Tory. For all the clandestine groups, the FLN was a model of how to fashion a national liberation organization, and Arafat's own posy, Shin was in fact greatly strengthened by the Algerian decision, immediately after independence in 1962, to recognize and support Fater alone. With Nasser beginning to use the term Palestinian entity, and Iraq's new revolutionary leader, Qasim, talking of the creation of a Palestinian republic, Palestinian militants gained confidence, despite limited resources and opportunities. In the late 1950s and early 1960s a sentiment seemed to emerge among the Arab republics to give the Palestinians an active role in the struggle against Israel, at least that is what the rhetoric suggested, actually, Leaders such as Nasser and Qasim displayed extreme ambivalence towards Palestine, Ian activists, regarding with the deepest suspicion any attempt to take the initiative or set the tone. Along with the other groups, Fater set out to sink roots in pales, tiny in society. But the task was difficult, partly because of its insist, tense that the sole realization of Nasser's wildly popular call for Arab unity was through Palestinian repatriation. This position did not find favor among Nasser or his avid followers, many of whom were young Palestinians. Nasser felt the Fater militants were put, ting the cart before the horse. At the time, even George Habish, who subsequently became the leading Palestinian ideologue of the left, advocated working for unity of the Arab masses through revolutionary regimes as a prelude to the liberation of Palestine. Arafat found himself moving against the current of popular feel, in the Arab world, Nasserism was pushing the entire pales, tiny an issue to the margins. His circumstances would eventually change, partly due to larger events, such as the failure of Egyptian-Syrian unity in 1961, and the Arab catastrophe in the 1967 war, and partly due to his own tenacity. Hassan notes how his unswerving dedication to the Palestine problem, before all else, paid off, we reversed the slogan, of Arab unity first, and this is how we reverse the whole tide of thinking. And we manage to do that. Because when you want to talk about unity, then you have to work against the present Arab regimes. When we want to talk about liberation, we have to work on liberation. 10. The 1960s catapulted Fater and Arafat from obscurity to overall leadership of the Palestinian people. The evolution from a clan's time political cell tucked away in a remote corner of the Arab world, to an international organization, involved several important steps. 
In 1963, Fater moved towards some permanence by creating a center, Trill Committee, consisting of Palestinians who eschewed the party and factional conflicts racking the Arab world. With Arafat as chief and Wazer as second in command, the committee consolidated power and directed the organization and its membership. At the same time, in the face of objections by Khalid al Hassan and others on the committee, Arafat pushed Fater into a strategy calling for immediate military action against Israel. Probably nothing but armed violence could have established the organization so quickly among the various Palestinian community ties, after almost two decades of inaction and growing despair. Still, the nature of the dispersal and the disdain of Fater as leaders for tra traditional party organization, cells, local committees, and the like, made it difficult for the group to educate, recruit, or consistently mobilize the larger population. The committee succeeded in coordinating the organization's own actions, less so in infusing Fater into the everyday lives of the Palestinians. When Fater did create some rudimentary regional subgroups, it found itself hemmed in by the governing Arab regimes. For all these organizational liabilities, the group did capture the Palestinians' imagination, but not in ways that could have been the basis for systems of control and mass mobilization. This remained true after the 1967 war, when it built a complex central apparatus, covering areas from financial control to relations with Arab parties. Over the years, Arafat tried to make Fater, and later the PLO, which Fater came to dominate, into what the Jewish agency had been for. The Jews during the Palestine Mandate, a state in the making, but without the equivalent of the political parties and the Histadrut, which had given the Jewish agency a firm foundation in the Jewish population. Fater's turn to violence came after the first Arab summit meet, ing, held in Cairo in January, 1964, voted to establish the Palestine Liberation Organization, the culmination of almost five years of ground-laying work by Nasser. The new PLO held its first convention in East Jerusalem's Palace Hall movie theater that spring. The motivation was Israel's completion of its national water carrier, diverting water from the Jordan River. Support for a Palestinian or Ghanization was a way for the Arabs to give the appearance of Khan, interacting Israel without precipitating a direct confrontation. Nasser certainly did not intend the PLO to gain much autonomy, he wanted its semblance, while ensuring that no underground groups dragged Egypt into war before it was ready. Nasser selected a figure who had worked closely with individual Arab states and with the Arab League, Ahmed Shukarai, to build the new organization. Shukarai came from impeccable Palestinian lineage. His father had been a supporter of the Young Turks in 1908 and after being exiled by the Sultan, had returned to Acre where he became a learned Muslim dignitary and an activist in the emerging Palestinian movement. Shukarai took the same route as spokesman for the Arab Higher Committee, the Arab League, and the Syrian and Saudi delegations to the United Nations. In his memoirs, he also claims a connection to al qassam the Palestinian hero of the 1930s, noting that he offered his services as a lawyer to defend the surviving members of the Sheikh's group in 1935. Shukarai had been advocating an organization to liberate Pal Estein for more than a year, but due to his bluster and self-promotion, few took him seriously. Alan Hart, Arafat's sympathetic biographer, vilifies Shukarai as the puppet-in-chief, a political ma, Senri selling himself to the highest bidder, and a demagogue who was a cross between Adolf Hitler and Ian Paisley. 11. The claim of Shukarai's opponents was that he was simply doing Nasser's bid, ding in creating an illusion of Palestinian autonomy while keeping the organization under tight wraps. But to the surprise of many, Shukarai was far more effective than his enemies, or their biographer, Furs, let on. To establish the PLO, he overcame the opposition of feisty old Hajj Amin al Husseini, despite the fact that his father had been an outspoken opponent of the Mufti, as well as the deep suspicions of the Jordanians and several other key regimes. His other efforts were undermined by unceasing hyperbole and Damar Gajik statements, a bombastic orator. 12 perhaps best remembered for his purported threat before the 1967 war to drive the Jews into the sea, he had the temerity while in Amman to proclaim that all of Jordan, including the East Bank, was an integral part of Pal, Estein. 
The spring convention disgusted many of the Fater activists, Al, though several attended, Arafat, whose name was on the list of invitees, did not. They saw what they considered quiescent, hand-picked delegates ratify every proposal that Shukarai put before them. Some of those proposals, however, had long-term ramifica, shins, the Palestinian National Covenant, revised in 1968 as the pal Estine National Charter, was ratified, with its strong condemnation of Zionism and Israel, a bone in the throat of Israelis to this very day. Zionism, the Covenant declared, is a colonialist movement in its inception, aggressive and expansionist in its goals, racist and segregationist in its configurations and fascist in its means and aims. Israel in its capacity as the spearhead of this destructive move, meant and the pillar for colonialism is a permanent source of tension and turmoil, 13 The convention also emphasized the need for Palestinians to amass forces, mobilize their efforts and capabilities, and engage in holy war until complete and final victory has been at timed. Toward those ends, the PLO created the Palestine Liberation Army, PLA, two years later. For Fater, the PLO proved a formidable competitor. A real army of their own seemed highly attractive to destitute refugees and political exiles. Droves of Fater members abandoned ship, hoping to join the projected new PLA.14 with almost no levers of influence and control among its own members, let alone in the wider Palestinian population, the PLO needed some audacious acts as a means of re- Storing its most important asset, its image. Khalid al Hassan put it this way You can say, because it is the truth, that we were pushed down a road we did not want to take by the coming into being of the PLO. B. Cause of its existence, and the fact that it was not the genuine article that so many Palestinians were assuming it to be, we decided that the only way to keep the idea of real struggle alive was to struggle. 15. The road that Hassan had not wanted to take was, of course, that of direct violence against Israel. Notions of armed struggle and pop, Euler liberation were in the air in the 1960s, leading some in Fater to believe that they were part of a larger, inexorable world force. The success of Algeria's FLN in expelling the deeply rooted Pied's noise was but one of several important models. Jomo Kenyatta's triumph against British colonialism in Kenya and the efforts of the National Organization of Greek Cypriot Struggle EOKA, were others. Far, they're away, but still extremely important in the minds of Fater Mem, Burs, were the Cuban and Vietnamese revolutions. The writings of General Gayap in Vietnam, Che Guevara in Cuba, and Mao Zedong were all appearing in Palestinian refugee camps, newly translated into Arabic. Perhaps most influential of all was Franz Fanon's The Wretched of the Earth, which, in the Algerian context, talked of the CA, thartic benefits of violence against the occupier. Fanon himself was a psychiatrist who had joined the FLN.16. The new strategy of armed violence had roots in Palestinian society. Eti as well. Some of the key figures involved in the early raids in 1965 had had direct experience in the 1936. 39 Revolt. Ahmed Musa, who led Fater's first raid, had been part of Arab fighting groups carrying out action against Jewish settlements during that revolt. 17 Another key figure in these years was Sabha Yassin, who had been a member of the Black Hand Group during the Mandate period, as well as a DI, wrecked disciple of Al Qassam. Yassin alternately competed and Cooper, edited with Fater, finally merging his own group the organization of the vanguard of self-sacrifice for the liberation of Palestine, with Arafat's in 1968.18. Fater's decision was not the first time that the Palestinians had resorted to violence since 1948. Individuals such as Ahmed Muser had periodically slipped across the border to undertake personal acts of vengeance. Also, the Suez War of 1956 stemmed in no small part from the cycle of organized guerrilla raids from the Gaza Strip on Jewish settlements and Israel's strong retaliatory actions. In fact, in later years Arafat claimed some responsibility for those Gaza-based raids through his role as student leader at the time. But Arafat's real military role began when a Fater team operating under the name of Cipher, the Storm, slipped into Israel and placed an explosive charge in the Beit Neto for Canal. 
In some ways, the action was more a comedy of errors than a serious military expedition. The Lebanese arrested the group slated to carry out the attack on the last day of 1964, but, unaware of what had occurred, Arafat and his colleagues sped through Beirut distributing a military commute, Neek reporting the purported action. Later, laden with explosives, he was arrested and held for a short time by the Syrians, even though a high-ranking Syrian officer had pledged unfailing Cooper, Asian. When a group finally did plant the explosive charge on Janu, RE3, 1965, it set the timer so late that Israelis discovered and dismantled the bomb before it went off. And on its return from the action, the Palestinian unit ran into a Jordanian patrol that killed its leader, Ahmed Muser, and arrested the others. What made the action more than merely a series of mistakes was the reaction to it. Fater may have learned here that it is not how much actual damage they inflict on Israel that counts as how it perceives their actions. The Israelis publicized the attack and several others that a cipher undertook in early 1965, both in their Arabic radio broadcasts and in a speech by Prime Minister Levi Eshkol. Nothing could have better demonstrated the underground group's readiness to confront the enemy directly. After a second unit infiltrated into Israel, Fater took public responsibility. Arab regimes also helped by branding a cipher the venal creation of Western intelligence agencies seeking to push the Arabs into war before they were fully prepared, Egypt, or as communists bent on subversion, Jordan. Egypt's army even declared itself at war with a cipher. Wide publicity about the execution of real acts of violence and the furor they precipitated captured the attention and respect of the frustrated Palestinians around the Arab world. From an initial act of sabotage, Palestinians thus gained a new understanding of themselves as Jill al Thora, the revolutionary generation. At the same time, Fater leaders learned the difficulty of making their way through minefields, not only those laid by the Israelis but also the political minefields set out by Arab regimes. Egypt, Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, all the states bordering Israel, either hunted down the under, grand groups members or, when professing cooperation, Khan strained their every move. Nonetheless, by the outbreak of the 1967 war, a cipher, which was by now the official military arm of Fater, had undertaken nearly 100 acts of sabotage in Israel, killing 11 Israelis and wounding 62.19. Indeed, Israeli spokesmen cited these provocations as an important catalyst of the cycle of violence lead into the war. Recreating the PLO As humiliating as the 1967 war had been for the Arabs, it gave Fater new opportunities in two important areas. First, the humiliation quieted the gales of Nasserite Panarabaism. Fater's opposition to Nasser's philosophy, i.e., Arab unification as a prelude to the Libra, Shin of Palestine, had previously seemed a form of spitting into the wind. Now the opportunity existed for alternatives to Nasser's discredited vision, to his handpicked PLO leadership, to his insistence on control. Second, by reuniting the Palestinian majority, this time under is, Rayleigh occupation, the war made it much easier for Fater to pen, trait Palestinian society. The combination of its universal antipathy towards the Israelis with this shift from a logistically difficult fragmentation seemed to open the way for tactics reminiscent of Mao Zedong's or Ho Chi Minh's, Fater could provide key social services and organizations to the people and, in turn, finally develop its means of mobilization and control. And such control would be a significant innovation in Palestinian society. While before 1948, the Hussainis had insinuated themselves into people's daily lives through land holding, the Supreme Muslim Council, and clan ties, neither they nor any other claimants to Palestinian leadership had created networks of influence that were truly national in scope. In fact, Fater was only able to capitalize on one of the opportunity ties control of the PLO turning out to be its most far-reaching political achievement. Even with Nasser's firm backing, Shukarai had never managed to establish his own control over the organization, despite his claims that the PLO he led represented the general will of the Palestinians, he ended up precipitating and dealing with one factional split after another. His crowning accomplishment was the creation of the Palestine Liberation Army, in 1959, 
The Arab League had resolved to put such an army in the field, but little came of the effort or of several subsequent ones. 20 Eventually, Shukarai deployed several units in Gaza. But this did not save the PLO from overall ineffectiveness and Shukarai from political demise. The army, which did not amount to more than four or five thousand men, came under the command of each host country, rather than the PLO's appointed commander-in-chief. Shukarai simply could not achieve even the most rudimentary form of autonomy, for either the army or the PLO as a whole. Jordan, in particular, fought to erode even the slightest gains by the PLO. This problem would later plague Arafat, as well. The 1967 war recast relations among the Arabs as no other event. Would until Iraq's invasion of Kuwait. Panarabaism, which had elect, trified the Arab world from North Africa to the Fertile Crescent, slowly gave way to state relations reminiscent of those in other regions, based on standard diplomacy and international negotiation. Nasser's calls for unity, directed to the peoples of neighboring Arab countries above their rulers' heads, were replaced by conciliatory steps among kings and presidents. Even the dinosaur-like monarchs became legitimate nationalist leaders in this new diplomacy. The result was a flagging interest by Arab heads of state in the PLO. At the Khartoum Summit Conference in the summer of 1968, the famous meeting in which the Arab League issued its notorious three no's to Israel, no negotiations, no recognition, no peace, the final communique did not even mention the PLO. Shukarai, who had enjoyed Nasser's support before the war, now felt his bone chill in disinterest. With the 1967 defeat, Palestinians felt the Pan-Arab foundations of their hopes disintegrated. In the war's wake, many turned to the Fide, especially as represented by Fater and its record of direct, six, Oland action against Israel, as their only chance for salvation. Fater in turn, nourished by the new Palestinian support, used the grow, in disinterest of the Arab states to create some space for itself. Sending representatives to Arab capitals, it won both financial and rhetorical support. With Fater thus catapulting into Arab consciousness, the PLO faded. By Christmas Eve, 1967, Shukarai had re-signed. Arafat moved deliberately to replace Shukarai and revive the PLO. Probably no act furthered his aims more than the Battle of Kara, Mar, a refugee camp on the East Bank, on 21 March 1968. Nettled by fatal guerrilla attacks, the Israeli government dispatched a large military force into Jordan, in order to destroy its local headquarters. In what turned out to be the first open battle between Jews and Pal, Estonian irregulars since 1948, the Palestinians, aided by Jordanian artillery, ambushed the Israelis, killing as many as 25 soldiers in the course of a day-long firefight. 21 The Israelis retreated without achieving their objective. 22 While the Palestinians lost five times as many fighters as the Israelis, the psychological effect of the battle was overwhelming, almost immediately assuming mythic proper, shins, karamar means honor. In Arabic, it confirmed the primacy of the fide, propelling thousands of teenagers into a cipher and ARA, fat to the top of the Palestinian national movement. Within a year of the battle, he had assumed the chairmanship of the PLO, with Fater the dominant group in the reconstituted organization. The PLO became an umbrella organization, enveloping a number of smaller ones dedicated to armed struggle and Palestinian autonomy, of which Fater was by far the most important. It now controlled half the seats of the Palestine National Council, PNC. The PLO's emerging parliament in exile. Arafat and his associates controlled the 15-member executive committee, while keeping rival organizations fragmented and in sight as part of the committee and the larger council. For substantial periods, Arafat insisted on standing clear of Arab political infighting, his single-minded preoccupation with pales, time making it possible for Fater to maintain the political, moral, and financial support of a wide variety of Arab regimes. He paid a price for deviating from this policy, the most dramatic recent ex, ample being his support for Iraq Saddam Hussein. In general, Fater also spurned questions regarding the future makeup of pales, 
tiny in society or arcane ideological debates over the need for social revolution, thus enabling it to gain a broad base of support. Such choices clearly differentiated it from other Palestinian groups now committed to striking against Israel, none of which managed to s establish extensive Palestinian and Arab support. Nonetheless, such groups did have a significant impact on the movement, setting much of the tone and tenor of the PLO, indeed of the entire Palestinian national movement. In July 1968, Palestine, Ians hijacked an El Al Israeli airliner to Algeria, the first of a spate of hijackings and other acts aimed at the vulnerable international air transportation system. Terrorism now became a key element of the struggle against Israel. Until 1988, Palestinian groups never admit, Ted to it, using the term, external operations, for all armed action outside Israel and the occupied territories. In 1988, the possibility of a direct dialogue with the United States hanging in the balance, Arafat denounced, and seemed to renounce, it.23. Behind many such acts stood the Popular Front for the Libra, Shin of Palestine, PFLP. Like those of Fater, its leaders came from the student movement, but in this case from the American Univer, CITE in Beirut. Their George Habish, its preeminent figure, and colleagues had established the clandestine Arab nationalists' move, meant, shortly after the 1967 war it merged with other groups to be, come the PFLP, finally joining the PLO in 1970. The Arab national, ists movement's activists had originally advocated Nasserism. In the mid-1960s, it moved towards a Marxist perspective, demanding social revolution as a precondition for true Arab unity. After 1967, the front took on a Palestine-first orientation. Direct violent action was always at the center of its concerns. By 1964, even before Fater, members of the Arab nationalists' move, Men's Guerrilla Unit had attacked Israel. But even while furnishing enough notoriety to challenge Fater among the Palestinian popular, Shin, the themes of violence and ideology divided and redivided the organization. The first acrimonious split came when Naif Hawamer demanded a more radical approach, to break the Popular Front's relations with the inherently conservative Arab regimes and to align itself instead with popular revolutionary forces throughout the Arab world. Out of the ensuing, sometimes bloody battle came a splinter group, the Popular Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine, headed by Hawama. The split with the Popular Front in 1969 was finally brokered by Fater, which in turn got the Popular Democratic Front to join the PLO. Interestingly, the new group took the lead, after long polemical debates, in distinguishing between Israel proper, as defined by the armistice agreements following the 1948 war, and the territories it captured in 1967. By the early 1970s, these debates moved many within the PLO away from the Charter's insistence on expulsion from Palestine of post-1917 Jews and their descendants to advocacy of a secular, democratic state including Jews and a major, Iti of Arabs. Under Hawamer's prodding, this position evolved even further, by the 1980s, the Popular Democratic Front had persuaded most of the national movement to accept the principles of a. More flexibility regarding what had formerly been considered the absolute right of Palestinian repatriation in their original homes and b. An Arab-Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza, rather, at least at first, than the democratic secular state in all of Palestine.24. The idea of creating a Palestinian state in the occupied territories had developed slowly, one of the first to raise the possibility being Mustafa Akhmais, Imprisoned by the Israelis shortly after the 1967 war.25 the PLO has consistently emphasized three demands, the right of return, the right to self-determination, and the right to be an independent state. The 1947 partition was seen by PLO leaders as abrogating the right to self-determination.26 the decision to found a Palestinian state in any liberated part of the country, i.e., the West Bank and Gaza, was finally taken at the 11th PNC meeting, Cairo, 9 June 1974, and marked a major tactical turning point. Many Palestinians saw it as a withdrawal in principle from the idea of liberating the entire country and a movement towards the op, Shinavay, Minna State, the backdrop to George Habesher's resigna, 
action from the PLO Executive Committee on the 26th of October and the S. Tablishment of A. Rejection Front. Ahmed Jibril provoked another split. He had been a member of Fater's Central Committee before joining the Popular Front but was dissatisfied in both cases with the insufficient commitment to direct violent action. He, too, founded a new organization, the POP, Euler Front for the Liberation of Palestine, General Command. With an emphasis more narrowly focused on guerrilla tactics, especially across Israel's northern border, it has been implicated in scurrilous acts of violence, including the blowing up of Panam Flight 103 over Lockerbie, Scotland, in December, 1988. Even after Gibral withdrew his group from the PLO in the early 1980s, he retained consider, able influence over the worldwide image of the Palestinian national movement. Drawing on theories of urban guerrilla warfare and cooperating with a terrorist network including Japan's Red Army, the IIA, and the Bardemainhof Group, the Popular Front and its splinter or organizations initiated a series of external operations, 27 the most spectacular by far were the airplane hijackings. These and other acts, the mass murder of passengers by the Red Army in Israel's principal airports, the murder of Israeli athletes in the 1972 Olim picks, made the Palestinian issue a media event, pushing it to the top of the world political agenda. Within Palestinian society, they have furred new heroes and a sense of power. 28 In the popular imagination, the Fide was someone who, like Joshua, could stop the sun in the sky. Among Palestinians everywhere, there was a renewed sense of pride and autonomy, helping to rekindle a Palestinian national con siousness, battered in the decades since the Arab Revolt. The emphasis on terror had its costs, as well, fostering a blood, thirsty stereotype both internationally and among those Israelis who might have sought accommodation. Israeli leaders pointed to the terrorism as proof that the Palestinian covenant involved not only the elimination of Israel but of Jews generally. And the world's revulsion enabled these leaders to delegitimize Palestinian national claims. As indicated, Arafat and Fater over time distanced themselves from terrorist tactics, even while apparently creating their own deadly terrorist branches, Force 17 and Black September, for a while the world's most formidable terror organization. 29 The latter was responsible for many operations, including the assassination of Jordanian Prime Minister Wasfi Altal in Cairo, the 28th of November 1971, and the attack on the Munich Olympics, the 5th of September 1972, death toll, 11 Israeli athletes, a German policeman, 5 guerrillas. It is clear, then, that while Fater now headed the PLO, it could not control many of the organization's parts, also, the reputation and im age of the PLO derived as much from acts of the smaller groups as from Arafat's and Fater's leadership. Arafat's new stature, and that of the reorganized PLO, were wreck. Ognaized implicitly at the Arab League's Rabart Conference in Dissam, Burr, 1969. To the surprise of many, the PLO, now the umbrella for a slew of guerrilla groups and much more consistent on freedom of action than Shu Karai ever had been, won Nasser's enthusiastic support for engaging in direct resistance to Israeli rule. He even gave Fater some military aid and a special broadcasting station annexed to Cairo Radio.30. Other states such as Syria and Iraq fell into line as well. Strains between them and the PLO did not disappear altogether, they up paired, for example, when Nasser agreed to the so-called Rogers and I, Tiative in 1970, i.e., a ceasefire in Egypt's war of attrition against his rainy forces dug in along the Suez Canal, or when Syria set up its own guerrilla group, Saikar, along with Gibral's Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, General Command, it would quit the PLO altogether for most of the 1980s. But the overall situation was quite clear. Arafat and his fater colleagues had ridden the wave of Israeli success in the 1967 war, using the humiliation of the Arab states and the failure of their grand designs for Arab unity to seize leadership of the Palestinian national movement. The PLO's search for roots. Modeling his effort on those of the Chinese, Vietnamese, and Cuban revolutionaries, Arafat began a push immediately after the June war to establish a permanent, popular base for resistance and revolt in the occupied territories. His dramatic failure, 
the Israelis forced his and his entourage's ouster at the end of the summer of 1967, was a crucial development for the guerrillas and for Palestinian society in general, see Chapter 9. Ironically, Fajr's success in the Battle of Karamara a year later was a result of this failure, once driven from the occupied territories, it established its headquarters there. Nevertheless, the forced physical distance from the centers of Pales, Tinian settlement would prove to be a persistent liability. Fater did try to compensate for that liability with the Department of Papu, LAR organizations, governing affiliated groups of students, doctors, peasants, and so forth, meant to mobilize the Palestinian Papu, Lation.31 compared with Shukarai's feeble efforts, Arafat seemed quite robust. Khalid al Hassan has argued that the new PLO might have been all too robust. After Karamar, we were forced to make our mobilizer, Shin and ideological education, of the people in the camps by masses, by lectures, not by cells, and there is a big difference in both ways. There we deal with an individual, here we deal with the masses, with 100 at one time, 32 within a year of Karamar, Fater had members in 80 countries, but the cost of this growth was loss of organizational cohesion. Embraced as the symbolic represent, Tashin of the national movement, the PLO found itself in a symbiotic relationship with the Palestinian people. On the one hand, it promoted, despite extreme dependence upon various host can, tries, a sense of their distinctiveness, autonomy, and empowerment. On the other hand, Palestinian refugees and others gave the PLO a foundation for action and a coherent audience by developing a shared culture drawing on their memories of Palestine and the myths of the lost garden that they had created. But such emo, shinal closeness notwithstanding, the Palestinians found the PLO rather distant from their practical needs and way of life. Fater is in attention to organization at the level of village, nay, borehood, or camp made it difficult to mobilize people on a Sue's, timed basis, as well as to project a unified national will. To be sure, the proliferation of guerrilla groups complicated the task. It is impossible to account for all the organizations of armed struggle appearing and disappearing during this period. Some were cover names, or one-action groups, or mere paper organizations. Often, several groups would claim responsibility for a suspected or clear, cut guerrilla action. Free of the limits imposed on constituencies with everyday problems, their rivalries led each to work for preserver, shin and dominance, often against the greater national good. The result was an odd mixture of ideological purity and political irresponsibility. Arafat thus spent much of his time trying to preside over unruly groups and overcome frictions among them. Filling the seats of the Palestine National Council, which was seen as both a functioning parliament and a state in the making, came only after intense and prolonged bargaining about precisely how much representation each group would have. Another formidable diversion involved the ever more complicated world of Arab interstate relations, ensnaring the PLO in devastating, direct confrontations with the Jordanian and Syrian armies, as well as with numerous Lebanese militias. Two factors led to such confrontations. First, the Palestinian communities located in Arab states often turned into points of con tension between these states and the PLO. Local Palestinians' FRE quickly lacked basic rights and faced discrimination in their daily dealings. Attempts by the PLO to shield them from abuses meant a collision course with Arab regimes. Second, the PLO worked under a nigh impossible dilemma. Among its most basic goals was Orton, only in pursuing Palestinian interests its own foreign policy, the right to initiate military action and develop unmediated relations with local Palestinians, and so forth. From the Palestinians' perspective, such autonomy was important, helping to define them in the Arab world as something other than refugees and victims. More concretely, if the PLO were to succeed in building viable institutions among them, autonomy could mean acquiring services that local governments would not or could not provide. But that potential independence rankled Arab governments, none, in the post-colonial period, being ready to give even a hint of relinquishing any part of sovereignty within its assigned borders. This sentiment notwithstanding, Arafat had some success carving out areas of autonomy in particular states, but such cases were lim-it. 
One example was in Kuwait between 1967 and 1976, when the government, after greatly restricting the admission of non-Kuwaitis into the educational system, allowed the PLO to run schools for PAL, Estonian children. Despite difficulties in keeping the schools afloat financially and in maintaining academic standards, the PLO school experience contributed immeasurably to the development of national consciousness among Palestinian students. Children saluted the Palestinian flag each day, participated regularly in Palestinian cultural and social activities, and joined scouting troops as well as the Zarat and Ashbal, associations that provided children with paramilitary and political training. 33. This sort of success was rare. As we shall see below, the PLO man, aged to create broad zones of autonomy and independence for itself only in Lebanon. But there as elsewhere, its efforts led to disastrous conflict, perhaps none more so than the war with Jordan in 1970, what Palestinians came to call Black September. After Fatah's failure to establish cells in the West Bank, Jordan B came the center of its activities. Starting in the summer of 1967, first Fatah, then the PLO more generally, achieved a freedom of action calling King Hussein's control of his own territory into question. After the June War, Palestinian guerrilla suspects were released from Jordanian jails, and many fighters entered Jordan from across the Syrian border. Palestinian military units, which had been stationed in Egypt, also relocated in the Hashemite Kingdom, coming under the PLO's direct command. For the first time, the Fide appeared in refugee camps wearing his uniform and proudly bearing his arms. A short honeymoon with the regime took place after the heady Battle of Karamar, King Hussein proclaiming, We shall all be Fide, Yun. But soon, rifle toting guerrillas, unauthorized roadblocks they were manning, and related gestures prompted Jordanian of officials to question whether the price for allowing the PLO free reign was worth it. Heavy Israeli artillery retaliation against Jordan's richest agricultural region, the Jordan Valley, only complicated the problem. The smaller guerrilla groups heightened the tensions, some openly calling for the establishment of a progressive regime in Amman, the popular Democratic Front for the Liberation of Pales. Tyne even tried to build local Soviets of workers and peasants among concentrations of Palestinians in the north of the country. Fater A.C. Tivist spoke of converting Amman into the Palestinian Hanoi, to be used as the headquarters for an assault on the Israeli Sagan, Tel Aviv. King Hussein and his army became increasingly anxious about all of this. Anxiety turned into humiliation on 6 September 1970. George Habesher's Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine hijacked three international airliners and forced them to land at the stark Jordanian Desert Airport in Zakar. After the Popular Front blew up the aircraft, Jordan's army, the descendant of the British-trained Arab Legion, left its barracks to disarm the guerrillas. Several of the Palestinian organizations countered by declaring the northern part of the country a liberated Palestinian area. Full warfare ensued. Using heavy armor, artillery, and air attacks, the Jordanians inflicted a shattering defeat, around 3,000 Palestinians dying in the fighting. Some units preferred crossing the Jordan River and Sir, rendering to the Israelis rather than falling into Jordanian hands. When Syrian tanks threatened to intervene, Israeli forces, acting in coordination with the United States, redeployed to deter a southern thrust into Jordan. In the aftermath of this episode, the Hashemites closed all PLO institutions and arrested those leaders who had not managed to flee. 30 for the organization's prospects seemed bleak. In the course of three years, it had failed, first, in its efforts to gain direct access to the large Palestinian population in the occupied territories, and now to that in Jordan. In subsequent decades, relations between the PLO and Jordan fluctuated. 35 for 15 years they were very poor. The Amman Agreement of 1985 then envisioned a confederation between Jordan and a future Palestinian state, but a year later the agreement is solved into bitter mutual recriminations. Alternating cooperation and disputes followed regarding whether Palestinian representatives could be incorporated into a Jordanian delegation for possible talks with Israel. Relations warmed again in 1990 and 1991, when both parties supported Saddam Hussein in the Gulf War. 
The new Jordan, Nian government approved by the king in June, 1991, included seven Palestinian ministers, a clear signal of readiness to return to the Confederation plan. The renewed cooperation laid the basis for the joint Jordanian-Palestinian delegation to the U.S., sponsored peace talks that began in Madrid in the fall of 1991. Hovering behind all the vicissitudes in the relationship between Palestinians and Jordanians after 1970 was a continued presumption of complete Jordanian sovereignty within its borders, in Clud, in sovereignty over Jordan's Palestinian population. When in 1988 Jordan severed the tie forged with the West Bank 40 years earlier, declaring the PLO the sole representative of the Palestinian people, the move's primary purpose was to underscore this presumption by excluding Palestinians in the East Bank. 36. The move was, in any event, hedged somewhat. West Bank civil servants, for example, continued to receive Jordanian salaries. In any event, the PLO's grim circumstances in September 1970 were to undergo a remarkable metamorphosis over the following five years, the greatest period of PLO success. With the uprooting from Jordan came the development of a state within a state in Leber, Non, that patched together country with a large number of Palestine, Ians, 235,000. Arafat set up his headquarters in Beirut, but the real Fide presence was in the southern part of the country, close to Israel's border, where much of this population lived without the po, political and civic rights of refugees in Jordan, or even Syria and Egypt lacking work permits and generally employed in small enterprises, most Palestinians thus labored for low wages under poor working conditions with no fringe benefits, devoid of protection under Leber, Nies Law, 37. For the chronically weak Lebanese regime, carved up as it was among various religious sects, the presence of the PLO brought new risks. The Israelis had already made it clear in 1968 that Lebanon was running such risks, responding to the popular front's El al Hai jacking, with an attack on Lebanon's main airport that destroyed 13 civilian airplanes. The IDF also initiated retaliatory attacks in southern Lebanon in response to Palestinian hostilities, leading droves of Shiite Muslims from the south to flee north to Beirut. Battered from all directions, Israel, the PLO, Lebanese Muslim students sympathetic to the Palestinians, Camp dwelling Palestine, Ians who undertook their own spontaneous uprising, the Lebanese government tried to contain the guerrillas, but with only marginal success. In 1969, Nasser brokered the apparently paradoxical Cairo Agreement, offering the PLO ample autonomy and latitude in southern Lebanon while somehow promising Lebanon sovereignty and security. For the first time, Arafat had an opportunity to carve out institutional autonomy seemingly free of interference by gel, as Arab states. Once they entered the camps, the guerrilla groups established courts, imposed taxes, conscripted young men. They revised the curriculum in the schools, which were funded and run by Anerwa, so as to offer paramilitary training and changed the tenor of social realer shinships in the camps. The entire spirit in them changed, the first appearance of the fide was received in mythological terms, as that of giants, who, rose from the sea, 38 one man in the Tal al zarter camp exclaimed. The first moment I got down from the car I saw the Palestinian flag instead of the Lebanese flag, and a group of Palestinians in Fidein. Clothes instead of the Lebanese police. As I moved through the camp I saw happiness on people's faces the sheikh in the mosque now. Spoke clearly about the homeland in the homes, mother spoke clearly with their children about Palestine, before this was only done in whisper. There were many new projects which weren't there before, social activities, sports, meetings where people could say what they thought clearly, without censorship.39. Service and administrative organizations quickly followed. By the early 1980s, the Palestinian Red Crescent Society had built 10 hospi, towels and 30 clinics, another 47 of the latter being run by the non fater guerrilla groups. Two organizations with tens of thousands of members, the General Union of Palestine Workers and the Gen, Eral Union of Palestinian Women, gained most of their strength in Lebanon. 40 The PLO and its allies also set up the Voice of Palestine radio network, several newspapers, a news agency, WEFA, and a RE, Search Institute. 
The organization had grown from a loosely organized collection of Fiduyayan to a vast bureaucratic network, centered in Lebanon, employing perhaps 8,000 civil servants and a budget, including that of constituent organizations, in the hundreds of millions of dollars, three quarters of which went to support the PLO's social and administrative programs, 41 in addition. It had gained diplomatic recognition from over 50 states, established more than 100 foreign missions of its own, and won. Observer status in the United Nations, the platform for Arafat's well-known 1974 speech toting a partially visible, bolstered pistol. Rashid Khalidi describes the turn of fortune. PLO chairman Yasser Arafat was now a head of a state in all but name, more powerful than many Arab rulers. His was no longer a humble revolutionary movement, but rather a vigorous power state, with a growing bureaucracy administering the affairs of Palestinians everywhere and with a budget bigger than that of many small sovereign states. 42. Over time, the financial resources to sustain such a complex structure also developed, largely through aid from the Gulf states. Adam Zagarin estimates that the main financial body of the PLO, the Palestine National Fund, had yearly expenditures of a proxy, mainly $233 million by the late 1980s, including over a third of that to support a standing army.43. While at the beginning, competition among the guerrilla organizations to control camp life was intense, by 1978 Fater had achieved dominance. It appointed popular committees that looked after the most mundane human problems, road maintenance, the building of bomb shelters, for protection from both Israeli bombing and Arab militias, and providing proper hygiene. Fater was especially successful in forming the youth groups mentioned above by Brand, the Zarat, Flowers, for girls and Ashbel, Lion Cubs, for boys, that stressed military training and the building of a revolutionary culture. This new culture emphasized the difference between the Jill al Thora, the assertive revolutionary generation, and the desolate, humiliating identities of the children's parents, the Jill al nakbar Some residents complained that these activities eroded the pales, Tinian's normally high academic motivation as well as the standing of the regular schools, 44 but there was no doubting the electrifying effect that the FIDE had on the Lebanese camps. On dark alley walls. Our comrades' deaths are announced posters show their smiling faces 45. Such posters plastered the walls of the camps and graffiti, folk songs, poetry, and stories all grew around the quasi-mystical icon of the Fide, recognized as one who would gladly offer his, or in some versions, her, life to liberate Palestine. 46 These idolized recruits earned relatively high salaries, and their families gained preferred access to PLO services and jobs. Families of martyrs received special pensions. The PLO's control went far beyond the Palestinian camps. The guerrillas had nearly free reign in a wide swathe of Lebanese Terry, Tory, including the coastal cities of Tyre and Sidon. Over time, the Lebanese police all but disappeared from the streets, they simply re-moved their uniforms, while continuing to receive their salaries from the central government, Lebanese courts and administrative services gave way to revolutionary courts and to private arrangements with the guerrilla groups, especially Fater.47 naturally, this power and success came with a variety of dangers, fears, and re-sentments, hidden and not so hidden. Within the camps, the old leadership felt particularly vulnerable. Sayi quotes a camp school director. Most of the Vujaha, traditional notables or leaders, collaborated with the authorities and informers, not because they were unnation, alistic, but because they feared the new generation which was threat, eating their influence. These were the people on whom the Mufti der pended, they worked together against the new current. 48. A number of ordinary Palestinians also came to bridle under the rule of the Fide. A few had established close relations with their Lebanese neighbors, even intermarrying, and opposed the wedge now dividing the two peoples. Others saw the guerrillas, many of whose families had come from the Hebron Mountains and Gaza as socially and intellectually inferior to the Hafer and Galilee Palestine, Ians in southern Lebanon. For their part, guerrillas spoke of the Lebanese Palestinians as uncommitted to the revolution, as they called their new order, and as emborgiased. And to complicate matters even more, 
the various factions of the PLO often squabbled among themselves for control. The popular committees that they appointed were frequently underskilled, disorganized, and ineffective. The greatest dangers, however, did not come from resentful pales, Tinians, most of whom gladly put up with inefficiencies or even O.C. casinal indignities in return for a true Palestinian leadership, but from the Lebanese, who, like the Jordanians, feared that the girl, Las autonomy would bring disaster. From the signing of the Cairo Agreement on, powerful elements in Lebanon were convinced that the Palestinian state within a state could not coexist with Lebanese sovereignty, a conviction sharpened by Israeli retaliation for any. Palestinian armed incursions, based on a faith that Lebanese pain would translate into restrictions on the PLO. The Phalangist Party of the dominant Maronite sect, the religious group most closely identified with the modern Lebanese State 49, led the outcry. It watched Palestinian control expand from what the Israeli media called Fatalland in the south to territorial enclaves in the north and the Biker Valley, as well as to the PLO's capital in the Karkar, Kani district of West Beirut. In March, 1970, that is, before the expulsion of the PLO from Ja, Dan, armed clashes broke out between units of the Lebanese army and guerrilla groups. A few years later, spring 1973, an Israeli raid in Beirut's Rue Verdun, killing three leading PLO figures, provoked wide-scale fighting between Lebanese and Palestinian forces. The Milkut Protocols, signed in May, 1973, temporarily put an end to the warfare by precisely spelling out the boundaries for guerrilla for eyes and enjoining them to self-restraint. But in the end those agree, mens may have made the situation worse by prompting certain Lebanese factions, particularly among the Christian sects, to create their own militias. In the context of deteriorating relations among Lebanese confessional groups, the tensions helped generate one of the bloodiest communal conflicts of the 20th century, the Leb and Ease Civil War, lasting from 1975 until 1990 and resulting in well over 100,000 fatalities and endless human tragedy. For the PLO and the Palestinians, this war would bring privy. Ousley unimagined brutality and disasters, some of which would make Black September seem relatively benign. They would end up facing two Israeli invasions, a limited incursion in 1978, the Litany Operation, and a full-scale attack in 1982, besides battles with new, Maris Lebanese militias. Encountering periodic hostility from the Syrian army, they would suffer a devastating defeat at its hands in 1976. In the most ignominious blow of all, the PLO found its own FAC, Shins mauling each other at several points during the war. In 1983, several guerrilla groups, including the Syrian-sponsored Saika and Jibril's Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, General Qam, Mand, withdrew from the PLO. And a fater colonel, Abu Musar, said Musa Muragar, led a mutiny against Arafat, involving pitched battles with fater forces. The opposition was based on a wide variety of grievances. But the key element was, as the critics saw it, the PLO's treasonous appeasement of its enemies, and its gradual abandonment of the claim to total repatriation, its acceptance in theory of an independent state limited to the West Bank and Gaza. Both Syria and Libya supported Abu Musar, and Syria went so far as to deport Arafat from Damascus, he ended up in two Nis. About 400 men were killed, and another 1,900 wounded, in this brief civil war within a civil war. 50. Confronting such ordeals, Arafat and the PLO tottered badly. The 1982 Israeli invasion routed the 15,000 strong PLO fighting force and put its entire infrastructure under siege for nearly the EN Taya summer. At the end of August, Palestinian military, administrative, and political forces were evacuated from Lebanon under US supervision, their only shred of honor being the ability to hoist their weapons as they boarded ship in Beirut port. Arafat's personal exit on 30 August marked an end to I am Beirut, the era of PLO PO, political and military presence in Lebanon. Sixteen months later, after Israel had withdrawn from most of Lebanon and PLO fighters had infiltrated back, Abu Musar's rebellion again forced Arafat and his forces to leave. Re-established in Tunis, 
the organization moved some of its branches and training centers to Saddam Hussein's Iraq, paving the way for Arafat's support of that country in the 1991 Gulf War, after an Israeli bombing attack. By the late 1980s, the PLO was again engaging in international initiatives. Arafat engineered a short-lived dialogue with the United States, denouncing the use of terrorism and publicly recognizing the right of Israel to exist, both major concessions on his part. He also managed to re-establish his own tat, to image among Palestinians and to have the Palestine National Council finally declare a state that would eventually rule in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Without defining its borders or establish, in a government, the extraordinary 19th session of the council, convened near Algiers from 12 November to 15, 1988, authorized a declaration of independence bearing a striking resemblance to that of Israel in 1948. Arafat proclaimed the state, with its capital in Jeru, Salem, on 15 November 1988. But despite the international dazzle, the PLO had not altered the dilemma that had become evident in September, 1970, its most BA, sick aim, to create enough autonomy to shape Palestinian society and confront Israel, lay hostage to the whims of embattled Arab states, or of their unofficial militias or threatening or opportunistic nay, bores. In 1991, for example, when the Lebanese state was taking its first steps towards re-establishing a semblance of effective rule, it turned, with the support of its powerful patron Syria, on the PLO in the south, ending its rule after several violent clashes. Arafatster, sire to avoid the entanglements of Arab politics could not protect him from such fury. Indeed, writes Rashid Khalidi, the fact that Palestinian nationalism has been in nearly constant conflict over the past few decades with both Israel and various Arab regimes is per, kived as inevitable by most Palestinians, 51. Even worse, at such times Arafat and his organization could not protect the Palestinian population. By the last half of the 1980s, this fundamental inadequacy changed the relationship of the PLO to Palestinian society in subtle but substantial ways. One of its first indications came shortly after Syria's intervention, aimed in part di, directly against the PLO, in the Lebanese civil war in 1976. The intervention offered the PLO's Lebanese opponents an opportunity to launch an attack on the two remaining Palestinian refugee camps in mostly Christian East Beirut. One fell quickly, but the other, Tal al zatar was besieged for almost two months, with the PLO nearly helpless to relieve the suffering and anguish. Despite substantial concessions to the Syrians, the Christian forces finally raised the camp, killing 3,000 Palestinians and evicting the others. Another such indication was the notorious sequence of events on 16 September 1982, in the suburban Beirut camps of Sabra and Shaitala, using Israel's protective presence around Beirut, the phalangists entered the camps and in less than two days slaughtered anywhere between 460 and 3,000 Palestinians, including women and children, as well as Lebanese, Syrians, Algerians, Pakistanis, and Iranians who happened to be in the camps. 52 The camps thus were added to the list of places marking Palestinian martyrdom, alongside De Yassin, Kafir Qasim, and Tel al zatar The PLO's impotence did not seem to affect its popularity, or that of Arafat, among the Palestinians. Polls in 1988, for example, gave the PLO a 90% and Arafat a 75% approval rating.53 but there were nonetheless indications of a changed relationship. On the one hand, while remaining popular through its long ordeal in Lebanon, the heroic image of the Fide appeared increasingly dis, tan from the immediate needs of the Palestinian population, and another cultural hero was beginning to challenge its dominance, the RPG Kid, named after the anti-tank shoulder rockets he toted to slow the Israeli advance. The stiff price the Israelis paid for the invasion of Lebanon, over 650 dead, 3,500 wounded, catapulted the image of the young martyr, the Shaheed, into the limelight. The pro, professionally paid Fide now had to share the cultural stage with the spontaneous, untrained RPG kids. Later, in the West Bank and Gaza Strip, similar adolescents throwing rocks and taunting Israeli troops would mark the rise of the Children of the Stones. On the other hand, many Palestinians were now falling back on their own tenacity for self-protection, 
a situation reflected in the increasing evocation of the image of the survivor, whose heroism is based on Sumud. Perhaps somewhat grandiloquently, Ahmed Darber has reflected on such poles of vulnerability and tenacity in Palestinian life. You hear the news about the Palestinian. Wherever he is they knife him famine strikes him and flees. Rumor hacks off an arm here, a leg there, the media joyfully spread the news. The Palestinian rejects. He accepts his days as a sword. A hand that scatters the illusions of others I testify, endurance is his strength, 54. Regardless of Lebanese fears, the PLO's power in southern Lebanon, none remained over an isolated enclave. Once the civil war had ended, the Lebanese state wasted little time in targeting remaining. PLO control. Arafat had succeeded in creating a popular leadership among the Palestinians for the first time in their history, and in Lebanon he had even built the semblance of a state. But his at tempts to transform that leadership into one that could penetrate and shape Palestinian society beyond the Lebanese arena continued to meet impossible barriers. PLO leaders had always understood that capturing the imagination of the Palestinians or appealing to them through an attractive ideology would in itself have been insufficient to gain the control they wanted and needed. Moreover, as the dominant faction, Fater was often at a disadvantage compared to other groups in elaborate, in an effective ideology. Certainly, none of the others came close to Fater in garnering outside material support or in sheer size, it probably had 10,000, 15,000 men under arms at the end of the 1960s. But, often, their narrower bases allowed them to project more effective ideologies, Fater seemed a catch-all, sending loosely defined, often contradictory messages. It believed in not engaging in ideological debates about the character of the regime of the Liber, etted state at the present stage as it might split the Palestinians and divert their attention from the struggle against Israel, 55 sometimes its voice had deep Islamic resonances, at other times, it spoke a land, ewage of secularism. 56 sometimes it seemed to appeal to the Dan, trodden with the language of social revolution, at others it courted the growing Palestinian middle class. Alan Gresh has rather under, stated the case in noting that Fater is a movement with a variety of tendencies and sensitivities, 57. Given all its difficulties, the PLO, under the control of Fater, had managed to establish itself as the recognized leadership of the Pales, Tinians. It had nurtured a national mythology of heroism and sacri, Fais, the portrait of the downtrodden refugee giving way to that of the Fide, which, in turn became the catalyst for the reconstruction of the national movement. In time, armed struggle would give way to more non-violent activity, both for the sarke of international legiti, Macy and because of the Israeli abilities to deal with armed threats. But even if violence had failed to reverse al nakbar it had succeeded in projecting the Palestinian issue into the center of international concern. The PLO's continuing frustration was that its long stand, in enemy, Israel, had also consolidated its power, as it did so, its readiness to make concessions to the Palestinians decreased. Facing this formidable opponent, the PLO, at the end of the 1980s and the beginning of the 1990s, was unable to show tangible gains, despite its political evolution. Along with its other difficulties, the organizer, Shin's want of definition left its leadership vulnerable to challenges from within and to the rising tide of Islamic movements. In a world plagued by conflicts and suffering, the Palestinian people have faced unimaginable hardships for decades. The latest plea from a Palestinian, calling for the world to see their plight, has shaken the global conscience. A heartfelt message was recently read out on Turkish television, and its words resonate deeply, tell Muslim countries not to offer funeral prayers for us. We are alive, and you are dead. These powerful words capture the agony and despair that the Palestinian people endure daily. They reflect the sense of abandonment felt by a nation that has lived with decades of turmoil, conflict, and loss. The message calls upon the Muslim world, and indeed the entire international community, to recognize the ongoing plight of the Palestinian people and to stand in solidarity with their cause. The message highlights the painful reality that despite the immense suffering, the world often remains silent.
The ongoing Israeli-Palestinian conflict has led to countless casualties, displacement, and loss of life, but it continues without an end in sight. The Palestinian people live under the shadow of occupation, discrimination, and uncertainty, yearning for justice, peace, and their right to self-determination. The plea for Muslim countries not to offer funeral prayers is symbolic, emphasizing that the Palestinian people refuse to be forgotten, to fade into oblivion. They wish to remain steadfast in their struggle, to assert their right to life, and to resist oppression. The message, although tragic, carries a message of resilience and hope. It is a call for action, for the world to acknowledge the urgency of their cause. As the world witnesses countless conflicts, it is crucial not to forget the enduring struggle of the Palestinian people. Their message serves as a stark reminder of the ongoing crisis that has displaced generations and created an environment where dreams are shattered daily. The international community, regardless of religion, culture, or political beliefs, must respond to this call. It is a plea for humanity, for empathy, and for justice. The Palestinian people seek recognition of their rights, and their plea for life is a plea for dignity and freedom. It is a reminder that no one should accept injustice, oppression, and violence as a part of daily life. The words of the Palestinians' message are a tragic reflection of their reality. It is a call for the world to stand together, to speak out against injustice, and to work towards a peaceful and just resolution for one of the world's most protracted conflicts. In the face of their ongoing struggle, the Palestinian people are saying, we are alive, and it is time for the world to listen and to take action to ensure their right to life, liberty, and self-determination. For the nearly one million Arabs in the West Bank and Gaza Strip, Fatah's failure had long-term consequences. After slowly emerging from the disorientation of al nakbar the 1967 defeat, with the annexation of East Jerusalem, had been almost as great a shock. For now, the Palestinians seemed all the more incapable of formulating an answer to the occupation. Anticipating what would take place in Gaza, the Israeli military had made short order of Arafat's dreams of infiltrating into the heart of Palestinian society, assisted, in part, by Fatah's own loose organizational methods. Israel's policies were summed up in the title of a book written by the first Israeli military governor of the occupied territories. The stick and the carrot. Five. The stick, in the mode of nearly all modern occupying forces, was a se. Reese of harsh, repressive measures in response to almost any demon, stration of resistance, it included arrests, almost a thousand prisoners were in Israeli jails by the end of 1967, deportations, blowing up houses, and detention without trial or formal charges. Israeli military authorities also meted out collective punishments closing schools, shops, and markets, as well as imposing strict curfews on the Arab population, in response to nearly any provocation. The innovative aspect of Israel's occupying policies involved the carrot. Almost from the very beginning of its rule, the military role, Urs granted a relatively large degree of self-government to the municipalities, later allowing nearly 20% of the 1967 refugees to return through a family reunion program. They orchestrated two municipal elections in the 1970s, the second of which greatly expanded the role of eligible voters and resulted in pro-PLO officials holding office. Mosh Dayan, the defense minister through 1973 and the primary architect of these policies, insisted on open bridges for the movement of people and goods between the West Bank and Jaw, Dan, as well as a permeable border between the territories and Israel. He also kept Jordan firmly at the center of all considerations of the West Bank's future. In Dayan's notion of a functional division of rule between Israel and Jordan, the area's inhabitants would con tiny to be subjects of the Hashemite kingdom, while the land would be under Israel's control. Although there were qualifiers for many of his measures, the Israelis did try to foster the image of an enlightened, liberal, perhaps, even friendly, occupier. It even over, so the establishment of the first Palestinian universities, Birzit, 1972, al Najjar, 1977, and Gaza Islamic, 1978. As long as both Israelis and Palestinians regarded the occupier. Shun, excluding East Jerusalem, as a temporary state of affairs, 
There was little motivation on either side to exacerbate tensions on duty, little cause for the Palestinians to risk their precarious situations by abetting the cells Arafat tried to establish in 1967. Still, the Israeli policies and the prowess of Israeli intelligence services were only superficial causes for Fater's failure, interacting with a set of developments in Palestinian society that are the subjects of this chapter. From Resistance to Institution Building In June, 1967, the West Bank's character was shaped primarily by farming, as in the period of the Mandate.6 but what had then been a backwater now contained refugees who were more educated, less likely to have been peasants, than the rest of the West Bank popular, Shin. Many had lived in the towns and cities of the coastal plain B, for their descent into refugee status in 1948. While the East Bank had probably changed more due to Palestinian migration than the West Bank had due to initiatives from Amman, efforts at Jordanize, Inc., the West Bank had made some limited headway before the June War. Nonetheless, few West Bankers considered themselves primer, Ili Jordanians.7 nor did they think of themselves as Palestinians, indeed, use of the phrase to indicate nationality was just beginning to gain currency. Perhaps the best description of who they were in 1967, more so for the original inhabitants than for the refugees, was simply West Bankers. This did not exclude other dimensions of their identity, whether local, pan-Arab, or Islamic. Nor did it totally mask the deep rifts in the society, especially between the refugees and other residents. This said, it remains the case that the forces acting on the West Bank population had created a unique people, doggedly attached to the Palestine they now inhabited as well as the Palestine of their memories. Gazans, also using the memory of Palestine as the basis for a new refugee identity during the 19 years of Egyptian rule, but more cut off from the influences of other national cultures, had also developed their own distinctive subculture. The West Bank and Gazan strands of Palestinian culture only began to reconnect after the 1967 war, in the unexpected environment of a Jewish state. Even as PLO leaders in Lebanon established their organization as an international force in the early 1970s, many seemed to realize the futility of a policy in the occupied territories resting solely on a Gen. Eral armed uprising. Key Palestinians on the West Bank and in Gaza were putting their energies, not into fermenting such an uprising, but into limited, local political initiatives and the creation of a veri. Eti of social organizations. An alternative strategy began to evolve at the 10th and 11th sessions of the Palestine National Council in 1972 and 1973, a to grassroots efforts in the West Bank and Gaza Strip, to labor unions and other sorts of organizations and institutions. This strategy did not come easily. When Rashad al shorwar agreed to the Israeli entreaty to become mayor of Gaza and form a municipal council in the fall of 1971, local nationalists objected loudly. At first, the PLO refused to endorse the council. But al shorwar persisted, devoting himself to such issues as reviving Gaza's citrus industry. Sarah Roy has observed that, with the reinstatement of a locally based municipal structure and the defeat of the Rezis, Tans movement, political struggle began to challenge armed strug, GLE as a tactical approach for dealing with the realities of the occupation. Eight. As in the early 19th century, Nablus was at the center of these changes. But, unlike that period, when Nablus was the heart of an agricultural hinterland, and unlike the early 20th center, Turi, when it played the parochial foil to Jaffer's cosmopolitanism, the new Nablus was a locus of innovation the generation of indige, nous organizations that could create new social parameters. It was imperative for the PLO, if it hoped to stay relevant, to be in the forefront of this process. Its very charisma ensured that it would have an ongoing, forceful say in almost all forms of organizational life, the policies of municipal councils, the setting up and running of the new universities, the editorial policies of the Jerusalem News, papers, even the programs of the Boy Scouts.9 but its control was limited by two important factors, its physical distance from events in the territories, and the tendency of local organizations to develop and assume autonomous capabilities as their activities expanded. The PLO's complex relationship with the Palestine National Front, 
which emerged in the early 1970s to coordinate organizer national activities in the territories, demonstrates the PLO's struggle to come to terms with this dilemma. 10 The shift in policy reflected in these activities raised difficult questions about precisely who was in charge. Officially, the creation of the Palestine National Front was the result of a secret decision, divulged later, by the Palestine National Council at its 11th session, in January, 1973.11. In fact, the front was the creation of a number of young calm, meanest leaders in the West Bank. One of its initiators, the mayor of the small town of al Bayra, has noted that, following the 1973 war, we felt that we needed a collective leadership, so that our political stands and resistance to the military occupation would not be indie, vigilistic. 12. Much of this leadership was identified with the Pales, Tyne Communist Party, the rest included various guerrilla groups, the Ba'ath Party, labor unions, professional associations, student groups, and women's organizations. It gradually became apparent that the front more closely reflected the shape of events on the West Bank and in the Gaza Strip than it did the desires of the PNC or the PLO leadership. All of its local leaders publicly accepted the authority of the PLO, while both quietly positioning themselves to influence its decision-making and taking on increasing autonomy. 13. Their chief concern was reducing the West Bank's utter dependence on the Israeli economy. As the front's popularity grew in the West Bank and Gaza Strip, so did the suspicions within the PLO. The Palestine Communist Party represented an organized force with strong roots that PLO leaders feared they could not control. In 1975 and 1976, they dare mandate that it refrain from propagating any messages in the Terry, Tories other than those issued by the PLO. They also demanded prior review, and censorship, of any front publications, accusing it of trying to outmaneuver the PLO.14 Israel's own harsh response to the front, like many related policies, ironically played into the hands of PLO members who felt excluded as a result of its activities. Through a curious coalition of the PLO, Israeli authorities, who der, ported numerous front activists, and pro-Jordanian figures in the West Bank, the front declined, finally disappearing in 1977. It was not until 1987 that the local communists gained a seat on the Pales, Tyne National Council. Rather than being exceptional, the PLO's experience with the front was symptomatic of events to come. The Jordanians were con, tinuing to promote the dominant leadership from the post-1948 pay. Riyadh, naturally much more inclined to support its positions than the PLOs. Israel was scanning the horizon for leaders who would cooperate with its administration, looking either to existing local leaders or, later, to new ones through an abortive Israeli invention called the Village Leagues. With the distance from the West Bank, and in the context both of Jordan's open competition and what app, paired to be Israel's policy of creeping annexation, it is not surprise, in that the PLO felt pressed to cement alliances with viable figures in the territories. But its sense of urgency continued to be offset by the fear of finding its authority challenged. To deal with the DI, Lemma, it ended up granting significant latitude on local issues to its allies in the territories, while retaining for itself all, state, issues. But the solution may have been more rhetorical than practical. Local leaders intent on creating a Western-style, democratic state, such as lawyer Aziz Shadar of Ramallah, were as aware of the larger importance of their institution building as were the leaders of the PLO.15 during the Jordanian period, Shadar had already come under surveillance by the king's security forces for his views on Palestinian autonomy. By 1968, he had earned the wrath of both Fater and Jordan. Bypassing the PLO and expressing his views to Cyrus Vance, then the US Secretary of State, Shadar was subsequently assassinated. After the demise of the Palestine National Front, other groups arose that tried to accommodate the PLO's needs and demands with those of Israel and the local population. In response to the Camp David Accord, a 21-member National Guidance Committee formed in 1976, serving as a meeting point for heads of the municipalities, elected in 1976, as well as for those of other no-sent institutions. 
Both local and PLO leaders felt that the accord and subsequent Israeli-Egyptian peace treaty validated permanent Israeli control over the territories under the fig leaf of a theory called Palestinian autonomy. With the rush of events brought on by Sadat's visit to Jerusalem, the committee played a key role in Mobi, lizing local Palestinian opposition to what was occurring. Even that consensus could not hide the conflict between those inside the territories and those outside. Despite more institutional tinkering, this time, the reconstitution of the Palestine National Front to guide the Guidance Committee, the latter organization now fell victim to the complicity of Israel, the PLO, and Jordan. First crippled, it was finally outlawed by Israel in 1984. Fatah's leaders had somewhat more success in direct attempts at mobilizing youth than in the coordination of ongoing activities. In the early 1980s, they built the Youth Committee for Social Work, popularly known as Shabaiba, the Youth.16 with projects designed to ingratiate itself into Palestinian society, the organization offered little challenge to the social order, it sanctified the family, separated boys and girls, encouraged the traditional village value of mutual aid, and glorified village life. Its first project was to clean and rehabilitate cemeteries, thus stressing the ties of today's youth with their ancestors.17 and it followed by cleaning mosques, schools, and other public areas. Soon, it took on a more explicitly political role, work, in against land expropriations, it also aided families whose houses had been demolished by the Israeli military as a form of collective punishment, or whose members had been detained or deported. Shabaiba's success became particularly evident in the early stages of the Intifada, when it was outlawed by the Israeli authorities. But even in the case of such volunteer organizations, attention emerged with Fater. As we shall see below, university students' role lied behind leftist political groups, the Communist Party in conjunction with the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine and the Democratic Front, to establish a network of cells gaining for more independence than Fater was willing to grant. Local labor unions similarly threatened Fater's position, and were thus wrested from their democratically elected leadership, inducing a split in the General Federation of Palestinian Union Workers. Such differences were probably inevitable. PLO leaders saw themselves as building the foundations for a Palestinian state. Local organizers, although talking of their role in this state, were in fact EN, gauged in a very different project, erecting a civil society out of the diverse Palestinian population. In any case, the PLO faced other four formidable barriers to the entrenchment in the territories its leaders sought. First, the Fater leadership faced competition from other L. Immense in the PLO, a rivalry not limited to youth groups, which fragmented the organization's efforts. 18 second, the Israelis engaged in an ongoing process of deporting individuals with connections to the PLO from the territories. Their absence, coupled with difficult ties the organization had with those allies who were available, reflected difficulties running much deeper than the population's UN responsiveness to the initial call to arms in the summer of 1967. Perhaps the provisional character of the occupation made popular armed resistance seem superfluous. In the case of the 1956 Sinai War, Israel had been compelled to return the land it conquered, the Gaza Strip and most of the Sinai Peninsula, in less than half a year, without any serious public protests from the Gazan population. The in age of Israeli invincibility coming out of the 1967 war may also have made such resistance seem somewhat futile. For both these reasons, the warrior was fading as a rallying point in the popular imagination, replaced, as we have suggested, with more indigenous, less remote archetypes, especially that of the survivor possessing infinite steadfastness, sumud. Like almost any cultural concept that takes on increasing power and meaning, sumud became a subject of controversy. 19 Palestinians in the territories differed over the correct form of steadfastness in the face of an occupation turning out in fact, to be prolonged. The more passive school argued for preserving the status quo, minimal interaction or cooperation with the enemy, and opposition, whenever possible, to any territorial or demographic change. The emphasis was on endurance and, as time went on, 
avoiding any pretexts for deportation. 20 others argued for active institution building, seeing local politics as part of the process of state making. Understood either actively or passively, the image of the steadfast survivor was endowed with an aura of glamour by West bankers and Gazans eager to avoid the stigma attached to those who had stayed in Israel in 1948 and, many assumed, collaborated with Israel. It gave their daily lives a larger meaning and purpose, ironically, in the context of wide cooperation with the occupier, paying taxes, seeking the many permits needed for various routines, and working for is. Israelis, even as builders of Jewish settlements or as aides to Israeli military and police officials. Only selling land to Jews, serving Israeli intelligence, and negotiating on wider political issues without PLO permission could jeopardize that standing. The PLO leaders understood the importance of steadfastness, of preventing a mass exodus of Palestinians from the West Bank and Gaza Strip, and subsequent land sales to Israelis. It supported a project by the Arab states, valued by them as a lever of control, to establish Sundak al-Sumad, the Steadfastness Fund, to discourage migration. But the theme of the survivor represented a threatening self-sufficiency. A newfound respect for the West Bank's indigenous forces was manifest in the incorporation of the Palestine Commune, NIST party into the Palestine National Council in 1987. While ARA, FAT, the archetypal FIDE, remained the personification of Palestinian nationalism in the occupied territories, it was becoming crystal clear that the vast majority of Palestinians were not prepared to take up arms. The Changing Structure of Society In 1987, patterns of West Bank life ranging from marriage to migration looked very different from 20 years before, a change start, in in the wake of an overheated Israeli economy in the period fall, lowing the war. 21 pent up demand generated an extraordinarily high need for workers, especially low skill, low wage labor that Palestinians could readily provide, and they were gradually integrated into the Israeli labor market. 22 by the 1973 war, as much as one third of the total workforce in the occupied territories was employed in Israeli agriculture, industry, building construction, and services. This drew labor from indigenous economic activities in the West Bank and Gaza, mostly agriculture but some local industry as well. As in the period before 1948, Palestinians now found their econ, Omi uncompetitive with, and overwhelmed by, the adjoining Jewish economy, in agriculture, Israeli gross produce per worker was for times as high as that in the West Bank.23 under these circumstances. The possibilities for self-sufficiency there vanished, it became a res, ervoya of cheap labor for Israel and its second biggest export market, after the United States. An initial drop in production for farm produce from the Aku, Pied territories was followed by a recovery. Continued access to Jaw, Danian markets as a result of the open bridges policy, coupled with Israeli purchases, despite their official ban, of specialized goods, precipitated a period of recovery from a post-war slump for larger West Bank farmers. Faced with rising agricultural wages due to the lure of jobs in Israel, they began to mechanize and become more productive through use of plastic coverings for vegetables, drip iri, gashin, and so forth. 24 They also drew more women and children into the labor market, largely as low-paid day workers, filling the gap in the agricultural sector caused by the draw of jobs in Israel. Overall, However, agriculture, the economic mainstay during Jaw, Danian and Egyptian rule, played a diminishing role in the Tarato, Reese, 25 made even more salient by the overall rapid growth of their economy. 26 along with the magnetic effect of the Israeli labor market. The decline was caused by a closing of large tracts of land on the West Bank as military security zones and for Jewish settlements and a severe limitation put by Israeli authorities on water use. It is ironic that even as the guerrilla groups resuscitated and glorified the cull, troll portrait of the heroic peasant, economic changes were making such traditional farmers historical anachronisms, a situation Remy, nissant of the period of the Arab revolt in the 1930s.27. Throughout the West Bank and Gaza, employers were now Jew-ish, not Arab, banks were Israeli branches, not Arab ones. Israel had forced banks in the West Bank to break their ties to Jordanian par and companies, causing the shutdown of the local branches, 
It all load the branches of the Kairawa Man Bank to reopen in the mid 1980s. The largest local industry was still olive oil. It was followed by textiles, quarrying, and food processing. 28 industries were increasingly coming to be subcontractors for larger Israeli manufacturers. While investment in local industry and infrastructure remained pitifully low, continuing a trend of inadequate investment begun under Jordanian and Egyptian rule 29, consumption grew, as reflected in a remarkable boom in family home construction. Salim Tamri observes that the average peasant, after saving some money, tends to put it into a separate housing unit for his own nuclear household and converts the rest into gold jewelry. Thirty. The new prosperity rested on the multiple sources of income POS, sussed by many families, as husbands and sons worked in Israel proper. In 1987, shortly before the outbreak of the Intifada, the numbers of workers officially crossing daily into Israel peaked at 107,000, 61,000 from the West Bank and 46,000 from the Gaza Strip, and the actual number was probably greater. Perhaps as high as 120,000 point three when the official figure alone translated into a full 40 per cent of the workforce in the territories. Indications exist that poorer families with many children were able to narrow the economic gap by sending as many as three or four workers to Israel to engage in construction, agriculture, indus, tri, and services for Jewish employers. While their wages were low by Israel standards. In the context of the West Bank and Gaza Strip, they were considerable, and when added together, allowed a rise in status and standard of living. In the 1970s, with the migration of Palestinians to high-paying jobs generated by the oil boom in the Persian Gulf, remittances from abroad, an important source of income in the West Bank and Gaza Strip since the 1950s, further supplemented wages earned in Israel. At times, the absolute number of people in the labor force on the West Bank actually decreased due to the continuing exodus. Higher skilled laborers served as engineers and teachers in the Gulf and in Jordan, which had its own economic boom in the years after 1967. The influx of capital back to the territories from all these workers probably totaled dollar 100, 200 million each year. Other sources of capital also fueled the economic changes. Trade with Israel for industrial and agricultural goods increased consider, ably, 32, and there were continuing payments of salaries by the Jordanian government to civil servants on the West Bank. About $150 million came from the Steadfastness Fund, supported by the Arab states, 33, with additional aid from continuing on air war expenditures on education and salaries, as well as from the U.S., about $5 million per year from 1975 to 1985. And private voluntary organizations in the West, about 20 million dollars per year. Dot 30 for finally the Israelis mainly. After 1977, invested in public works such as road building and electrification, although these were directed largely towards security and the needs of the expanding Jewish settlements. One author has observed that the economy of the Gaza Strip is an excellent example of how certain levels of economic prosperity can be achieved with little. If any economic development, 35 much the same could be said for the West Bank. For Fater and the PLO, this combination held portentous implications. Almost all the sources of vitality, the Israeli economy, the oil boom, outside cap, till flows, even the continuing salaries paid by the Jordanian Gov, earnment to civil servants, lay beyond their control. At the same time, the basis for the growth of Palestinian resentment was widened. The territories becoming mere markets for Israeli produce and suppliers of cheap labor. 36, and this generated sympathy for the PLO and Fide. PLO leaders were not oblivious to this paradox. At the tenth session of the Palestine National Council in 1972, they passed resolutions calling for new trade union and welfare organizer shins that could mobilize the public in the territories under their auspices. The foundations for uprising. The remarkable thing for both Palestinians and Israelis was that, despite all the difficulties the PLO encountered in establishing con, troll, and a capacity to mobilize, an uprising finally did materialize in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. It was not the armed rebellion Fater advocated, but it was a massive act of resistance. It erupted in December 
1987, two decades after Arafat's call to arms, without the DI rection of the resistance cells he had tried to establish then. In fact, it may have surprised him as much as anyone. The hopes that the Israeli occupation would be short-lived had proved ever more fleeting. In October, 1967, a small group of Israelis had formed the Land of Israel movement, asserting the right of the Jewish people and the Israeli state to rule all of what had been the earlier mandated territory of Palestine. The assertion was made more and more stridently, rendering any departure from what had now become the status quo increasingly costly. The terms of the high decibel political debate centered on the disposition of the Tur, right trees, questions of defensible borders, the historical, including biblical, rights over the land, the possibilities of trading land for peace, and the settlement of Jews on the newly captured lands, while little was said about the people in them. Almost precisely a year after the war, the Labour Party led Israeli government tabled the Ian Plan. Named after Yugal Ian, former army general and a minister with several different portfolios in the Labour government, the plan proposed a return of about two thirds of the West Bank to Jordan, while holding onto a Jewish settled SE purity strip along the Jordan River. It also would have retained other areas near the old Israeli borders that would attract Jewish settlers. In the first version of the plan, the Gaza Strip was to remain a part of Israel, a preference echoed by Prime Minister Levi Eshkol and Defense Minister Mosh Dayan, although in a later one Ian Khan, Kivt of Gaza as part of a Jordanian-Palestinian state.37. The government never adopted Ian's design, and the plan did not lead to Israel's ceding the Gaza Strip or parts of the West Bank. It did, however, legitimate the settling of Jews within the lines it had vocated, adding yet another complicating factor to the difficult realer shins with the Palestinian Arabs. Behind the settlement, and much of the refusal to return captured territory, was a new social move meant, Gush Eminim, or the Bloc of the Faithful, founded after the 1973 War. 38 by 1977, about 11,000 Jews had put down stakes in 84 mostly tiny new communities in the occupied territories, among the most important being Elon Mora, Sebastia, Ofra, and Maladunum. That was the year the Israelis voted the Labour government out of office, in favour of the Likud Party's nationalistic coalition, led by Menachem Begin. Under the new government and its successors, about 100,000 Jewish settlers took up residence in the occupied Tur, Reitries by the end of the 1980s. Most of these were concentrated in 15 settlements, largely metropolitan satellites of Tel Aviv and Jeru, Salem. The Palestinians in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip found themselves facing a two-sided process of change. While their own society was undergoing major transformations, in good part be cause of a growing symbiotic relationship with the tumultuous Israeli economy, a powerful ethnic group was settling in their midst. The settlers posed an immediate problem through their exclusive and preferential rights, the Israeli government granted them a set of laws different from those of their neighbors, and, in some respects, from those of Jews inside Israel, preferred access to water and land, special security arrangements.39 The glaring reality of second, class status now confronted the Palestinians not only during so, journeys into Israel. The settlers were also causing longer-term complications. They lobbied with considerable success for the Israeli government to include the West Bank and Gaza Strip, but not their Arab inhabitants, within the state borders, and to redefine Israeli identity to legiti, make this inclusion.40 This implied granting the Palestinians for fewer rights than the Jews or, at best, a separate set of rights alto, gather, within some context of local Palestinian autonomy. By the 1980s, it interacted, at times, with the ominous notion of transfer, ring, the Arabs, through economic inducements or deportation, depending on who was proposing the transfer, from the territo, Reese. While this new threat emanated from marginal political power, ties, once the Intifada was underway, as much as half the Jewish public subscribed to one or another of its forms.41. The political menace to Palestinians, then, was dynamic in no cure. It did not stem from military occupation alone, but from the powerful economic forces and incrementally changing legal code that came with it, from the growing Jewish presence, 
increasingly after 1977 in the most heavily populated parts of the West Bank, from shifting Israeli opinions about the ultimate disposition of the territories and their inhabitants, and from the reordering of Israeli society and its politics. 42 by the early 1980s, occupation with a smile had turned into hardened. Military rule, a stick for more than a car, rot. A clear shift came as early as 1978, with the Likud's appointment of Menahem Milson to the position of administrator of the West Bank. Milson, a Hebrew university professor of Arabic literature, felt Palestinian nationalism had been allowed to grow on him. Dirt long enough. By 1985, the term iron fist had entered the Israeli lexicon, introduced by the former prime minister and now defense minister of a national unity government, Labor Yitzhak Rabin. For both Palestinians and Israelis, the occupation was having a wearing effect, exacerbating the existing proclivity to demonize one another. With pallid international initiatives failing to bring an end to Israeli rule, some Palestinians, including those born under occupation, began to advocate a move beyond steadfastness. Along with the nature of the occupation, the character of the Pales, Tinians was changing. West Bankers and Gazans had begun to DEM and straight their solidarity with Israeli Arabs by marking Land Day. Palestinians adopted a common hymn, By Ladi, By Ladi, My Can, Try, My Country, from an Egyptian patriotic tune, along with Com, posing or adopting many other songs to articulate a growing sense of common identity and protest their circumstances. A literature of resistance appeared and quickly expanded. In 1982, the military gov, Ernment banned the distribution of approximately 1,000 books, including fiction, non-fiction, and poetry 43, a doubtful jizz, chua, since the items can be bought in East Jerusalem, where the mill, a tree has no authority. East Jerusalem also became the base of the Palestinian press, a major tool in creating national consciousness, with newspapers distributed semi-illegally in the West Bank and Gaza, Israel and abroad.44 the authorities outlawed the display of the black, white, red, and green Palestinian flag, as well, but without noticeable success. In very important ways, the meetings, discus, shawn, and political activity of the 1970s had had a cumulative effect, resulting by the 1980s in a much more tightly woven society.45. Probably no structures played a more important role in this re- Guard than the new universities. Fearful of the emergence of an indie, pendant center of West Bank life, the Jordanian authorities had stood in the way of the creation of a Palestinian national university in Ramallah in 1970-71. One of the key figures behind the effort had been Aziz Sharder, who ran afoul of the PLO as much as he did the Jordanians, another was Sheikh Ali al-Jabri, the traditional, pro-Jordanian leader of Hebron. Despite this failure, local colleges did emerge on the West Bank, mostly out of well-established high schools. Besides the three major universities authorized by Dayan, there was the Islamic College of Hebron, Jerusalem University, which included three separate colleges, and Bethlehem University. The motivation for building these colleges was not so much nation, alism as necessity, given the difficulty of attending outside university ties and the higher incomes of Palestinian Arab families. Once built, the colleges became centers for interpreting the occupation's common meaning. They also became the cornerstone of a quiet demand for autonomy in other spheres. With almost 14,000 students by 1985, their weight was considerable.46. In Birzit, the student council put great effort into nationalists, Tick cultural activities, including festivals, exhibits, and Palestinian weeks. A typical one involved poetry readings, presentations of plays, and song recitals, all with strong nationalistic themes. China reports that Palestinian flags and posters with the national colors, both banned by the authorities, are usually raised and decorated with slogans such as Palestine, fight till the end, blessed art thou, Palestine, the ancestors' land, with Allah's help we shall come back, we shall return in battle with the most courageous soldiers, and a death to the Jews, 47. University and college students were determined to carry their AC activities beyond the campus. 
Those at Bir Zit sought to provide eco, nomic and social services to Fellaheen and to the villages. Behind their participation in plowing, harvesting, road building, and vill, large cleaning lay the cultural theme of Sumud. Its new vitality owed much to the Palestine Communist Party and its strong indigenous roots. Backed by the party, the students worked to bridge the divide between rural and urban Palestinians and head off Israeli efforts to purchase land from farmers. In 1980, in the face of opposition from Fater, Jordan, and various elements who feared activities mixing men and women, they established the Supreme Committee for Vol. Untree Work.48 The committee included about 40 branches and more than 1,000 volunteers. Its credo was as follows. We do not only build a wall or pave a road. We are building a new who, man being our purpose is to turn voluntary work into a work. Shop and a school, both able to provide our Palestinian people with pioneering individuals, bound by national ethics, firmly anchored into the land and highly dedicated to the National Cause 49. As we have seen in Chapter 4, the mandate period had already wit, nest the beginning of a trade union movement among Palestinian Arabs, with communists, Zionists, and others scrambling to augur, nice the emerging working class. Some activity had continued in the Jordanian period, especially by the Jordanian Communist Party, but harsh repression had choked these grassroots efforts. In 1961, there were 16 active local trade unions in various economic sectors, compared to approximately 44 years earlier. After the 1967 war, union activity increased dramatically more as a vehicle towards national unity than of class struggle. Growth was most rapid after 1975, especially in the West Bank, although the unions did not incorporate that half of the workforce commuting daily to Israel, where they were not recognized. With the larger union roles, internal battles abounded, particularly between the communists and Fater.50 at stake was not only who would have his hand on the levers of power in society but also the distribution of funds provided by Arab states as a result of the 1979 Baghdad Conference. Like the student-led groups, the unions were part of an intense effort by leftist organizations to mobilize the population. Nationalism was never far from the top of their agenda. In several strikes of the important Jerusalem Union of Hotel, Restaurant, and Coffee Shop Workers, which had over 1,000 Jews-paying members and probably almost as many non-paying sympathizers, demands over wages and working conditions commingled with those to expel Israeli union organizers.51 The trade unions, with their highly DEM, ocratic settings and generally fair elections, at least until Fater is F, fought to control their activities 52, were models for a common effort transcending family and other ties. They also served as excellent schools for local and regional leadership, most union leaders even, Chile being detained or deported by the Israelis. There is some evidence of Palestinian women's activism as far back as 1884, protesting the establishment of the first Jewish settle. Men's.53 During the mandate, small groups of women, mainly from the iron and prosperous Christian merchant families, took advantage of their relative freedom to participate in the national struggle, about 200 women participated in the Palestine Congress of Octo, Burr, 1929, then marching through the streets of Jerusalem chanting anti-British slogans.54 but these efforts were very limited. It was only from the mid-1960s that broad-based women's associations became critical components in the building of a new civil society. In the West Bank, as in Israeli-Palestinian society, they provided a wide array of social services for community centers, orphanages, homes for the elderly, and families facing the imprisonment of sons and husbands. The most important of these associations, Inish Alisra, which roughly translates as Family Support Network, was actually created in 1965, before Israeli occupation began. Its founder, Samahar Khalil, popularly known as Um, mother of Khalil, came from a middle-class refugee family. She and her colleagues built branches all through the West Bank, offering women diverse training projects and employed them in a variety of ways, mainly producing trady, chanel wares and textiles.55 more explicitly political organizations, such as the Palestinian Women's Association and the General Union of Palestinian Women, also began to take hold on the West Bank. 
student groups, labor unions, and women's associations can see. Touch only a small portion of the institutional network that existed at the outbreak of the Intifada in 1987. Sports clubs, a sophisticated and politicized central theater, other amateur acting groups, cherai, ties, branches of the Red Crescent Society, the Palestinian Physicians, Pharmacists and Lawyers Association, other professional organizations, all thrived, especially when compared to the period of Jordan, Nian rule, helping make life under prolonged occupation viable. 56. Occupation had also made it more likely that such voices would be heard, and that enough cohesion existed for a collective response to be effective. The occupation had substantially weakened what or denarily would have been the most prominent and influential social class, that of the landowners and merchants. 57. While certainly not eclipsing all the differences between rich and poor, the new institutional activities, led by the university and high school graduates and aided by the general antipathy to Israeli occupation, served as meat in grounds for diverse groups of Palestinians. The occupation thus resulted in the first steps toward a political leveling of the society and in bases for association across formerly unbroachable sexual and class lines 58, key elements in the spontaneous outbreak of the Intifada. Equally important was the deteriorating standard of economic life in the territories during the 1980s, a major factor in the semblance of normality during the occupation's first 15 years having been the burgeoning economy. As in the first half of the 1940s, fast-paced economic growth had served as a damper on call, elective resistance. Three sources of prosperity had fueled this economy, Israel itself, with its developed, labor-intensive market, Jordan, with its strong agricultural buildup, and the Persian Gulf states, with their seemingly endless supply of petrodollars. By the early 1980s, each had entered a prolonged crisis, in turn choking the West Bank and Gaza. A sense of economic hopelessness now combined with flagging hopes that international diplomacy, the PLO, or outside Arab R, mice would bring an end to the occupation. Internationally, the pay, Riyadh had witnessed the dissolution of the alliance between Hussein and Arafat, the disappointing Arab summit in Amman, and the Reagan-Gorbachev meeting, all of which indicated lack of moment, tum towards a diplomatic solution. A much more educated, mo, bile, a non-agricultural population found a world of shrinking economic opportunities. The contrast between the pre- and post-1980 economy in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip is dramatic. With overall economic growth in the period from 1967 to 1980 averaging over 5% annually, the territories had witnessed an easing of the harsh material condi, since the Palestinians had endured under Jordanian and Egyptian rule. Gazans, in particular, had entered the era of occupation with annual per capita incomes averaging $80.59 by the beginning of the Intifada, that figure had reached $1,700. Even in the West Bank, which had been part of Jordan's rapidly growing economy, over 8% annual economic growth between 1954 and 1967, personal consumption was far greater than at the beginning of Israeli rule. The gross domestic product more than tripling between 1968 and 1980, an extraordinarily high rate of growth by world standards. 60 Even if those economies demonstrated little self-generating potent, tile, they at least had made life materially palatable for most of the population. During the late 1970s, worrisome economic signs were on the whole, risen. The Israeli economy, which had been a textbook case of rapid growth until the 1973 war, slipped into a long period of slow growth and stagnation. 61 Inflation, always something of a problem, became hyperinflation, with annual rates reaching 1,000%. In many areas of the world, inflation has been a precipitant for social unrest, its corrosive effects on wages and savings combined with the unser, tainty that it fosters has often served as a mobilizing force among workers. For Palestinians, now deeply integrated into the Israeli economy, stagflation had dire consequences. By 1980, it was evident that real wages for those working in Israel were eroding, and by 1985 the slippage was quite pronounced. 
Workers from one West Bank village reported that their real wages were cut in half by inflation in the five-year period before 1,985.6 to the resulting economic discontent, combined with the occupation, formed the basis for easy no nationalist fervor. Unemployment, first evident in Israel in the late 1970s, began to hit the territories seriously in the early 1980s. Rates of unemployment in the West Bank more than quadrupled between 1980 and 1985 to over 5 percent, hitting the young and the educated particularly hard. In the latter part of the decade, the influx of Soviet Jews exacerbated the problem of unemployment, reaching double-digit figures in Israel. The immigration had both an indirect effect on Palestinians by straining the already fragile economy they depended upon and, later, a direct impact as Soviets filled the menial jobs Arabs had formerly held. In the early 1990s, overqualified Palestinians, the products of the expanding educational system, and overqualified Soviet Jews eyed the same low-level jobs. Just as immigration levels were rising, Israel found itself with a rapidly declining rate of new job creation, to less than 1.5% by 1980. The country had moved from a labor-hungry economy at the start of the occupation to one in which the workforce could not be absorbed. As the politically and economically weakest part of that workforce, Palestinians found the change particularly ominous. Complicating the situation in Israel was that in outside Econo, mice. Through the 1970s, Palestinians had left the West Bank and Gaza in large numbers for opportunities elsewhere. The net outflow was as high as 20,000 people a year, even with all the M faces on the survivors Sumud.63 for both migrants and family members depending on their remittances, the performance of other Middle Eastern economies was crucial. Jordan had served both as a transit point and end point for those leaving the West Bank. For the overall period 1965-86, its economy had rapidly expanded. But high average rates of economic growth can mask sharp vacillations.64 in the few years after the 1967 war and the loss of the West Bank, Jordan's national product had declined by one-third to two-fifths. By the time Israel assumed control of the West Bank in 1967, as many as 400,000 Palestinians had migrated in search of a better life. In the 1970s, Jordan rebounded achieving the stupendous growth rate of 10% in the five years following 1977. It benefited from the good fortune of the oil states, whose petrodollars meant aid, financial investments, and remittances, and from the ill fortune of Lebanon, which lost its key financial role among the Arab states to Amman during its long civil war. But during the 1980s, the country's absorptive capacity dried up in the wake of the larger Middle Eastern economic crisis. Remit, tances slipped steadily through the decade, leading to large declines in per capita income. 65 The Gulf War of 1991 simply capped an al ready eroding position, aid from the oil states ending and the Econ only contracting severely, due to Jordan's support of Saddam Hussein. saying. Clearly, Jordan was no longer an attractive stop for West Bank workers. The oil producing states were also facing severe contraction. World fears of an international oil shortage at the outbreak of the Iran-Iraq war in 1980 had driven prices to unprecedented heights, a standard barrel had reached $40, compared to a figure less than one-third of that after the first series of oil price hikes following the Arab-Israeli war of 1973. But this boom was not to last long, over, pumping in the face of such attractive rates and slackening demand due to both high cost and world recession led to a precipitous decline in prices. By the late 1980s, with a barrel selling for around $15, the real price had fallen to less than half of what it had been at the end of 1973, and less than one-third what it had been in 1980. The slump cut deeply into Palestinian economic life. Jobs disappeared, making emigration much less attractive. Remittances from workers in the Gulf countries diminished drastically. Palestinian Arabs in the West Bank and Gaza were thrown back on the local economy and that of Israel at precisely the wrong time. Perhaps a third of those working in Israel still cultivated land and could gain some income from farming. Happily, the failure of Cap, Italist, 
Mechanized farming in the mountainous villages of the West Bank meant that those who could hold onto postage stamp sized plots had a fallback when all else failed, also serving as a source of income to share tenants who worked the land. 66 But many workers were rural dwellers without access to land, still, others lived in the towns or refugee camps. The Israeli policy of carrots and economic opportunities, something for Palestinians to contemplate losing when the thought of resistance crossed their minds, meant little to a generation raised and educated under stiffening occupation, many of whose members were now unemployed and with little economic hope for the future. 67. The bleakness of national prospects thus combined with despair over individual and family prospects. Added to this dismal brew were the personal experiences of routine harassment, occasional beatings, arrests without formal charges, and humiliating searches by security forces at roadblocks and checkpoints. Young Palestine, Ians increasingly felt there was little to lose if they broke the rules of the game. Interfader On 8 December 1987, an Israeli truck hit two vans carrying Gaza Lar Boras in Jabaliar, a refugee camp packed with 60,000 resi. Dense the crash instantly killed four of them. Rumor, an essential ingredient in the prelude to any ethnic violence, spread quickly that the wreck was no accident, but an act of vengeance on the part of the relative of an Israeli stabbed to death several days earlier in the Gaza market. A denunciatory Palestinian leaflet, one of the upris, Ing's major motifs, appeared in the evening. At the funeral that same evening, thousands of mourners turned on the nearby Israeli army post, assaulting it with a barrage of stones. By the morning, the streets and alleys of the camp were filled with quickly fashioned barricades, and full-scale violence broke out, inaugurating the uprising. Acts of violence against the occupying forces were certainly not unheard of in the territories. Between 1968 and 1975, the Israeli Milai, Terry counted an average of about 350 incidents a year, from 1976 to 1982, the number doubled. After that, it jumped precipitously to 3,000, which itself dramatically paled next to the outbreak starting in December. Over the next six months, there were 42,355 recorded incidents. 68 For the first time since the occupation began, the Israeli forces lost control of the population in the occupied territories. On the uprising's first day, rioting spread to other camps in the Gaza Strip and the next day it fanned across those in the West Bank as well. During the rest of December, the confrontations occurred largely in the camps, the sites of the most extreme misery as well as the centres of nationalism over the previous decades. Between mid-January and mid-February, villages and towns also became actively involved in the resistance. 69. Just as important as the spontaneous extension of the rioting was the Palestinian perception of its meaning, not as expressing in individual grievances, but those of all the individuals and localities together. The events soon acquired a name, Interfader, Shaking Off, which was consciously compared to the 1936-39 revolt. 70 The mythic qualities of the survivor now stood alongside a new cultural form, direct and sometimes violent resistance. For the third time in the last two centuries, the Arabs of Palestine had risen up in revolt. Its fighters were not professional guerrillas, but children of the stone, faces shrouded by kafirs or masks, standing ready to confront Israeli soldiers openly and head on. In the popular image, they stood without feelings of inferiority, the soldier with his modern weapons, the shabab armed only with stones. Here is one among countless poems glorifying the new hero, and making the imper, tant jump from the child to the shaheed, or martyr. Have you seen his mark in the streets in my bloodstream rave winds flames spurt from my fingers? He dawned. On people's horizon he woke us. He joined us. He bonded us all. Lo the moon has now risen he lived and was roaring he died and was roaring. Hail the stone. Hail the stone. Hail the stone, 71. Martyrdom became the means to make legendary the acts of chill, drun of the stone. The family of a martyr was accorded special honor, and posters of him were carried at demonstrations and up, paired on walls. The omnipresent leaflets and folk songs acclaimed his heroic acts. Penny Johnson notes that, in the Interfader, 
The rebel, Leo's young men, the Shabab, have become the sons of all the people and their exploits legendary, 72. The PLO financially supported the martyr's family, although can, onization as a shaheed occasionally led to a process of bargaining about the precise amount of support. While the popular imagina, Shun was fixed on individual, youthful heroism, indeed, often the stone-throwing consisted of such spontaneous acts, and often by groups of Shabab, existing organizations, such as Shabaibar, and new, Maris new youth groups, stood behind the uprising's more institutionalized strike forces. Within a short time, the image of the child of the stone became so powerful that Israeli soldiers were in. Struck to direct their fire at the chief instigators, those with the shrouded faces. If the shock troops of the Intifada were represented by a young masked face, the new local leadership was represented by the Anani, Moose leaflet, itself a way to shroud, its, true face, 73 territory-wide leaflets appeared by the end of December, and by January they car, read the signature of the unified national leadership of the Upras, in the occupied territories, later accompanied by the signature of the PLO.70 for the leadership consisted, at least in the first half year or so, of the second. Rank representatives of the various outside guerrilla organizations, Fater, the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, and the Democratic Front for the Liberation of Pales, Tyne plus the Palestine Communist Party. This mirrored the heavier influence of leftist groups inside the territories compared to outside, where Fater's dominance was much more pronounced. In fact, leftists claimed that the outside should be organized along the same lines. Not naming top figures made it more difficult for the Israelis, but also for the uprising's leaders, to develop the autonomy that the Fata-dominated PLO feared. The leadership drew up the leaflets in the territories, based on local circumstances, and then sent them outside for modification and approval by the PLO, which broadcast them over Baghdad Radio.75 local Shabab then distrib, ute them in the West Bank and the Strip. Besides containing eulogies of the Shaheed, the leaflets set out SPE. Civic directives for the strike forces, the popular committees that had formed to implement the plans, and the general population. A primary goal articulated in the leaflets was to break the dependency of the territories on Israel, as a prelude to the establishment of a Palestinian state. 76 they called for a shunning of the Israeli civil administration, a boycott of Israeli products, a mass resignation of Palestinian police officers and tax collectors, a refusal to pay taxes, a search for alternatives to work in Israel especially in agricultural EN, to prizes, attacks on Jewish settlers and an end to work in the set. Tullments, a closing of shops for part of each day, and an attempt to create alternative Palestinian institutions in industry, agriculture, education, and the like. The results were decidedly mixed. Police officers and tax collect. Tours did indeed resign, much to the consternation of the Israelis, who futilely used a variety of means to try to reverse the mass walk out. At great economic cost, shopkeepers heeded the call for a par tile commercial strike, shuttering their stores each afternoon. But the boycott of Israeli products only partially succeeded, it did pro vide a boom for local workshops, benefiting from an increased demand for their own products. 77 and except for announced general strikes, which were quite effective a substantial proportion of labor, errs continued to cross into Israel to work, albeit in reduced num, burs, many others continued to work for the settlements. This mirrored the mixed success of the Intifada as a whole. Its triumph in a number of areas was unprecedented. Images of the Shahid electrified the population, leading to new, sustained levels of mobilization and revolutionary fervor. The poet Mahmoud Darwish captured the mood in words addressed to Israelis. We have that which does not please you, we have the future, and we have things to do in our land. Another partisan declared that, an air of popular democracy has pervaded the atmosphere, 78. Self-reliance grew, as well. When the Israelis closed schools for prolonged periods, many Palestinians set up their own clandestine classrooms. Economically, they became increasingly self-sufficient in a number of fields, such as dairy farming, by buying cows from Israelis, they managed to satisfy 80% of their dairy needs, 
and animal husbandry. At the same time, the uprising blooded the al ready faltering Israeli economy. The Bank of Israel reported that after two years of rebellion the direct cost to Israel had been 1.4 per cent of its national wealth, or over $1 billion, and the indirect costs even higher.79. But after four years of sometimes bloody battles, the Palestinians had not managed to bring an end to the occupation or create no national independence. This failure, notes one researcher, led to the redefinition of their goals, now generally defined as the re-establishment of the Palestinian political agenda internationally, and the reaffirmation of Palestinian identity, 80 It is not surprising that after the first six months the uprising lost some of its spontaneity and autonomy. The original unified leadership was decimated, 69 lead, er sent into exile by mid-1991, well over 600 shooting deaths, 81 and 40,000 arrests through May 1990. And the Arafat-led PLO exercised firmer control over those who replaced them. Local leaders also found that they had to temper some of their demands on the population. Later leaflets modulated the stigma on working in Israel, imposing a ban, instead, on certain days or on specific sectors that competed with the Palestinian economy. The boycott on Israeli products was modified so that it applied to prod, ux for which a local substitute was available.82. Large-scale violence by a nearly permanently mobilized popular, shin gave way to small groups of resistors or even individuals who used hit-and-run tactics and sabotage, including arson in Israeli forests, torching of cars, and knifing and kidnapping of Israelis, especially soldiers and settlers in the occupied territories. By the 1990s, the Israelis were content to station their military forces safely outside most refugee camps and other communities, allowing an unanticipated degree of community autonomy. The new deploy meant also reduce the opportunities for head-on confrontations be between mobilized groups of Palestinians and Israeli soldiers. A sense of hopelessness had pervaded the territories in Novum, Burr, 1987, a feeling that all the diplomatic jet-setting by PLO exec, UTIV members and Arab statesmen would not bring an end to occupation. The Arab summit meeting that month had placed the Iran-Iraq war, not the Palestinians, at the top of the Arab agenda. That message, in fact, helped spark the uprising, as a self-reliant way of emerging from a political cul-de-sac.83. After more than two years of frenzied rioting and backbreaking hardship, renewed despair about the uprising's limited potential now led the Palestinians to look outside again for some way to end the occupation. By spring of 1988, the unified leadership's leaflets were openly calling for outside diplomatic support. Later, Palestine, in support of Saddam Hussein in the Gulf War reflected a desper, at hope of thus achieving what the Intifada clearly could not. After Iraq's ignominious defeat, Roy wrote of those in the Gaza Strip, Palestinians feel totally abandoned, increasingly helpless, and very fearful. They are harassed by the army on a daily basis and have no institutional recourse or form of appeal. Daily life is impossibly oppressive and people genuinely despair of protection, 84 and in fact, in a widely quoted statement, Defense Minister Rabin defined the measures needed to maintain security as might, force, and beat, ings, and breaking their bones. In the third year, some easing OC occurred, as the Israeli forces gave up on efforts to impose order on every square meter of the territories, focusing instead on central strategic areas. Outside economic opportunities for the Palestinian Arabs had al most entirely disappeared, the support for Saddam Hussein by both the PLO and the rank and file having made them unwelcome in many parts of the Middle East. The once prosperous community of nearly 400,000 Palestinians in Kuwait was shattered upon the Iraqi defeat and the return of the Kuwaiti government. In late 1991, less than half of the community remained. In Jordan, the economy had suffered a dramatic slide, affecting both Palestine, Ians there and those on the West Bank whose salaries were in Jordan, Nian Dinars, the value of the dinar in January, 1989 was less than half of what it had been only six months before. Once the Gulf crisis began in August, 1990, the decline intensified. In the occupied territories themselves, 
The dismal economic performance in the period leading up to the uprising turned drastically worse, communities were reporting unemployment rates of 30 to 40 percent. Conditions deteriorated further with the UN coalition's bombing of Iraq and the Iraqi Scud missile attacks on Israel start in January 1991. The standstill of the Israeli economy and the Palestinians' exclusion from it once the war ended were combined with the cutoff of Arab aid to the PLO, some of which had been funneled to the territories. With a drastic cut in their cash flow, retailers in the territories complained of a fall-off in business of almost 80%. Although accurate figures are hard to come by, some collected for Gaza indicate, at the very least, the magnitude of the problem. In the first three years of the Intifada, Palestinians in Gaza saw a 30% decline in their gross national product, a drop in per capita income from $1,700 to $1,200, with some families losing as much as three quarters of their income, a 75% decline in remittances from outside and a sharp drop in income from work in Israel. Once the Gulf War began, work in Israel stopped altogether and after the war did not even come close to the depressed pre-war level. Soviet immigrants, who themselves were desperate over the lack of economic opportunities, now stepped into the open jobs. In the month after the end of the war, 10,000 West Bank and Gazan Pales, Tinians worked in Israel, less than 10% of the pre-Intifada numbers. Large increases in child labor, requests for an air or sup, plementary feeding programs, up 200%, and sharp rises in the numbers requiring emergency food aid are a few indicators of the desperate economic straits in Gaza.85. Some early, sketchy figures for the West Bank indicate similarly. Dire conditions. For months after the start of the Intifada, West Bank gross domestic product had declined by 29%, individual consumption by 28%, and employment by 36%.86. The $200 million share of both Gazan and West Bank subcontractors in Israel's construction industry evaporated. Exports to Israel dropped by 50% in the first year of the uprising, and then continued to decline. Despite all these difficulties, the Intifada still stands as the pre-eminent event in the Palestinians' recent history, galvanizing a sense of community and nationhood, it has fostered what Laurie Brand has termed their re 87 but, like its predecessor, the Arab Revolt of 1936-39, it has exposed rifts corresponding to this greatly heightened sense of unified purpose. 88 Any communal uprus, in brings conflicts over what the new society will be into much starker relief, who will lead it? What the relationship of leaders to followers will be, which beliefs and symbols will prevail. This occurs despite efforts to paper over tensions and project an air of unity. With hindsight, we can see how the 1936 revolt allowed a surfic ing of important questions about the Palestinians' future. Conflicts between merchants and shabab, coastal city dwellers and inland vil. Lagers, Christians and Muslims, all revolved around that future. The closeness of the Intifada makes us somewhat myopic on this score, but we can still form an idea of the important questions regarding Palestinian leadership and the role of religion in the definition of their society. The fact that nearly half as many Palestinians in the occupied territories have been charged and killed as collaborators by other Palestinians as have died at the hands of the Israeli military hints at some very strong clashing currents beneath the unified oppo sigil front. The 1987 outbreak of sustained revolt by a mobilized population took the established national leadership by surprise just as had that of the Mufti and his colleagues at the General Strike's Rocking Pales, Tyne in April, 1936. Like Amin al-Husseini, Yasser Arafat was quick to associate himself with the new revolt, speaking on the second day of the Children of the Stones in Our Beloved, Holy Country as the con, temporary achievements of the fater, PLO Revolution a connection that proved very important for the PLO's effort to re-establish its international position after the Lebanese fiasco. Even with the association between the PLO and the Intifada, some strain between the organization's top echelons and the unified leadership seems to have emerged during the first half year or so. There is considerable disagreement about the level of overt conflict afterward. Some argue there was complete harmony between the outside and inside leadership, 
that the unified leadership sim, PLY, sees itself as the local political and activist arm of the PLO, 89 others see a continuation of the battle for local autonomy at work between them.90. But open conflict is less the issue than the more subtle tensions determining the place of the local leadership in the overall national movement. In the period leading up to the uprising, Gazan and West Bank leaders had been afforded short shrift by the PLO leader, Ship. The Intifada now enabled residents in the territories to influ, hence the PLO's political positions more strongly and directly, to play a major role in determining the national political agenda and to transform the accepted national tactics. In particular, the local lead, Ership pushed the PLO towards acceptance of Israel, a two-state so. Lution to the conflict, and participation in U.S. sponsored peace talks with Israel despite the formal exclusion of the PLO.91 In fact, according to a Helena Coben interview with Arafat, it pushed the PLO executive to abandon armed struggle within the context of the Intifada.92 communications from West Bank and Gaza leaders, notes Coben could no longer be downgraded by the PLO leaders as had sometimes been the case before December 1987, 93 Tittle, Borm and Kostina echo this point, not only had the Palestinian movement become a mass movement, but its political center of gravity had shifted, 94. The relatively smooth process by which the PLO incorporated the unified leadership into a more prominent national role was a trib, utable, in part, to a single individual. He was Arafat's aide Abuji, Had, the editor of Philas de Nuno, who also served as the PLO's overall coordinator in the occupied territories, and who worked endlessly to avoid open rifts with the young leaders there. It is simply too soon, at the time of this writing, to assess whether his assassination in April, 1988, in Tunis, almost certainly by the Israelis, may have led to a long-term erosion of that link. For Arafat's PLO, the ability to gain the public deference of the unified leadership and to have other Arabs identify the organizer, Shin with the dramatic and popular Intifada was critical. It en, hence the PLO's own position in face of others still trying to shape the future of the Palestinians, King Hussein of Jordan and Prezai, Dent Hafiz al-Assad of Syria, in particular. Abandoning his long struggle with the PLO for influence on the West Bank, the Jordan, Nian King formally disclaimed his sovereignty on 31 July 1988. This was something of a shock. Even after the 1976 municipal elections in the West Bank resulted in the rise of pro-PLO officials, the Jordan, Nians had continued to press their influence, 95 this step allowed the final triumph of an educated, internal leadership with few attachments to the Hashemites. It should be added that King Hussein did not shut the door altogether, West Bankers, for in, stance, still held, Jordanian citizenship and passports. At the same time, the dogged Syrian opposition to Arafat began to lessen, although no reconciliation took place until 1991. With such pressure behind it, the PLO recognized Israel's right to exist, renounced terrorism, initiated diplomatic contacts with the United States, and had the Palestine National Council declare the creation of a Palestinian state at its November, 1988, meeting in Algiers. UN, fortunately for the PLO, it could not sustain its new international position. After its refusal to condemn a terrorist attack, the US broke off the contacts, later, its ties to Saddam Hussein eroded much of the goodwill it had accumulated. But it still served notice that, by deftly incorporating the unified leadership, it had gained power in the struggle to control Palestinian society. The remaining question was whether Palestinians from the West Bank and Gaza Strip, the so-called inside leadership, could wrest meaningful influence and control from the Tunis-based, outside leadership. Once again Nablus, now termed, the City of Martyrs, in the Arab press for its sacrifices during the Intifada, faced off against a contending center, Tur of Power, but in this instance the contender lay far from the shores of Palestine. No struggle for the future of Palestinian society became more clear in the course of the Intifada than that over the future role of Islam. Even the most secular and national figures appropriated cultural symbols that had strong Islamic resonances. But the conflict went deeper than such appropriation. Just as in the 1936-39 revolt, 
the uncertainty associated with rebellion thrust the question of religion back into popular concerns. In the 1930s, the Mufti had used his religious office and the institution of the Supreme Muslim Council as a springboard for national leadership. Sheikh Qassam had M. ployed his position as a Hafer preacher to touch off the general strike and the peasant uprising. And the Arab revolt itself had revealed intense anti Christian sentiments by some of those agitating against the British and Jews. The last two decades of the 20th century have been a period in which Islam has played a much more overt role in Middle East politics, from Algeria to Iran. While to some of the educated, urban population of the 1930s it may have up, paired a living anachronism, by the time of the Intifada it had emerged as a self-assured and active alternative to European-style nationalism. In the Gaza Strip, especially, Islamic organizations challenged the entire worldview of the various elements comprising the PLO and the unified leadership. The major Islamic group, Hamers, or the Islamic Resistance Movement, which was the Palestinian branch of the Muslim Breath, Ren, and a smaller faction, Islamic Jihad, aimed to establish an Islamic state in Palestine and, perhaps later, throughout the Arab Middle East. They rejected the nationalists' aim of a secular, rely, justly pluralistic state. 96 Their target was not so much individual Christians or Druze, as in the 1930s, but the very foundation of the inclusive nationalist conception of who the Palestinians are. The sorts of bridges between nationalist and religious activism that had dominated the 1930s, including the view of the Mufti himself, were now much less in evidence. Hammers thus posed not just an ideology, cal challenge but, like the Communist Party and other indigenous groups, an internal social challenge to the movement based in two, Nis and Baghdad. As in the rest of the Middle East, the prime mover of the Islamic revival in the occupied territories was the Iranian Revolution of 1978. But even that event came in the midst of a dramatic rise in prayer attendance and the building of mosques, especially in the Gaza Strip. By the 1980s, there was clear evidence of Islamic entry into the Palestinian political realm. In 1979, student elections at Birzit University, the most important and the most secular of the Palestinian universities, had led to important victories for avowedly Islamic candidates. They came away with 43% of the vote, and in subsequent years regularly garnered 30-35% in universities throughout the West Bank. This success was the result of deter, mind, grassroots organizing, stressing the importance of individual and moral change. Standing behind hammers was the imposing figure of Sheikh Ahmed Ismail Yassin of Gaza. The military court had sentenced him to 13 years in prison in 1984, after Israeli authorities had dis- covered 60 rifles in his home, but he won early release as part of a larger prisoner exchange. His influence was evident in Islam's grow. In activism in the Gaza Strip, in his success at gaining control of the Islamic University and ridding it of pro-PLO forces. Once the uprising began, Sheikh Yassin moved to forestall a complete PLO app, appropriation of the Intifada. He broadened his base in the West Bank and, breaking with his long-time practice, began to allow his move, men's use of some nationalist symbols and language. The desire of both Yassin and Arafat to keep the fires of the Upris, in burning, and to direct Palestinian fury against the Israelis, not each other, helped minimize the number of open clashes between their followers. Both the Islamic and nationalist forces encouraged resistance to the Israelis, with the Muslims usually calling for more violent action and the unified leadership shunning arms and direct violence. But sniping between them still occurred. Differences had already been evident after the founding of the precursor to Hammers in the Gaza Strip in the mid-1980s. Yassin's group, deeply influenced by the Egyptian Muslim Brethren, undertook both verbal and PHYS, ICL assaults on the PLO and its allies, particularly on the pro-PLO Red Crescent Society. During the course of the Intifada, Hammers began to disregard DI, rectives set out in the unified leadership's leaflets, issuing its own instructions to the population. The two sets of leaflets called for diff, front strike days, offered different instructions, and used different language. Nearly a year into the Intifada, 
Pammers issued a convenant that implicitly challenged the near sacrosanct national covenant adopted by the PLO in 1968. It emphasized that the land of Pales, Tyne is an Islamic trust, or waqf, to be guarded by Muslims until Judgment Day. 97. Like their Jewish fundamentalist counterparts, Hammer's activists stressed the holiness of the land itself and the consequent impossibility of considering any trades of land for peace. It was this notion that made Hammer so critical of the PLO's diplomacy in 1988, and its sanctioning in 1991 of the peace talks starting in Madrid. Such conferences are nothing but a form of judgment passed by infidels on the land of the Muslims. 98. Given the twin tragedies of 1948 and 1967, both the PLO and the unified leadership saw this sort of rhetoric as threatening the re-construction of the nation, and they began to respond in kind. In one leaflet they demanded that fundamentalist elements cease playing on factional interests, displaying negative stands and manifs, tashins. 4. They are serving the enemy, whether they wish it or not, 99 Hammers insisted on continuing unity, dismissing the leaflet as an Israeli forgery. Whether it was one, the growing divergence was becoming a worrisome factor for the national forces, as was the deepening Islamic orientation of lower-level PLO members themselves. 100 The Israelis, who at first thought they might employ the Islamic groups as a tool to weaken the PLO and undermine the uprus, ing, had also begun to grasp the implications of their success. They moved against the Islamic leadership in 1989, eventually arresting Sheikh Yassin. The conflicts among Palestinians about the shape and character of their society are far from over. As indicated, in the context of the ongoing struggle with Israel, there were strong pressures to down play them.101 But when tactics and strategy are matters of life and death, it is difficult to keep differences under wraps. It is thus not surprising that the Intifada sparked both debate about and changes in the role of women in society. Women seemed pulled in two directions, especially in the West Bank. Many participated publicly in the rebellion, 102 some believing it would be the road to their own Libra, Shin.103 at the same time, within a year of its outbreak, all but a few determinedly leftist women had donned the hijab, headscarf, in the Gaza Strip, at least in part because of pressure from the militant Islamic organizations. Early in that campaign, the male leadership of the nationalist groups offered little support for those not wanting to do so. 104. Given previous experience of Palestinian Arab women activists in Lebanon, the disregard for women was not so surprising. While TAC, in a stand for more equality, in the end, the organization had, der, declined to be an arena for a radical restructuring of the gender or, der, its first priority was in building national unity not in dealing with the specifics of women's circumstances.105. In Leaflet 43, the unified leadership finally took a firm stand against harassment of women, and the split in this respect at least was now open. A few years before the Intifada, Rosemary Sayyad dressed a predicament that became acute in its course, with pales, Tinians increasingly polarized between progressive, nationalist, and reactionary, religious, currents, Women are likely to pay a heavy price for overvisibility. 106 novelist Sahar Khalifer would echo this theme. Because she wrote on the plight of women, her critics were astounded and shocked. They feel that I exaggerate, that I focus on peripheral matters and not on what is germinal. In their opinion, what is most important is to write about our conflict with Israel, with imperialism, with the Arab world. Her goal was to show how our society stifles women puts them in cages, blocks up their vast reserves of energy. But critics claimed that she was imitating American feminist views by ignoring the real solution for women which is to be found within the framework of the National Strug, GLE, 107. Social upheaval can catalyze and confirm changes incipient for years or decades. The Intifada validated the replacement of the old landed elite with a new leadership bred in the schools and university ties of the West Bank and Gaza. When the rioting broke out, Israeli civil administrators turned to the village Muktas and the old No Table leadership, 108 who, to the astonishment of the Israelis, and perhaps the old leaders themselves, could do little to stem the tide of resistance. 
It had become uncertain precisely where authority within Palestinian society lay. The question had been complicated over the years by the Israeli, Jordanian, and PLO discouragement of any visible, independent new leadership. Those personalities who did emerge in the occupied territories to offer political or social initiatives, including the elected mayors, faced arrest, deportation, detention, assassination. Nonetheless, university teachers, journalists, and other profession, ALS gained enough respectability and political support to be seen as inside representatives of the West Bank and Gaza. In the early 1990s, their claim was reinforced by the international discrediting of the outside PLO leadership for siding with Saddam Hussein by the insider's active role at the Palestine National Council meeting in Algiers in 1991, and, most importantly, by their role as the Palestine. Ian Delegation to the New Peace Talks Among the most prominent of these figures is Faisal al-Husseini, the son of the canonized Shahid, Abd al-Qadr al-Husseini, who led Palestinian fighting forces in the Arab Revolt and the 1948 war. He is also the grandson of Musar, the first leader of the national movement in the 1920s and early 1930s, and nephew of Jamal. Probably the most public figure has been Hanan Ashrori, a Christian Palestinian and professor of English literature at Birzit University, who has articulated the pal Estonian case in an international arena better than ever before. An other Birzit professor, Sari Nusaber, also comes from a prominent Palestinian family, his father was Jordan's Minister of Defense and Director of the most prestigious National Palestinian Economic Institution, the Eastern Jerusalem Electric Company. The ultimate influence of these and other insiders 109 or of Yun, jur less visible members of the unified leadership, is still unclear, what is quite apparent is that social changes would no longer be dictated by a Palestinian leadership from on high, and certainly not by a leadership based in Amman or Damascus. Nor should the conflicts among Palestinian groups be understood as simple leadership struggles, although they certainly constitute an important element of the larger conflicts. The symbols and practices evolving among the entire population of the West Bank and Gaza Strip from 1948 to 1967, and then again after the onset of Israeli rule, created the possibility of Palestinian action. Whether they now offer the hope for an end to occupation, for national independence, and for reconciliation with Jews and Israel, is too soon to tell. Part 4. Abortive Reconciliation. 10. The Oslo Process, What Went Right? They closed up the campaign and won their victory. Crossed over us from end to end forgave. The victim for his errors when he apologized for things that will come across his mind, they switched the bell of time. And won victory. Mahmoud Diawish, from A Non-Linguistic Quarrel, with Umar al -Kays. In the half-century since World War II, three series of events, all involving the Israelis, have stood above all else in the making of the Palestinian people. They are the catastrophe of 1948, with its loss of possible autonomy and the creation of the refugees, Israeli occupation of the West Bank and Gaza Strip since 1967, and the Oslo peace process, with the soaring hopes it generated for undoing that occupation and winning autonomy, at long last, and, then, the deep despair it engendered less than a decade after it began. The F effects of the last of these, the Oslo process, on the Palestinian nation are just now becoming evident. From the beginning of 1993, when a handful of Israeli and Palestinian negotiators assembled in Norway, to early 2001, when the two headstrong leaders of Israel and the PAL, Estonians, Ayud Barak and Yasser Arafat, aborted their last ditch F, forts to reach a final status agreement, Palestinian society under, went momentous changes. Oslo began with bright optimism on both sides for conciliation, 65, 75% of West Bank forward slash Gaza Palestinians and Israeli Jews expressed support for the initial accord, and ended in dejection, recriminations, and violence. The hopelessness that followed the breakdown of the talks at Camp David in July 2000, where Amory, can President Bill Clinton had assembled Barak and Arafat and their high-powered teams, and of several subsequent sets of talks in the months after Camp David stemmed from the inability to secure their signatures on the dotted line of a final status agreement. 
Still, despite the failure to rise over that final hurdle, the unfolding Oslo process had some remarkable achievements. Above all else, it had initiated the first ever Palestinian self governance, which, even if somewhat limited, reshaped society and politics in new and unexpected ways. Some of these were quite encouraging, and others, very discouraging to those hoping for a vibrant, open society and for coexistence between Palestinians and Israelis in the country. This chapter and the next investigate what went right and what went wrong in the Oslo process within a broad social, political, and cultural context. To answer the first of those questions, this chapter begins by analyzing the factors that induced Israelis and Palestinians to abandon their almost exclusive means of dealing with one another since the 1920s armed conflict in favor of negotiations aimed at ending the standoff. It then elaborates precisely what did go right as the two sides signed their historic agreement and then followed that with seven more years of negotiations. Chapter 11 will then analyze the failure of the process, which brought the two nations full circle to all out violence, just as Barak and Arafat engaged in endgame negotiations. Together, this chapter and the next explore the critical changes that occurred in Palestinian society throughout the period of the peace process and into the years of six, Olens, the Alexer Intifada. The Path to Oslo A number of prior factors helped ready the sides for official face-to-face -face contacts. Several dated all the way back to the immediate after, math of the 1967 war, and others appeared in the 1970s and 1980s, almost two decades before Palestinians and Israelis actually negotiated officially. Changes were brewing back then among both the Pal, Estonians and Israelis. On the Palestinian side, already in 1968, Salah Khalif, Abu Iyad, the man considered the head ideologue of the progressive stream of Fater, suggested far-reaching changes in Pal, Estonian goals that implied the need for a dialogue with the Israelis. Instead of simply calling for the creation of a Palestinian state in all of Palestine, he devised the formulation of a democratic and secular state. His idea was rejected by the Fater mainstream and the PLO at the time because of its implied equality for Jews and because of sensitivity to its secular dimension, which could provoke confrontation with conservative Islamic elements. By the 1970s, another position taking note of the existence of is. Rail and the formidable Jewish settlement in the land was expressed by Is Aldin Clack, the PLO's representative in Paris, Sedka, Mami, one and, most prominently, Dr. Issam Satori, one of Fater's most visible intellectuals and diplomats. The plan became public in 1977, when Satori proposed coexistence with Israel on the basis of a peace agreement between a Palestinian state in the occupied territories according to the, the 4th of June 1967 ceasefire lines, known in Israel as the Green Line. The implicit acceptance of Israel's existence in the plan led to the assassination of all three of these Palestinian leaders by emissaries of radical PLO groups. Posthumous vindication came for them a decade later, on 15 November 1988, when Arafat declared a Palestinian state in precisely this territory, 22% of the area that the British had controlled, at the 19th session of the Pales, Tiny National Council in Algiers. This declaration put aside Pales, Tinyan's claims to all of Palestine and, implicitly at least, recognized Israel. Some of the new thinking about the conflict within the PLO. Leadership in the 1970s was echoed at the grassroots level in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. The renewed encounter between Israeli society, both Jews and Arabs, and the Palestinians in the occupied territories after 1967 began to break down many of the stereotypes held of the Jewish state and its society. They appeared to some pales, Tinians as more varied and multifaceted, as well as less Western and imperialist, than what they had imagined from afar from 1948-1967. Some residents of the territories began to see Israel as more than an artificial and temporary creation, a state, perhaps, with which, UN, there are certain conditions, one could come to an accommodation. The illusory and self-defeating image of Israel as an artificial political and social entity on the brink of collapse became much less pop, Euler, although some held onto that canard into the 21st century. Two. 
new approaches to the conflict were aired inside Israel, too, in the 1970s. And then after 1982, the debacle in its war in Lebanon UN covered a deep war weariness and spawned the development of large social movements pushing for a change in the state's basic strategic vision. Beyond Lebanon, such a change pointed to the possibility of reconciliation with the Palestinians. These early glimmers of change in each camp were complemented by some tentative contacts between the two sides. A handful of courageous ordinary citizens and politicians, such as Ari, Lover, Eliaf and Satori, engaged in non-sanctioned negotiations in the 1970s, paving the way for the unthinkable to become thinkable. In addition to these Palestinian-Israeli direct contacts, the peace treaty between Egypt and Israel in 1980 set important parameters for later Palestinian-Israeli engagement. For the Arab world, the treaty brought an end to the general consensus that had held since World War I, the impermanence and immorality of a non-Arab political entity in its midst. In this earlier consensus, the Zionist entity was equated with the Crusader state of 1099-1187, which, by force, had planted an alien presence in Dar al-Islam, the world of Islam. But, in 1187, the glorious Salah al-Din, commonly known as Saladin, al-Ayubi overcame the foreigners in the Battle of Kitan, liberating J.E. Ruzalem, and later his successors chased the intruders from the land. Entirely in the Battle of Ain Jalut in 1260. The Arab consensus saw the Crusader experience as a harbinger of the fate of the temporarily high flying Zionist settlement and Israeli state. By no means did a new consensus emerge in the Arab world after Egypt and Israel signed their treaty. Palestinians, in particular, saw the peace as a treacherous stab in the back. Still, the peace accords hammered out in 1978 at what is now known as Camp David ICRE added three key precedents. First, the successful negotiations estab, lished the very possibility of conciliation and political agreement between Arabs and Jews, and, specifically, between Arab states and the Jewish one. Ironically, the Egyptian-Israeli agreement confirmed the position against Panarabaism that Fater itself had championed after Palestinian disappointment with Nasser's Panarabaism in the 1967 war. Even though Egyptian leaders presented the treaty as ben, efforting the Arab world generally, it was widely understood in the Arab world as Egypt's pursuing its own national interests, those of its particular Fta'en, or homeland, over those of the larger Arab nation. Second, the agreement established the practice of exchanging ter. Rightries for peace as the key to success. More than that, it implicitly promoted the idea of all territories conquered in 1967 in exchange for total peace as the mode for any future agreements. Both sides found it extremely difficult to accept the territories for peace for emulation. For Israel, diffuse aspirations for peace were intricately woven into its culture. As David Ben-Gurion had put it, Israel al-Ways had an arm outstretched towards peace. It was the Arabs, Jew-ish Israelis felt, who were the impediments to achieving peace. As Yar Shafat Harkabi, Israel's military and later academic guru on the Arabs, put it in the 1960s, Israel had only unidirectional control over the conflict, it could escalate but not move toward resolution. Now, Israeli society and its leaders had to face all the difficulties of turn, in a utopian ideal into concrete reality. Three, they needed to give up actual territory and settlements for an abstract concept, peace. Add, additionally, they had to face the existential anxiety of Zionism's reversibility after decades of following the principle of incremental accumulation, another Dunham and another goat, dot for for the Egypt. Tians, the practice not only shattered the Arab consensus but also transgressed the concrete resolution of the Arab League adopted in Khartoum in 1968, barring member states from recognition of Israel and negotiations and peace with it, the famous three no's. The third precedent involved the Palestinians themselves. In a letter accompanying the agreements, dated 26 March 1979, Israel and Egypt agreed to open discussions immediately on founding an elected administrative council in the West Bank and Gaza Strip for Palestinians there. The new self-governing authority would be the basis for granting full autonomy to their residents and would exist for a transition period of five years. 
In that time, the final status of the occupied territories and its residents would be settled. Israel even consented to the notion of withdrawing its forces from the Tur, Ritries and redeploying them within secure areas agreed on by all sides. While nothing came of this codicil, it became, along with the 1974 and 1988 decisions of the Palestinian National Council, a kind of legal basis for the Declaration of Principles, DOP, signed on the White House lawn on 13 September 1993, and for the founding of the Palestine Authority, the centerpieces of the Oslo Process.5. Following the Egyptian-Israeli Peace Treaty, other factors in the early 1980s nudged the two sides toward a reconsideration of their basic policies. For the PLO, the destruction of its enclaves in Leber, Non continued a process physically separating the organization from the people it purported to represent. Once the PLO was re established in far off Tunis, both its leaders and followers found the notions of armed struggle and building a state in the making increasingly hollow. Beyond that, Israel's creation of facts on the ground lent a sense of urgency to Palestinian leaders that time was running out for them to reverse the occupation of the territories that Israel conquered in 1967. The numbers of Jewish settlers kept growing throughout the 1970s and 1980s in an expanded Jerusalem and in the rest of the West Bank and in the Gaza Strip. Six, the number of settlements grew to well over 100 settlers, to over 100,000. Also, the Israeli government requisitioned more than half of UNTI, told lands in the West Bank. Seven, these events, according to Meron Ben Venisti, led some Palestinians to fear the gradual gathering of forces for a second Nakba. Eight. As much as events and processes from 1967 to the early 1980s pre paired the ground for shifts in strategy on both sides, the key Qatar, LYSDS bringing about the Oslo Agreement emerged in the latter part of the 1980s, after Mikhail Gorbachev had begun instituting his fateful reforms in the Soviet Union. For factors stand out. One Soviet reform and then collapse and the end of the Cold War raised fears among Israeli and Palestinian leaders that led to reconsiderations of BA-6 strategy. Certainly, Palestinian and Israeli leaders were not the only ones who thought that the implosion of the Soviet Union made violent strategies used in a variety of existing civil conflicts untenable now. Suddenly, old strategies seemed shopworn. It is not happenstance that the early 1990s saw serious new bids for Negoti, etted peace in many festering disputes in such scattered places as Northern Ireland, South Africa, Angola, El Salvador, Guatemala, Cambodia, and Korea. In each of these cases, different sorts of doubts arose among the combatants about the ability to sustain the struggle and achieve ultimate success. In Central America, to take one example, the demise of Soviet brand socialism sparked a re-thinking of ideology within the revolutionary left. The socialist paradigm, the guiding light of revolutionary movements in the developing world, was suddenly perceived to have lost its legitimacy. Nine reconsideration of strategy by Israelis and Palestinians did not come from this sort of delegitimation of their ideologies. Their worry was that the emerging new structure of international realer, would leave them without the crucial outside support from which they had benefited during the Cold War. But change is never easy. For leaders on both sides, what they saw to be the imperatives of the new world power structure often ran head-on into the demands of their domestic constituencies, not to speak of their calm, fort with old habits. Change did not come automatically, by any means, but it did come. For the PLO, the quick and unimaginable descent of the USSR precipitated an immediate and obvious crisis. In a world that had been defined by the standoff of the two superpowers, the Palestinians had relied heavily on Soviet underpinning. Support ranged from backing in world forums, such as the United Nations, to AC. Dual military training and aid. For all Soviet clients in the Cold War, its collapse unleashed unbridled panic and internal soul-searching about how to proceed without a patron in a dangerous and uncertain world. The PLO was no exception. The end of the Cold War and the Soviet slide and disintegration forced a basic reconsideration of how to proceed with its nationalist struggle in the absence of its protector. The reaction in Israel to the petering out of the Cold War was more complex. 
Its leaders at first felt a giddy sense of triumph, after all, its superpower had won. What could be more reassuring? But that sense of satisfaction evaporated all too quickly. Israeli policy makers began to examine the basis of their gains in the Cold War. During the years of superpower confrontation, Israeli officials had argued to U.S. leaders, quite convincingly in fact, that Israel was America's best bargain. Israel, they pointed out, provided a potent bulwark against possible Soviet expansion in the Middle East at far less than the cost that the United States incurred in other hotspots. In fact, U.S. outlays for Israel were less than 2% of those associated with conventional deterrence of the Soviet Union in Central Europe and Northeast Asia, which ran together annually to nearly a quarter of a trillion dollars. At no time was Israel's deterrent role clearer than during Black September, 1970, when its threatening statements and military deployment resulted in the tanks of pro-Soviet Syria turning tail and abandoning the pro-Soviet PLO in its losing battle against pro-U.S. Jordan. With no Soviet client states, such as Syria, to deter in the aftermath of the Cold War, Israeli officials wondered, what motivation was there for the sole remaining superpower to support them so enthusiastically? Did US support hinge on its Cold War needs? Actually, that question has not disappeared to this day and has led in Israel to unceasing efforts to uncover new ways to nurture the American-Israel friendship, find new rationales for it as in their joint commitment against rogue states or to the war on terrorism, and forge new alliances in U.S. society, as with the Christian right, which, for example, developed a political theology speaking of two complementary chosen peoples, the people of Israel and the Chris, Tian people of the United States. In short, for both the PLO and Israel, the disappearance of the Soviet Union and, with it, the existing structure of an American, dominated world order created new uncertainties over whether their old strategies would find the same kind of international support as in the past. Both were forced into intense domestic debates as to what strategic changes the new world structure called for, if they were to achieve their primary goals, or if those goals needed to be modified. If negotiations seemed to be the new international strat, e.g. of choice in the 1990s, both the PLO and Israel faced difficult impediments to actually sitting down with each other. Not least of these were muscular domestic groups opposed to conciliation, as well as religions changing role on each side. For instance, the 1980s and the Intifada had spawned powerful new Islamic groups rejecting even a hint of territorial compromise, which would have to be the basis for any possible negotiations. Sim Ilali, in Israel, the expanded power of the national religious bloc, with its new messianic orientation, and the emergence of a new, strange amalgam, the Herdele Yumi, nationalist ultra-orthodox, among other groups, made the path to the peace table anything but smooth. The new single superpower world afforded Palestinians and Israelis plenty of motivation to think about sitting down with each other for the first time. But it did not create any clear path on how to do that, nor did it make those resisting negotiations simply disappear. 2. The reconfiguration of the global economy led to anxieties on both sides as to where they would fit in the new world economic order. Changes in the structure of international relations also further opened the door for a transformation in the world economy. The political tree, umph of the United States meant, too, the victory of a special brand of economic neoliberalism, what came to be called the Washington Consensus, especially as a recipe for others to adopt. New neo-liberal norms in the world economy demanded that officials in states with troubled economies remove their administrations from active participation in global markets, at the same time, these new standards held these leaders ever more accountable for the performance of those economies. The heads of Israel and the PLO were no exception in facing increasing pressure based on larger economic changes way beyond their control although not always in precisely the same way as other state leaders. The difficulties for Palestinians and Israelis centered on the relationship of their society's economic fortunes to their military and political postures. Three key factors, all related, signaled a change in the structure of the world economy in the late 1980s, albeit in uncertain directions. First was the havoc of booms and busts in the oil market. 
Wild price fluctuations had begun in the wake of the oil boycott in the 1973 war. That first spike in oil prices had spawned uncountable petrodollars, ending up in the hands of leaders of oil exporting states. Most of these petrodollars wended their way to large West, earned banks, where they were turned around into loans to states in Latin America, Asia, the Middle East, and Africa. These loans went to both oil importers, which faced steep new energy costs, and oil exporters themselves, which looked to create economic sustainability beyond the life of their oil reserves. That lending quickly enough caused crushing debt for most of the borrowers. The debt burden for the importers became a problem almost immediately. For oil exporters, the problems became obvious once oil prices plummeted at the beginning of the 1980s and made it impossible to make the debt payments, which had been calculated on incomes premised on continuing high oil prices and income. The vaunted debt crisis that marked the last two decades of the 20th century began with oil exporting Mexico and gripped the world econ only in the mid to late 1980s, just as the Soviet Union was disintegrating, in fact, its disintegration was spurred by the collapse in government revenues as its oil export earnings shriveled. Israel was among those debtor oil importing countries, facing in terrorist payments alone that ate up half or more of the government's total budget. And the PLO found itself financially dependent on oil, exporting countries experiencing the ups and downs of oil prices, not a situation that bred financial security or consistency for Arafat and his organization. Promised payments to the PLO from oil pro juicers, especially among the Gulf states, came in late or never are arrived at all. Ordinary Palestinians, meanwhile, filled key positions in booming Middle East oil economies but were highly vulnerable when prices dropped in the 1980s. Second, the new chic word of the late 1980s, globalization, Signal, nay led a process of world economic restructuring that threatened to widen the gap between haves and have-nots even more, determined by access to the new information technology and direct foreign investment associated with it. For both Israelis and Palestinians, it was still an open question in the 1980s whether they would end up in the haves or have-nots category. Israel faced a difficult period, coming out of years of hyperinflation and declining manufacturing and agricultural sectors. Increasing rates of productivity had lagged far behind growing consumption, a recipe for economic disaster. The government had seemed incapable of instilling discipline on the economy, until a unity government reigned in public spending in the mid-1980s under the leadership of Shimon Peres. Now, as Israel entered the last decade of the 20th century, economists pinned their hopes on a transition to the new information age, spurred by foreign investment. But this was an iffy process and depended heavily on being able to instill confidence in the West that Israel was a prime, peaceful, site for foreign investment. Palestinian leaders also understood that any political autonomy that they might eventually achieve would succeed only with a river of foreign investment, especially direct foreign investment, with all its know-how. But it was not at all clear from where such capital would come, especially now that the Soviet Union was out of the picture. The PLO's image was associated in much of the West with terror and violence, not the kind of characteristics that instilled confidence in investors. If a Palestinian state did emerge, it would have to compete for scarce funds with other former Soviet clients and the 15 countries that came out of the former Soviet Union, not to speak of other needy countries in the Third World. Third, the world at the end of the 1980s seemed to be dividing into three economic blocks marked by a dominant currency for each, the dollar, Deutsche Mark, and yen. Like other non-European state leaders in the Mediterranean region, Israeli and Palestinian officials wondered whether they would be excluded from these emerging clubs, especially the one based on the Deutsche Mark. Competition among Mediterranean countries, both those inside the European community, EC, and those in the Middle East and North Africa, was intense. Often hawking the same agricultural products, they jockeyed for preferential agreements with the EC. For Israelis and Palestinians, both already peripheral to the economic integration based on the Deutsche Mark, their image as players involved in unending conflict hurt their possibilities of hooking into that block. 
Israeli policymakers and, to a lesser degree, Palestinian officials, dreaded that all three of these new economic circumstances might permanently leave their people on the outside of a newly restruck, chewed world economy. Israelis worried, for example, that the M pending economic integration of Europe, dubbed Europe 1992, could spell economic isolation for a country, such as Israel, on the periphery of the continent. European impatience with Israel's poly, says toward the Palestinians and the continued occupation of the West Bank and Gaza, Israelis fretted, could create new hurdles for deepening ties with the EC. Palestinians agonized that their devers, Tate economy might never be able to compete for direct foreign investment or integrate into the new globalized economy. And fluck, chewating oil prices only increased the burden that any future pales, Tinyan government would have to take on. Thinkers on both sides suggested that the never-ending conflict between them scared off potential investors and threatened the stability needed to gain AC access to restructured markets. Coming out of the early and mid-1980s when the economy of Israel and the occupied territories was in considerable turmoil, both sides worried about the effect of their constant state of war on their chances of becoming part of the new economy. Ten both feared being tossed onto the economic dustbin of history. 3. The Intifada threatened leaders on both sides. In the last chapter, we analyzed the complex effects of the Palestinian uprising that began in late 1987. Here it is worth emphasizing that, for both sides, the Intifada combined with the other factors listed here, raising serious questions about their existing strategies. For Israeli leaders, the concerns extended from issues such as the morale of their own citizenry to ones focusing on the uprisings added detrimental effects on the flow of international capital and preferred access to European mar -kets. Israelis saw the danger signs of an internationally deteriorating image for the state, as television pictures of soldiers confronting Palestinian children played across Europe. They wondered if that might raise the possibility of diminished US support or result in Israel's being ostracized, as had happened with South Africa and apartheid, now that the Cold War had ended. Not least of all, the in Tafarda called into question whether the centerpiece of Israeli strat, e.g., the deterrent effect of the Israel Defense Forces, could remain strong in a struggle defined largely by the policing of an unarmed insurgency rather than conflict between conventional armies. PLO officials in distant Tunis were already alarmed about the development of a new, independent Palestinian leadership in the process of creating and sustaining the Intifada. That leadership pre-scented challenges of place, the Intifada's leaders were inside pales, time, not abroad, generation, the new leaders were often 20 to 30 years younger than PLO officials, an orientation, many of the uprising's leaders were religious rather than secular and almost none was taken with the old-style socialism of some of the older generation. Added to the PLO's concern over an alternative leadership was the clear international repositioning of its key state backers in the Arab world in response to the demise of the Soviet Union and to economic globalization. A common refrain among elites in Arab states, especially on the far edges of the Arab world, Migdal and Tur, viewed in Yemen and Morocco, among other Arab countries in the early 1990s, was that the Palestinian-Israeli conflict was a continue, in impediment to their own integration into the emerging new world order. Referring to a period a decade later, Edward said, the noted Palestinian-American intellectual and cultural critic, spoke of the sheer exasperation of most of the Arab regimes with the whole Palestinian problem. The situation was quite similar in the early 1990s, when Arab leaders also wished that Arafat and his people would simply either behave or quietly go away, 11 PLO leaders could not help but worry that the rise of new, young Palestinian leaders in the Intifada, both secular and religious, could prove to be tempting alternatives to the PLO for Arab state leaders eager to wash their hands of the Palestinian issue. They fretted, too, about the long-term commitment of Arab leaders and the larger Arab public to the Palestinian cause. 4. The Gulf War Turned Nightmares Into Reality Nothing confirmed all the anxieties of Israeli and PLO leaders about the changing state of the world as much as the Gulf War. Iraq's conquest of Kuwait on 2 August 1990 set in motion a series of events that confirmed for key Israeli and PLO politicians and thinkers the need to search for new strategic policies, 
especially in respect to one another. The Gulf War galvanized the two sides to undertake a new approach to their own conflict. In Israel, once again, the initial reaction was that Saddam Hussein's gambit and President George Bush's strong reaction to it would play into Israel's hands. After all, in any impending war it could offer the United States the best army, hospitals, base facilities, and servicing of the U.S. war machine found anywhere in the mid-DLE East. Some Israeli leaders felt, in the first flush of excitement and horror after Saddam's annexation of Kuwait, that a functional re-placement for the Cold War had finally appeared, cementing the importance of Israel to the United States. But that optimism quickly faded, as U.S. officials made it crystal clear to the Israelis that they were a liability to the war effort against Iraq on several counts. First, even a whiff of Israeli participation in the multilateral coalition the United States was cobbling together to oppose Iraq would lead to Arab and other Muslim states' defection. Any role at all for Israel threatened the success of U.S. policy, makers in delicately incorporating countries such as Syria into the coalition. Second, Saddam Hussein worked hard to win broad Arab and Muslim support against the United States by linking the coup, weighty incursion to the Palestinian issue, at least rhetorically. Today Kuwait, tomorrow Jerusalem. For its part, the Bush administration quickly distanced itself from Israel, and from Israel's position on the Palestinian issue, precisely in order to thwart the development of such an Arab-Muslim coalition. American pressure, in the end, induced the Israeli government to sit on its hands as Iraq rained missiles on Israeli cities during the war. Many Israeli leaders felt that the Gulf War's damage to the effectiveness of the state's vaunted deterrence and retaliation policies, as well as to domestic morale, was far greater than any destruction of Israeli property caused by Saddam's missiles. Bush's new world order seemed to exclude Israel, even threaten it, rather than offer it glittering new opportunities. Iraq's invasion turned out to be even more disastrous for the PLO and Palestinians generally. Saddam Hussein's statements about J.E., Ruzalem and the Palestinian issue, not surprisingly, made a deep, positive impression on the Palestinian rank and file, inside and outside historic Palestine. But any open identification of Palestinian leaders with Iraq held great peril. The PLO's major state supporters in the Arab world joined the U.S. led alliance against Iraq. Caught between the sentiment in the street and the admonitions of his backers, Arafat tried to steer a middle course, but to no avail. Lead, heirs of the United States and the oil-rich Arab countries that bank, rolled the PLO interpreted his stance as pro-Iraqi, leading to the cutoff of funds. In effect, the organization was bankrupt, forcing it to close many of its missions around the globe. Much of the anger of key Arab officials at the Palestinians and the PLO came to a head after Iraq's defeat. Kuwaitis identified the 300 comma 000, 400 comma 000 pales, Tinians in Kuwait as allies of Iraq, as traitors, and drove the overwhelming majority of Palestinians living there out of the country. By the time the dust settled in the Gulf War, neither Israelis nor Palestinians had felt so isolated internationally for at least a generation. That war had struck Palestinian and Israeli leaders like a bolt of lightning. All the nettlesome doubts that had insinuated themselves into thinking about their basic goals and strategies, especially concerning each other, had suddenly snowballed during the Gulf War into full-blown crises. Drained by the interfader that had dragged on for years, Israeli and Palestinian leaders now had to come to terms with a new and frightening international isolation, as well. It was in that environment that the Bush administration sold the idea for a multilateral conference in Madrid designed as a bridge from violence to substantive negotiations, first through an international conference and then breaking down into bilateral negotiating science. Oslo Accord By the end of 1991, the Soviet Union had disappeared, the United States was edging into unprecedented world military and economic policy dominance, the U.S.-led coalition had pulverized the Iraqis, and Microsoft had begun to drive the world economy. In the midst of these radical changes on the world scene, Palestinians and Israelis started meeting about their futures. 
What began fitfully in Madrid in December 1991 suddenly generated a fevered pitch of excitement in August 1993. Israel and the PLO made the startling announcement that their representatives had secretly completed a framework for future negotiations that could end their conflict. It was a breathtaking moment, one of heightened anticipation, even extraordinary optimism. While no one had predicted an Oslo-type accord, a number of important domestic happenings for Palestinians and Israelis alike indicated that the pot was simmering with new ideas and approaches to the conflict. These included the PLO's 1988 decision to declare a state in Gaza and the West Bank, thereby accepting a two-state solution, the endorsement in Israel, by select policymakers from both the left and right, of the idea of unilaterally withdrawing from the densely populated Gaza Strip, the election of a labor government in Israel in 1992 replacing the hardline government of Yitzhak Shamir, and the frustration on both sides with the ongoing negotiations in Washington under the framework of the international conference initiated in Madrid. Informal talks in Oslo began early in 1993 between several Israeli academics and mid-level PLO officials, including Ahmed Khoury, Abu Ela, and Mahmoud Abbas, Abu Mazen, under the auspices of the Norwegian government and its foreign minister, Johan Georgian Holst.12 as the negotiators gained confidence in one another at their secluded hideaway, a number of key points became the foundation for a full-blown agreement, including the willingness of the Pales, Tinians to accept an interim settlement without determining, at the moment, the final arrangements for a permanent settlement, PLO readiness to govern the Gaza Strip, as long as at least a symbolic part of the West Bank also came under its control, and Israel's con, currents to the establishment of a Palestinian National Authority, PNA, or often simply referred to as the Palestine Authority, PAR, as the governing structure. In August 1993, the PLO and the Israeli government announced that they had come to an agreement. Officially, the Declaration of Principles, DOP, was signed in Washington on 13 September. The preamble of the declaration set out core principles, affirming Pales, Tinians and Israelis. Determination to put an end to decades of confrontation and to live in peaceful coexistence, mutual dignity and security, while recognized in their mutual legitimate and political rights. Reaffirming their desire to achieve a just, lasting and comprehensive peace settlement and historic reconciliation through the agreed political process. Recognizing that the peace process and the new era that it has created, as well as the new relationship established between the two parties as described above, are irreversible, and the determination of the two parties to maintain, sustain and continue the peace process. Recognizing that the aim of the Israeli-Palestinian negotiations within the current Middle East peace process is, among other things, to establish a Palestinian interim self-government authority, i.e. the elected council, and the elected Rais, chairman, of the executive authority, for the Palestinian people in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, for a transitional period not exceeding five years from the date of signing the agreement on the Gaza Strip and the Jericho area, leading to a permanent settlement based on Security Council Resolutions 242 and 338.13. Reaffirming their understanding that the interim self government arrangements contained in this agreement are an integral part of the whole peace process, that the negotiations on the permanent status that will start as soon as possible but not later than the 4th of May 1996 will lead to the implementation of Security Council Resolutions 242 and 338 and that the interim agreement shall settle all the issues of the interim period and that no such issues will be deferred to the agenda of the permanent status negotiations.14. The first stage outlined in the DOP obligated Israel to turn over most of the territories of the Gaza Strip, with the exception of the Jewish settlements in the Katif Bloc and the Jericho area, according to the Cairo Agreement of 4 May 1994, to the PLO. The accord stated that authority will be transferred to the Palestinians in the following spheres, education and culture, health, social welfare, DI, rect taxation, and tourism. The Palestinian side will commence in building the Palestinian police force. In the following stage, the interim agreement, sometimes re-referred to as Oslo II, effected mostly in late 1995, 
the PLO gained sole control over all Palestinian cities and the highly populated Rifu, G camps in the West Bank and Gaza Strip, with the exception of settled Jewish areas in the city of Hebron. The total territory trans, referred to sole Palestinian control, area, in these two stages was about 3-4% of the West Bank and Gaza Strip. Also agreed upon was an intermediate division of the rest of the territory of the West Bank and Gaza Strip into two areas of governance, an area of about 70% of the territory consisting of sole Israeli control, the Jordan Valley, all the Jewish settlements in the West Bank, and their venues of access, Area C, and an area of about 27% of the land in which there was joint control, most of the rural areas of the West Bank including about 440 villages and their surrounding lands, area. B. In Area B, the Palestinian Authority was to have con, troll over civil administrative issues and Israel, over military and SE, security issues, joint on patrols were also arranged for Area B. All in all, these initial stages constituted what the preamble re. referred to as the interim self-government arrangements. Working under the assumption that taking small steps builds trust, the in terim arrangements were intended to incrementally transfer the EN, Taya Palestinian population of the West Bank and Gaza Strip, with the exception of East Jerusalem and the surrounding metropolitan area, to Palestinian governance. The Jewish settlements in the Terry, Tories, including access roads, and their populations would remain intact under Israeli control for the time being. 15 This agreement was supposed to last five years during which time a final agreement would be reached determining the status of the Palestine Authority, the fate of the Jewish settlements, the disposition of East Jerusalem, the possible return or repatriation of the refugees, including how many, from where, and to where, the division of water. In the joint aquifer, and so on. 16 The Israelis also were to ensure free and secure land movement between the two parts of the Pargovan territory, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, release political prisoners, and grant aid, together with the United States and the European states, for developing an economic and social infrastructure in the areas ruled by the Palestine Authority, including an international airport and a deep water port in Gaza. In exchange, the Palestinians would give recognition to Israel, end guerrilla warfare, and commit to pre-venting acts of terror against Israel, Israelis, and even residents of the Jewish settlements in the occupied territories. An astounding proportion of these plans and promises were AC. Chile put into effect between 1993 and the end of 1995. Israeli forces did redeploy, the Palestine Authority assumed control of increasing portions of the Palestinian population, the parties crafted the in-terim agreement, almost on time, and the PAR took control of West Bank cities. Israel's first redeployment out of most of the Gaza Strip and Jericho ended in May 1994, paving the way for assumption of control in those areas by the Palestine Authority. On July 1 of that year, Arafat moved from Tunis to Gaza, with great fanfare and seer money. With the signing of the interim agreement on 28 September 1995, about a third of a year beyond the self-imposed deadline, the way was open to the Palestine authorities governing more than 90% of the West Bank and Gazan Palestinian population, but less than 5% of these territories. About two-thirds in area were completely under the Palestine authorities' jurisdiction, and the other one-third were in Area B, where Israel maintained control over security. Once Israel's redeployment for 1995 began, a series of Qatar, strafic events slowed the peace process considerably. An Israeli assassin killed Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, Islamic groups under, took a series of bombings in Israeli cities in early 1996, and bin Yarman Netanyahu, who had opposed Oslo from the outset, defeated Rabin's successor, Perez, in elections for Prime Minister. Still, even in this period of slowing momentum, the process continued to mark up some important accomplishments. On 20 January 1996, Palestinians participated in their first elections for their own gov, Ermont, electing the Palestinian Legislative Council. That election set the stage for Israel's dissolution of its civil administration and military government. And, in January 1997, Israel redeployed within Hebron, after an agreement had been secured between Arafat and the new Israeli Prime Minister, Netanyahu, 
which put virtually all the Palestinian population in the territories under the control of the Palestine Authority. What went right? Despite these successes, the Oslo process noticeably slowed after Rabin's assassination and, particularly, after Netanyahu's election. Indeed, with the hindsight of a decade after the signing of the December, Laration of Principles, the peace process and all its accomplishments in those early years of 1993-1995 looked like a brief, unsuccessful in Telud in the near century of Palestinian-Israeli violence. The rosy excitement of the summer of 1993, which reached new heights by late 1995, flagged as final status negotiations stalled, and, by the end of the decade, hope had turned into full-fledged cynicism among Palestinians and Israelis alike. By 2001, when all-out violence re-summed, the obvious question became, what went wrong? Before addressing that question, however, it is worth asking a prior question, what went right, at least initially? It is very imper tan to ask this question, if for no other reason than if all Israelis and Palestinians gained for their efforts was a new intifada, efforts at future peace seem pointless. All the two sides can do in that case. To paraphrase Israeli commentator Jashom Gorenberg, is oil their guns and dig their graves. 17. We need to ask what sorts of building blocks, if any, did the first, ever official negotiations between the PLO and Israel leave for the two sides, even when relations later turned terribly sour. Addition, Ali, for both, the new relationships, decisions, and institutions coming out of their contacts with each other shaped social and political life throughout the 1990s and beyond. The Palestinians, Esp, Seely, found the fallout from the Oslo process decisive in fashioning the contours of their emerging self-identified people and the devil upping relations between their, incipient, state and society. While what follows is not an exhaustive list, we single out six results of the peace process, each of which shaped not only the relations between Palestinians and Israelis but also Palestinian society itself and the values and practices that were at its foundation. 1. The Israeli-Palestinian agreement unmasked a large majority on each side for a negotiated settlement. If partition would ever work, it would need to be accepted broadly by the two societies, not just by a hand, full of leaders holed away in a castle in Norway. Even though the Oslo Agreement was negotiated in complete secrecy, without any forewarnings to the Israeli and Palestinian people, it was greeted with enthusiasm by a large majority of both populations. Sara Roy, a longtime student of Palestinian society, wrote of how Joy and hope returned with the signing of the Oslo Agreement. I was in Gaza City when the Israeli army redeployed from the Urbanar, Eas of the Strip in May 1994. The freedom to walk their streets with, out fear or harassment left Palestinians ecstatic. That night, Gaza City's main commercial street throbbed with thousands of people, many in their finest clothes there were dancers and singers. The stores were open, food was free, and children had all the chocolate they wanted. The city was a swirl of light and color. 18. On both sides, it was clear that the initial document represented extraordinary compromises, departing from positions that had re repeatedly been presented by leaders as non negotiable. And it was UN, stood widely, too, that the planned five years of negotiations UN, till a final settlement would bring even more painful compromises. Still, the polls on both sides uncovered a large majority supporting the accord and its principles of territorial concessions and mutual acceptance. Palestinian pollster Khalil Shikaki tracked attitudes of West Bank and Gaza Palestinians from the initiation of the Oslo process. 19 in the month that the Declaration of Principles was signed, September 1993, two thirds backed the peace process. Palestinians' enthusiasm ebbed and flowed during the next few years, but, by 1996, in the wake of Israeli troop withdrawals after the interim agreement was signed, support for the peace process ballooned to a whopping four-fifths of the population. That turned out to be the high point. But even during the administration of Benjamin Netanyahu, 1996-1999, support never fell below 60% and, after Ayad Barak's election in 1999, it rose again to 75%. In short, 
what had been unthinkable for decades, Palestinians accepting far less than what they felt was their birthright, now became a topic, not only among intellectuals and policymakers, but a supported idea in the population of the territories generally. The street in the Middle East often connotes something ominous, a dark, vengeful, undifferentiated public keeping leaders from adopt, in, reasonable, policies. But the Palestinian street, like that in is, rail, was empowering leaders to proceed with the negotiations begun in Oslo, with all the compromises they entailed. Public senti meant clearly backed the idea of partition into two states, even if the specifics remained murky. What turned out to be tragic was that the leaders on both sides tuned in much more to the naysayers, that hardcore minority rejecting partition, a two-state solution, alto, gather, than to the majority supporting the peace process. At the same time that the public expressed widespread support for the Oslo process, this hardcore minority voiced vitriolic opposition to it. Even among the founding fathers of Fater itself, not to mention members of the Democratic Front, the Popular Front, and the Islamic movement, important figures, such as Hani al-Hassan and Farouk Kadumi, completely rejected the agreement. 20 they saw the construction of the Palestine Authority, and perhaps after, ward also of a nominal Palestinian state, in such a small part of his, Tariq Palestine, in a torn and divided territory, as a disaster. 21 the new state, if it ever emerged, would be a vassal of Israel. Major oppo, scission to the agreement also came from Palestinians in the Gerber, diaspora, who felt that the PLO leadership had abandoned them by implying a surrender of their right of return, al order. 22 they saw the right of return as the central tenet of the Palestinian diaspora experience, the basic right of every person and collectivity that had been ripped from the Palestinian homeland by force. 23. A prime example of another sort of opposition from abroad came from the most renowned Palestinian intellectual, Edward Said, whose critique of Orientalism in Western writing and thinking had swept through intellectual circles across the world. Said, a moderate within Palestinian circles who had always supported the PLO and Arafat, immediately came out against the DOP and viewed the R arrangements between the PLO and Israel as a total surrender to Z-Onism and the West. According to this critique, shared by other important Palestinian diaspora intellectuals, such as Rashid Khalidi, a professor at Columbia University who was then at the University of Chicago and was also a former supporter of Arafat, Israel had up, plied the classical colonial strategy of converting direct military control into indirect control by taking advantage of Palestinian call, laborators, the dupes of the Palestine Authority, and utilizing economic, technological, and military superiority. Khalidi and others felt that the secret Oslo negotiations had sub Otage the talks in Washington, D.C., coming out of the Madrid conference, in which the Palestinians could have won much better conditions. Other Palestinian critics of the agreement, mostly internal people, such as Haider Abd el Shafi and Mahmoud Darwish, were willing to accept the principles of the agreement with Israel, including recognition of the Israeli state, but criticized the cons science that Arafat and the mainstream made. Israel's conditions for Signing, they felt, raised doubts as to its true intentions. This oppo, scission, for example, protested leaving Jewish settlements in the Pal, Estonian territories, especially in the heart of Hebron and the Gaza Strip, postponement of the final status talks over Jerusalem, the late release of Palestinian prisoners, and the small amount of Terry, Tory to be transferred initially to the Palestine Authority. For all the unhappiness with the Oslo Accord inside the PLO, among exiled intellectuals, and within the growing Islamic move, meant, the popular foundation for proceeding with negotiations was quite strong. The high-profile signing had managed to pull the veil from the myth that Palestinians would accept nothing less than the destruction of Israel and throwing the Jews into the sea. More than that, when a concrete agreement was proposed and signed, most Palestinians lined up behind it, even if they quibbled with some of its provisions. A majority of Palestinians were eager for a truly independent state, even if it was one covering only a fifth of historic pal, Estein. Two, for the first time, each side accepted the legitimacy of the other's exis. Tan C. All sorts of images of what the relations between the Israeli 
and Palestinian states would eventually be were floated in the years after the signing of the Oslo Accord. Even at the height of the renewed and sustained violence after September 2000, these ideas continued to circulate, but with much less assuredness than before. Arafat, for example, wistfully spoke in 2002, in an interview with an Israeli newspaper, of a Benlix like relationship between Israel and the Palestinian state with open borders. 24 Shimon Perez, Israel's one time prime minister, was most vocal about future relations, talking of an economically integrated new Middle East. Whatever the precise form that coexistence would take, it depended on more than an acceptance of one's own state in only a portion of historic Palestine. It was conditioned on accepting the legitimate right of the other also to establish a state in part of Palestine. Unlike the Palestinians' declaration of a state in 1988, this time Israel's legitimacy was explicitly, not implicitly, stated. The Mutual Recogni Shunlat was enshrined in the Declaration of Principles formally conferred the assent of each nation to the national aspirations of the other. This point was made forcefully in the very first paragraph of the DOP. Israelis and Palestinians agreed to recognize their mutual legitimate and political rights. 25 The Accord attempted to make the idea of mutual legitimacy concrete by specifying numerous areas of proposed cooperation that would link Palestinians and Israelis in such mundane areas as electricity, transportation, and water. Beyond the language of the Accord, both Arafat and Israeli Prime Minister Rabin acknowledged in the months and years after the signing that the tactical basis of the conflict had changed once each recognized the mutual legitimate and political rights of the other. The transformation was from what social scientists call a zero-sum game to a non-zero-sum game. Zero-sum refers to a situation in which any gains by one side are seen as coming only through a core, responding loss by the other side, you win, I lose, and vice versa. Non-zero-sum suggests a condition in which gains by one side can also mean corresponding benefits for the other, a win-win situation. Rabin understood that the building of strong political institutions in the Palestine Authority would redound to Israel's benefit, as well. And Arafat knew that an increased sense of security among Israelis would make the public more disposed to move toward a final status agreement acceptable to Palestinians. Of course, the recognition of the legitimacy of the other could not come simply by fiat. Still, the signatures did imply a commit, meant by the leaders to work toward the reconstruction of their own national narratives so as to make room for the narrative of the other, that is, recognizing the other as a nation with a collective UN, the standing of its own right to a state in the territory the British had mapped out as Palestine. For Israelis, that modification would mean incorporating Palestinians into a rendering of national his, Tory from which they had been almost entirely absent. Palestinians, in contrast, had always had Israelis as part of their people's story, but as a bogeyman. Now, each nation was on the road to reconsider. In the role of the other in its own history. Mutual recognition meant moving from national myths that were black and white to much more difficult ones that were replete with shades of grey. 3. Each side renounced the dominant tactic it had used for three quarters of a century in dealing with the other, violence, and committed itself to the principle that only negotiations would resolve the conflict. In the Oslo AC Cord, violence was the hinge on which all else turned. Every speaker on the podium at the signing of the Declaration of Principles knew that and addressed it and its flip side, peaceful cooperation, in one way or another. PLO official Mahmoud Abbas put it in the most straightforward way, we have come to this point because we believe that peaceful coexistence and cooperation are the only means for reaching understanding and for realizing the hopes of the Palestinians and the Israelis. Metaphors abounded. Guns were to turn into shovels, it was the eve of opportunity, a farewell to arms, the end of violence and war. The DOP pledged the two parties to strive to live in peaceful coexistence and mutual dignity and security and achieve a just, lasting and comprehensive peace settlement and historic wreck, one ciliation through the agreed political process. As it turned out, violence never left the equation of Palestinian-Israeli relations. Because Israel continued to rule Palestinians, 
Vio, lance on the part of its security forces was almost a foregone conclusion. And extra-legal violence, such as the terror attack by a settler, Barak Goldstein, in Hebron in 1994, killing 29 Muslim worshippers and wounding many others, added fuel to smoldering fires. From the Palestinian side, the PAR leadership was left with very little leverage in its negotiations with Israel without the threat or use of violence. And a major stumbling block in moving toward a final status agreement was violence by groups and individuals not controlled by the Palestine Authority, as well as the festering cues, shun of whether the Palestine Authority could and should control them. Even though the peace process foundered through the use of VIO, lens, the acceptance by both sides of a principle of non-violence CRE, etted an important precedent. It set the parameters for both the practices each side needed to adopt in moving toward a settlement and an ideal for future relations. The principle forced both sides to confront the question of its day-to-day -day tactics of dealing with the other, as well as the issue of what eventual relations would be, separ, ration, avoidance, integration, federation, or for the Oslo Accord acknowledged and addressed the primal fear of both Palestinians and Israelis, inducing an acceptance of the concept of partition and the incipient rewriting of each nation's national narrative. Any move toward stability in the region would require a mutually acceptable partition plan. There is, quite simply, no other route to peace. Proposals to divide the country between Jews and Arabs had been circulating since the 1937 Peel Commission report without much success. Neither side liked the idea of splitting the small piece of land, and certainly nothing even close to a mutually acceptable plan had been tabled before the 1990s. Still, it is unimaginable to think about a war-free region without the acceptance by Palestinians and Israelis of a division of the territory that had been British-ruled Palestine. The challenge in 1937 was to find or generate such acceptance, and the challenge is no different today. All the years of fighting had not changed the conflict from its essence as a turf war. It was the mutual acceptance of the idea of partition, if not the specifics, which lay at the heart of the Oslo Agreement. But acceptance would have to mean much more than acquiescence by some, or even all, policymakers to the notion of splitting the land, based on one formula or another. For both Israelis and Palestinians, partition implied, too, the incorporation of the boundaries of what would be their truncated state into a widely accepted national narrative. That is no mean feat. The new boundaries of a state in a poor, shun of what was British Palestine would have to take on a value as the rightful, even sacrosanct, encapsulation of the nation's heart, land. Irredentism would have to fall away. To give some idea of what it means to have boundaries reshape a national narrative, Israel's experience after the 1948 war is very instructive. After that war, Israelis had moved toward the modifica, shun of their national story to accept, indeed, embrace, the interim. Sick value of a state in only a portion of the land. Shlomo Avinari, Israel's most esteemed political scientist and a former director of the foreign ministry, put it this way. One issue which was central to the political debate within the Jew, Ishishif, community, in the late 1930s and the 1940s, the debate about partition, was over. The armistice lines of 1949 were considered, aired by practically all Israelis as the realistic definite borders of Israel. If, prior to the 5th of June 1967, the Arab countries had been ready to sign a peace agreement with Israel on the basis of the existing frontiers, there would have been an overwhelming Israeli consensus in favor of accepting this, perceiving this Arab readiness as a major consensus, shorn and a tremendous achievement for Israel. With very few exceptions on the lunatic fringe of Israeli politics, there was no irredentist call in Israel during the period of 1949-1967, advocating an Israeli and I, theative to recapture Judy and Samaria, or even the old city of Jeru, Salem. This post-1948 consensus was visible across the spectrum of Israeli politics.26. The messy Israeli boundaries after the 1949 armistice, then, as, some the sanctity of their own for Israelis. 
they imparted a stability to state and society, Migdal wrote in Through the Lens of Israel. The state mold its reach to them and people simply assumed that those arbitrary lines would permanently define the extent of Israeli society. 27 The borders started to become an integral part of the national narrative by providing the frame for a sense of winness, or common identity, what it meant to be an Israeli. Israel's conquer, ing of all of Palestine in the 1967 war undid those borders and also the special place the truncated state with those crazy quilt-bound Aries had begun to assume in public culture. The uncertainty over Israel's ultimate borders after 1967 opened new, acrimonious dis, puts about the national narrative, even about what it meant to be an Israeli. These bitter struggles were an unforeseen consequence of Israel's amazing military victory, and they have lasted into the 21st century. Palestinians never had Israel's post-1948 luxury of what seemed at the time to be permanent borders. The uncertainty over what boundaries would finally prevail, or if there would be a Palestinian state with boundaries at all, thwarted the full development of a national narrative. All sorts of questions hung unanswered. What would the ultimate boundaries be? Would there be a separate Eden, titty for those inside the boundaries of the Palestinian state? Would there be diasporas? What would be the relationship of the diasporas to the state and the nation? Part of the difficulties that Palestinian officials had in making concrete proposals on the issue of the right of return during the Oslo process, for example, stemmed from this unfinished narrative as to what the Palestinian state and, even more, the Palestinian people would be. Who would be at their center and who at their periphery? Would refugees in Lebanon and elsewhere be absorbed into a truncated Palestinian state, repatriated to their original homes in Israel, or monetarily compensated and settled permanently in their host countries? The difficulty in coming to policy decisions on these questions stemmed, in great part, from the absence of a reigning national narrative among Palestinians Gina, Ali, and those in the occupied territories specifically. Without a resolution of the boundary question, Israelis and PAL. Estonians each found it difficult to construct a broadly accepted identity and sense of winness, especially after the 1967 war. Implicitly, at least, the Oslo Accord addressed that problem on several levels. One factor was its setting out an agenda for determining a final status agreement. The assurance that there would be a final agreement after five years of negotiations, even if the boundaries coming out of the talks were only roughly apprehended by the pub, lick in the mid-1990s, already had an effect in moulding the emerging understanding of what the nation would be. Beyond the power of the agenda, Oslo's declaration of principles addressed the primal fear on each side in moving toward territorial compromise. For Israelis, that basic fear was that they will never be happy until Israel is destroyed. No matter how much Israel would compromise, most Jewish Israelis' gut feeling prior to Oslo was that the Palestinians would not be satisfied until Israel would be wiped off the map and Israelis thrown into the sea. For Palestinians, the fear was that what you see is all you will ever get. They felt that is. Rail was intent on permanent occupation of the West Bank and Gaza Strip, or some facsimile of occupation through indirect con, troll, and committed to thwarting the emergence of any sort of truly autonomous Palestinian state. The Declaration of Principles began the process of addressing is, Israeli apprehensions by committing the accepted representative of the Palestinian people, the PLO, to a partition of the land and AC, acceptance of Israel's existence in whatever would be the agreed-upon borders. Arafat explicitly addressed the Israeli fear at the Oslo sign, in ceremony, our people do not consider that exercising the right to self-determination could violate the rights of their neighbors or infringe on their security. 28 For the Palestinians, the declaration set a path for Israeli withdrawal and the assumption by Palestinians of their own governance, implying that what you see today is not what you will get at the end of the process. Israeli Foreign Minister Perez spoke to the Palestinian fear at the same ceremony, I want to tell the Palestinian delegation that we are sincere, that we mean busy, Ness. We do not seek to shape your life or determine your destiny. Arafat explicitly assured his people that the accord committed Israel to the creation of an independent, truly autonomous Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. While the primal fears did not disappear immediately for either. 
people, the Oslo Agreement did initiate a process of mutualizer, and designed to mitigate each side's dread. These reassurances opened the door for Israelis and Palestinians to imagining their own nations existing within set borders. It was within this new imagined reality that the first steps for constructing and repairing their national narratives could take place. The Oslo Accord did move Israel, leads to begin to incorporate Palestinians into their understanding of themselves. That painful process certainly was not completed in the decade after Oslo, but it did result in important debates over the meaning of past events, the content of school textbooks, and the makeup of university curricula. For Palestinians, the reconstruction of the national narrative began, too, although more slowly and fitfully. For example, in 1993 polls, a majority of the Palestinian population in the occupied Tur. Reitries indicated support for amending the Palestinian National Charter to remove the sections that were anathema to Israel, al, though support waned to just over one-third of those polled by 1999, when the peace process had stalled. Also, the post-Oslo reality allowed for the creation of autonomous Palestinian institutions, both social and political, and, with them, the beginnings of a re-nude national narrative, with an actual and imagined territorial reach. Finally, some key Palestinian leaders placed the concept of partition into the context of Palestinian national aspirations. Here is Mohammed Darlan, a key figure in the Palestine Authority. In 2002, there is no reason each side can't hold onto its dreams. But there is only one solution two states living side by side, a Palestinian state along the June 67 borders, with its capital in Arab East J.E. Jerusalem where Palestinians can live in freedom, dignity and independence, with a fair resolution of the refugee problem, and an Israeli state in peace and security, 29. 5. The process spawned dozens of sets of negotiations between Israelis and Palestinians, beyond the official talks. The peace process became a kind of cottage industry among Palestinians and Israelis. Already in the aftermath of the Madrid conference, especially the multilateral negotiations in Washington, scores of Palestinian and Israeli ACA, DMICs, technical experts, and others participated, some as official members of the negotiating teams, others as advisors. What began as talks between a few Israeli academics and second-rung PLO of officials in early 1993 blossomed into multiple volunteer and paid teams of advisors who continued to draw up position papers, policy statements scenarios, and the like until the very end of the Oslo process in January 2001. And, even after that, low-level meetings continued to occur, so much so that one magazine referred in 2002, at the height of violence, to the privatization of peacemaking, 30. In any case, for the eight years of the Oslo process, carters of EDU, Kate Israelis and Palestinians spent countless hours with each other, and preparing for their sessions with each other, figuring out the nitty-gritty details of how the two peoples could coexist. B. Yon their role as direct advisors, many of these Palestinians and is. Rayleigh's engaged in back-channel negotiations, or what is sometimes called track two negotiations, on issues broad and narrow. But these advisors were not the only ones engaged in the back-channels. Rely, just leaders, business people, Labor activists, academics, and others took part in all sorts of semi official and unofficial talks. Some NE negotiations, such as those in Stockholm in 2000, carried the weight of the Israeli government and the Palestine Authority. Others were conferences, publicly and privately held at such places as the Pales, Tinian Universities, or the Harry S. Truman Institute for Peace of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem with no direct links to policy makers. Still others were simple talk sessions on issues ranging from the status of Jerusalem to the disbursement of tax receipts.31. These sessions varied tremendously in their direct utility. Some hammered out common positions on difficult, if narrow, issues of conflict. Others ended in acrimony. Some yielded lasting friend, ships across national lines, others reinforced caricatures and stereotypes. No one monitored the tens of sessions that were held, but we can venture to say that these conferences and talks produced some important direct and indirect results. 
Most directly, they produced actual documents on important issues indicating areas of agreement and disagreement. These documents will almost certainly serve as a sort of template in future negotiations, that is, it will be very hard for either side to demand a totally new starting place for negotiation on these issues. The points of agreement, in particular, will serve as points of departure in future efforts at forging peace. Indirectly, key elites, many of them among the best and the bright, is of a young, educated generation, committed a sizable part of their lives for these eight years to finding a path toward coexistence. That commitment among an important part of each population can serve as a foundation for future attempts at reaching a final stir, disagreement. In addition, they forged important relations with each other, learning styles, points of sensitivity, red lines, and more. 6. The Oslo Process Created the First Ever Palestinian Government No. Matter what kinds of constraints it faced, no matter how limited its scope of action, no matter how torturous its efforts to build if to governing institutions, the Palestine Authority gave Palestinians their own government for the first time in their history. As Rashid Khalidi put it, for all the limitations surrounding it, the new Palestinian Authority has more power over more of its people and more of Palestine than any Palestinian agency has had in the 20th century, 32 negotiations after the signing of the DOP Pro, Juice the Transfer Agreement, officially, the agreement on preparatory transfer of powers and responsibilities, in August 1994. West Bank and Gaza residents, after centuries of rule by Ottomans, British, Jordanians, Egyptians, and, of course, Israelis, now experienced indigenous leaders ruling in much of their day-to-day -day lives. Some times that governance was surprisingly effective, most times, it was frustratingly inefficient, even corrupt. Still, it consisted of Palestine, Ian's ruling Palestinians. When the mainstream Palestinian leadership signed the Oslo Agreement, it apparently saw that agreement as both the minimal and optimal program for the short term. 33 In any case, for the first time ever, the Palestinians came close to having an actual state of their own, that is, the existence of a political entity with authority and independent central control within a part of historic Palestine. And they harbored, too, the hope to expand control and authority over these and additional areas of the country. The Palestine Authority adopted state mannerisms and rituals. The PLO chairman became the president, those responsible for various portfolios, the number of which grew to 35 by 2002, were termed ministers, and the various departments turned into minis, tries. The Palestine Authority adopted the flag and national anthem of the PLO, as well as its diplomatic representatives abroad. A gov, ermant radio station and several regional television stations were established, which aired many government-approved programs. A fragile judiciary system was also founded, which attempted to press, ent itself, without great success, as independent of the executive. On 25 January 1996, a short time after the signing of the interim agreement and the redeployment of Israeli troops out of the main population centers, the Palestine Authority organized general elections in the West Bank and Gaza Strip under foreign surveillance. Palestine Ian saw the newly elected 88-seat Legislative Council as a palia, meant for all intents and purposes. 34 FETA supported candidates received an overwhelming majority of the votes. 35 The Legislative Council, whose purpose turned out to be more to signify representation of the Palestinian people through the elections than actually to play a weighty legislative role or serve as a check to the authority of the president, even had its sessions broadcast through the new par established media. Outlets the greatest challenge for the Palestine Authority was to build a sense of acceptance, or legitimacy, among the people of the Territo, Reese, while establishing security, control, and authority. Questions of security, in particular, preoccupied the leadership. To maintain security in area, the parties agreed that the Palestine Authority could construct a contingent of police and various other security forces, such as the Preventive Security Force, the General Intel, Legend Service, the Special Security Force, and the Presidential Guard Forward Slash Force 17. PLO negotiators pushed for the creation of these security forces for several reasons. 
The construction of a Palestinian police force made possible the return to Palestine of a large share of the Fidayen units and their families, who had been deported from Lebanon to Tunis, as well as other units of the Palestine Liberation Army that had been dispersed to other countries. Returning units from Tunis and elsewhere were integrated, side by side, with local forces, also made up mostly of Fater veterans. Together, all these units became the main institutional underpin. Ning of the Palestine Authority's regime. In fact, the ratio of police, men to citizens is one of the highest in the world, 36 the men who originally staffed these security units came to be referred to as the old guard, as opposed to the young guard of the Tanzim, which emerged as a powerhouse in the second intifada. 37 many of the complaints by the young guard revolved around the security forces heavy-handed, authoritarian methods, often abusing people's basic rights. The police forces became the essential cog of the Palestine or Thoritis burgeoning organizational machine, which quickly began to look more and more like the overgrown bureaucracies of other countries in Africa and the Middle East. In the absence of product, TIV economies in many countries of the third world, or at least ones not productive enough to keep up with high birth rates and high school graduation rates, these unwieldy government structures have served as a source of jobs for the population and a magnet for direct foreign aid. Much the same happened in the West Bank and Gaza. Already in 1995, as many as 60,000 people were employed by the PAL, Estine Authority. In Gaza, about a quarter of the residents were der, pendant on par salaries. Indeed, acceptance of the Palestine author, iti by the population depended in no small part on the patronage doled out through jobs in the new bureaucracy. The 5, 000, strong as in civil administration under the Israelis ballooned to 40,000 in the Palestine Authority. 38 In fact, in Gaza as much as 40% of the workforce was on the public payroll. A year after the establishment of the Palestine Authority, its budget was a whopping one-third of the total GNP of the territory it governed. The huge operat, in deficit that all this public employment created turned out to have some very detrimental economic effects on the territories. The police forces, in particular, became pump primers for jobs. About half the jobs in the Palestine Authority were in these security forces. Also, the Palestinian security forces, both in their uniforms and armaments, ranging from light to mid-range, became a central part of the symbolic accoutrements of state-building. According to the Oslo Accord, the branches of the security forces could total 9,000 men, later expanded to 18,000, but, in reality, they quickly grew to as many as 45,000 and, at the same time, fragmented into nine, or possibly as many as 12 or more, all too autonomous low, cal commands. Among those that eventually became part of the SE, Security Network were Fater's Tanzim, the organization, and Al Aqsa Brigades, both of which became notorious in the Intifada that broke out in 2000. They were composed of young locals, as opposed to those brought from Tunis, who saw themselves both as responsi BLE for internal security, citing the hapless, formal Blue Police, and as a force to be turned against Israel, if need be. 39 The heads of the main security forces, including Mohammed Dalan and Jibril Rajib, of the Preventive Security Forces in Gaza and the West Bank, respectively, succeeded in acquiring considerable power in the 1990s but basically remained dependent on Arafat and identified with the regime. Later, beginning in October 2000, when the Oslo Agreement broke down and violence erupted, the lines blurred considerably between the official forces of the Palestine Authority and various other armed militias in the occupied territories with varying degrees of support and control. Beyond security, the need to create legitimacy and authority to mandate that the Palestine Authority build both a sense of winness among Palestinians and a feeling among the population that the Palestine Authority was the true representation of the people. But the achievement of both these goals was no easy task. For many pal Estonians, the Palestine Authority itself was a mixed blessing, bringing some self-government to Palestinians, at long last, but not the hope for state. Even among the leaders of the PLO who stood with Arafat, the focus was not so much on this interim institution, the Palestine Authority, as on the final arrangement, 
through which they would supposedly win an independent and sovereign state for the first time in Palestinian history. They foresaw this state as located on the West Bank and Gaza Strip, with East Jerusalem as its capital. It would include, they amag, Ind, either no Jews at all or, perhaps, only a small minority of Jew-ish settlements and settlers. Scattered Palestinians in the diaspora would be addressed by the new state's own law of return, with the government probably encouraging their selective immigration at a pace it saw fit, based largely on the state's absorption ability economically.40 but the image of the state and its actual practices did not coincide.41 the actual government they had in the Palestine or authority, as opposed to the one in their mind's eye, had clipped wings, without the ability to control its airspace, ports. Immigration, including return of diaspora Palestinians, foreign relations, and more. The challenge of establishing its authority and legitimacy in such conditions was monumental. Similar challenges existed in creating a sense of winness among the population. One central question was how to build a shared imagined community for all its residents, extending, as well, to the Palestinians in the Gerber. That is, how could the national narrative move beyond a shared sense of victimization and the lost garden, the themes that came out of the catastrophe of dispersal and of the life in the camps? While these themes had served Palestinians well as a kind of national cement in the past, they now threatened to strangle the national movement with a debilitating nostalgia. A number of power officials focused on the establishment of an EDU, cational system, the construction of a new curriculum, and the writ, of relevant textbooks that would sketch out the social and cultural borders and characteristics of the new Palestinian identity. Schooling would be a central means of building their imagined community. Up until this time, the educational system in the West Bank had been mainly based on the Jordanian curriculum, in order to prepare students for the Jordanian matriculation examinations, Torjahai. In the Gaza Strip, the Egyptian curriculum had held sway. The rest of the curriculum developed in the schools run by the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees in the Near East, UNRWA. An independent Palestinian curriculum, including the creation of a national history and myths, a true national narrative, had already begun to be formulated in the 1960s in Kuwait and Lebanon. Now, in building on these efforts, the Palestine Authority recruited the best of the local intelligentsia in order to formulate a curriculum and write textbooks. It established a new Ministry of Education in 1994 and invested it with the power to take charge of teacher training and to revamp the curriculum, in the Centre for Curriculum Development, set up in 1994 in Ramallah, funded by Italy and assisted by USCO. 42 The inadequate supply of teachers and their poor training were addressed through a program to train 1,000 teachers at a time. 43 The development of a national curriculum was at the center of the new ministry's activities. By 1996, the Center for Curriculum Development produced the Comprehensive Plan for the Development of the First Palestinian Curriculum for General Education, a 600 page, two volume work. This was followed by the First Palestinian Curriculum Plan in 1998, which was approved by both the PAR Executive and the Legislative Council.44. But all these reforms proved to be much harder to effect than anyone had imagined, involving a long and complicated process, one demanding many more resources than the Palestine Authority could marshal. Rote teaching by unqualified teachers continued to be the norm. Indeed, Ministry officials said that poorly trained teachers blocked serious organizational and curricular reform. 45x, extremely low salaries and oversized classes made it very difficult to re recruit top grade teachers. Tensions between teachers and the PAL, Estine Authority, especially over salaries, resulted in a number of teacher strikes and the detention and holding incommunicado of a leader of the teachers' movement by the PAR security forces. Political favoritism in appointments, both in the ministry and individual schools, also undermined plan changes. These difficulties in the Palestine authorities establishing an educational system on sound footing simply compounded the effects of the repeated school clo shores during the Al-Aqsa Intifada, further compounding the alarm in growth of functional illiteracy in Palestinian society that had already begun in the first Intifada. 
educational reform would be slow and could not be counted on to produce the kind of national cohere shown for which power officials hoped. For all the hurdles that it encountered in establishing its authority and shaping the people in such a way that it, the Palestine author, Itty, would universally be seen as the institutional representation of that society, the organization of a Palestinian government was a tremendous achievement. If the Palestine Authority was not a state, it came close to being one. It was an internationally recognized polity, cal entity with centralized control within a given territory, itself a part of historic Palestine, with the promise in hearing in it of X, panding that control over more territory, more people, and more functions. Its constituents had the image of it as a state, both for better and for worse, and its practices resembled those of states around the world. For the first time since 1948, the Palestinian leadership returned to Palestine and settled in among the people, a process that was not always easy or comfortable for the leaders or the residents, due to the years of separation between them during the leadership's exile and differences in culture, generation, and interests. Once the PAL, Estine Authority was up and running, it became hard to imagine a reversal, a move back from centralized Palestinian leadership in PAL, Estine. Even at the height of the violence between Israel and the Palestinians in 2001 and 2002, Israeli leaders, including right-wing leaders who had vigorously condemned the Oslo Accord, spoke of the inevitability of a Palestinian state and the impossibility of Reis, tablishing direct Israeli governance of the West Bank and Gaza. The gravest threat to the continued life of the Palestine Authority came in late March 2002, in the wake of a major Passover holiday suicide bombing in the Israeli town of Netanya. Israel drafted a poor, shun of its reserve soldiers and declared the beginning of Operation Defense Shield. The assault's explicit goal was to wipe out the PAL, Estonian infrastructure of terror. One after another, tank and other land forces under the cover of Apache helicopters entered Parkon, trolled West Bank territories, cities, refugee camps, and even Ville, Lags. Of the major towns, only Hebron and Jericho escaped the Az, Salt. Israeli forces captured and imprisoned thousands of suspects in detention camps. According to a report of Amnesty and Turner, Schnell, between 27 February and 20 May 2002, which included the period of the operation, Israeli forces arrested, imprisoned, and interrogated 8,500 Palestinians. Most were gradually released. 46, but the Israeli forces did not stop there. They systematically destroyed national and public Palestinian institutions, including buildings, radio and television stations, information banks, and documents, some were taken as spoils to Israel, all of which the Palestinian Authority, in the guise of a state in the making, had taken great care to build. 47 water, electricity, and road infrastructure were also badly damaged. But even at these darkest moments of violence and escalating re retaliation in 2002, when Israeli tanks occupied practically all the West Bank cities and the military set around the clock curfews, the idea of Palestinian self government remained intact. Even if the PAL, Estine Authority no longer could undertake most of the practices of what states do, from building archives to collecting taxes, its image by the Palestinians as the appropriate governing authority for the Palestinians remained intact. While Israeli reoccupation and its subsequent practice of short-term incursions into the cities destroyed much that the Palestinians had built and while Israeli rhetoric, picked up, too, by the United States, included the need for a new Palestinian leadership, there was no retreat from the idea of Pales, tiny and self-government. That, in itself, was a great achievement of the Oslo process. The accomplishments of the Oslo process were formidable and have had a lasting effect on the political and social terrain of the Palestinians. But, as is already clear, every one of those achievements, a majority accepting a two-state solution, the forswearing of violence, mutual acceptance of legitimacy and recognition of the other's primal fear, and the creation of a Palestinian government, suffered badly through the peace process and into the period of the Al-Aqsa Intifada. Each of the successes of the Oslo process has had, and will continue to have, long-term effects on Palestinians and their relations with Israel. In the best of worlds, they will be the building blocks for a future go at peace, 
for two independent states coexisting peacefully. But at the moment of this writing, it is hard to see beyond the veil of violence. All we can ask is, what went wrong? Eleven, the Oslo process. What went wrong? With every passing day, Palestinians' ability to keep a sense of stability becomes more difficult. Daoud K. Atab, journalist and director of the Institute of Modern Media at Al Quds University in Ramallah, the 16th of August 2002, one. Despite the cornerstones laid by the Oslo process for even. Chual Palestinian-Israeli coexistence and the normalization of Pal-Estinian society, the unveiling of the pro-compromise majorities on each side, mutual acceptance, the renunciation of violence as a permanent strategy, recognition by each side of the other's primal fear, the creation of multiple channels working toward coexistence, and the establishment of Palestinians' first-ever self-government. The 21st century opened with a reversion to brutal violence, unmitigated hatred. And mutual demonization. The scenes of pub, lick space in Israel and Palestine were no longer those of people se renally sipping their Turkish coffee in chic cafes, but of mobs chant in death to the Arabs and dancing in the streets at the news of suicide bombs ripping innocent civilians to shreds. Israel's flirtation with a normal, secure everyday life came to an abrupt end. And for Palestinians. The return of the hopelessness of 1948 and 1967, the erosion of the significant economic gains that they had made in the 1980s, the unceasing violence, all made the heady days of late 1993 seem like a mirage. At the end of the man, dated period set out in the DOP's agenda, there still was no pales, tiny and state, no return of refugees, no sovereignty over Jerusalem. And no respite from Israel's dominion over their lives. By mid 2002, the brutal violence of the Al-Aqsa Intifada had crippled Palestine's fledgling political institutions and threatened the fragile social cohesion Palestinians had painstakingly constructed in the decades of after 1948 and 1967. What went wrong? Why did the Oslo Accord fail to deliver? Five key elements doomed the Oslo peace process. These factors point to the accord's grounding in the power imbalance of the two sides and its inattention to mechanisms that could arbitrate differences between the Israelis and Palestinians and enable the parties to deal with naysayers, particularly those willing to use terror. The absence of such rules, in effect, gave these groups a veto power over the course of the peace process. Most of all, the following factors demonstrate that peace can. Not simply emerge from secret negotiations among leaders closeted away in a magical castle. The central argument throughout this book, from the first rumblings of change in the early 1800s to CRE, Asian of a self-identified people in the shambles of dispossession in the last half of the 20th century, is that the creation of the Pal Estonian nation has been as much the product of events, acts, and institutions at the grassroots level as it has been of the doings of top leaders. In fact. The developments at the lowest levels of society have shaped and constrained those at the top. This argument held through the peace process as well.
The Palestinian public's response to, and participation in, the Oslo peace process determined whether it would succeed. Front-loading and back-loading of benefits Each side came to the negotiating table in Oslo with a shopping list of goals. Israel's principal aims could be summarized in two words, security and acceptance. Since 1948, Israeli leaders had fought to have Israel accepted as a legitimate state internationally. And their day-to-day -day preoccupation was security, the violent threats posed by Arab states, largely through conventional warfare, and by non-state groups, such as Fater, through guerrilla warfare and terrorism. Israeli strategy for most of its existence gave primacy to surrounding Arab states in terms of goals, security, and acceptance. Its leaders' thinking was that if Israel persevered and finally gained acceptance from its neighbors, neutralizing their threat to Israel's well-being by making conventional warfare too costly or undesirable, then hostile guerrilla groups and other non-state actors, indeed the entire pales, tiny and problem, would simply melt away. Israel's peace treaty with Egypt was the crowning achievement in this strategy. Oslo was a complete reversal of that strategy for Israel, because it gave first priority to the Palestinian issue and assumed that resolve, in that issue would make resistance to Israel disappear in the re at large. Israeli leaders were by no means fully agreed on this sudden 180-degree turn in strategy, nor were individual leaders, such as Rabin and Barak, unambivalent about the change in course, in fact, every Israeli prime minister in the 1990s thought, at one time or another, that Syria was a better bet as the primary peace partner than the PLO. All this equivocation led to zigzags in Israeli policy, which badly damaged the Oslo process. In any case, when the Israelis did commit to the Palestinians' first track in 1993, they maintained the same overall aims that they had harbored since 1948, gaining acceptance as a legitimate state and solving the security problem, only now tactically using the Palestinians as the lever to the rest of the Arab world rather than the oppo, site. To the Oslo Accord seemingly accomplished those goals, front loading precisely those benefits to Israel. By front loading, we mean that the agreement gave Israel what it desired most of all at the signing, without any delay. The Declaration of Principles in Corpo, rated recognition of Israel by the PLO and an immediate halt to violence into its terms at the very signing of the agreement and its accompanying protocols. Palestinians were supposed to prevent at, tax against Israelis wherever they were, inside Israel or in settlements located on Palestinian territories. PLO leaders, too, came to the Oslo negotiations with their own. Shopping list but the inequality of power between Israel and the PLO enabled Israel to postpone the achievement of most pales, tiny and goals. Israel's hold on all the land of historic Palestine, its overwhelming firepower, its many advantages as an actual state, its financial resources, all put it in a much stronger bargaining position at Oslo. Indeed, it was the imbalance of power that was inscribed into the Declaration of Principles through its unequal timing of concessions that so soured Palestinian intellectuals, such as Edward said, on the entire Oslo process. While the PLO did receive some benefits up front, including Rec. Onishin as the legitimate representative of the Palestinian people, in a letter sent by Israel for days before the signing of the DOP and a toehold in Palestine, after about a year, its most cherished ends were backloaded that is, they were implicitly promised, PLO of, officials believed, as benefits that would come in the course of the five years of negotiations or, most likely, as elements in the final status agreement. These included, of course, the creation of a sovereign state but also the elimination of Jewish settlements in the West Bank and Gaza Strip, a just resolution of the refugee problem through some formula recognizing Palestinians' right of return, free movement between the West Bank and Gaza Strip a capital city in Jerusalem including Palestinian sovereignty over Haram al-Sharif and the Arab neighborhoods of the city, and the creation of a Suez, tinable Palestinian economy including control over sufficient war, ter resources. The continuing effects of the initial power imbalance, leading to the front-loading of benefits for Israelis and the back-loading of Ben, efforts for Palestinians, were momentous. Because Israel had already received most of what its leaders wanted, the incentives to make further painful concessions were low, 
especially ones that involved huge domestic costs. And most of what they had to give up, settle, ments, parts of Jerusalem, access to water, territory, had powerful, vocal domestic Jewish constituencies committed to maintaining them for Israel. Even more, the fact that Israel had most of its gains in hand when follow-up negotiations began on an interim agree meant and, later, on a final status agreement meant that the Palestine. Ians had very few levers with which they could influence Israeli NE negotiators. Compounding Palestinian weakness was the fact that, while Israel's benefits were clearly spelled out, the Palestinians' backloaded benefits were not specified in the Declaration of Principles. The agreements were created according to Henry Kissinger's doctrine of constructive opaqueness, that is, agreeing to general principles and leaving the details hazy, thus allowing each side to present the agreement to its own public as if it had achieved its central goals. While this method may have worked well for agreements between the United States and China or Vietnam, nations separated by the sands of miles, it was not suitable here. Not only were the details unspecified for only one of the two parties, the Palestinians, this was a case of populations living side by side with continuous inter-action among broad segments of the two populations. In such a sit, Wushin, any small incident or source of friction could cause him, immense tension and events that could threaten the peace process. Palestinians and Israelis apprehended the course of the long N.E. Negotiations that were to follow and the details that would be ham, mirrored out quite differently. Palestinians felt that their tremendous concessions at the outset, giving up 78% of historic Palestine and recognizing the Jewish state's right to exist, were so far-reaching and painful, that the backloaded benefits would not require many further compromises. They imagined an agreement like the Israeli-Egyptian formula, peace in exchange for all of the territory captured during the war of 1967. For the Israelis, however, the agreement was perceived as just the beginning of negotiations. The backloaded benefits for the Palestinians would demand further bar, gaining over the scope of the territories ceded, the fate of the settlements, and patents for military control over the whole space. In sum, the Palestinians found it very difficult to extract Israeli concessions as the negotiations wore on. It was not lost on Palestine, Ian leaders that the one element that could be mitted out to exert continuing pressure on the Israeli government and induce it to sweeten the pot in the negotiations, violence, had been Rilan, Kewished at the outset. The temptation to reclaim violence as a lever. Either indirectly by turning a blind eye toward actions by, or though, raised groups, such as hammers, or directly through fata backed perpetrators, was enormous. Backloading of benefits for the Palestinians meant the incentive structure for them was entirely different from that of the Israelis. They were induced to make more and more concessions now in or, dare to receive those hoped for final benefits later. Israelis knew that, as did Palestinian critics of Oslo. Indeed, the drumbeat of the pales, tiny and intellectual critics, especially in the United States, was that the readiness to make concessions in order to have a state would lead to one that was nothing more than an impotent South African Bantustan. Israel would maintain true control over Palestinians' lives, even if it no longer ruled directly through a civil and military administration. Beyond that, the Israelis kept in their pocket all the as-yet undelivered benefits, thus maintaining tremendous leverage over the Palestinian leadership. Of all the points of contention between the sides, none more strongly reflected the front-loading forward-slash-back-loading asymmetry than is, Israeli settlements in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. Palestinians inside and outside the territories saw Israel's unwillingness to dismantle settlements and, even worse, its continuous thickening of settlements through the entire Oslo process as an ominous sign. From the signing of the Oslo Agreements to the year 2000, the num bur of settlers in the West Bank doubled, reaching nearly 380,000, including those in the captured parts of Jerusalem.3 Now that Israel had what it wanted from the front-loaded benefits it gained in the Oslo Accord, Palestinians believed, it would fail to deliver on its promises, the settlements would be a form of permanent occupar, shin and emasculation of any Palestinian state that might be CRE, etted. The extraordinary public investment in the territories by is, rail, particularly intensive building of expensive bypass roads, 
was a further indication to both the Palestinian leaders and public that backloading actually translated into a tease that would never be re-alized. For Israeli leaders, especially those from the Labour Party, the set. Tolmans were irritants that threatened the party's hold on govern. Meant. Their motivation was to postpone any move on the settle-ment issue, which would inevitably test their fragile coalitions, until the last possible moment, that is, the final status agreement. Pales, Tinians would have to take on faith that Israel's intentions were honorable. During the entire Oslo process, not a single Israeli prime minister reassured the Palestinians by indicating that all, or even most, settlements would be dismantled. On the contrary, in the year 2000 alone, the number of Jews in the Palestinian territories, not in, including the annexed areas of Jerusalem, grew by more than 8 per cent. Only in 2002 did a serious candidate for the prime minister post, Amra Mitzner, emerge who was willing to make the evacuer, shun of settlements part of his platform. To conclude, the Oslo Accord created an agenda that would take years to work through. But it saddled the ensuing process with a structure marked by an imbalance of power between the negotiating partners. It front-loaded benefits for Israel and back-loaded them for Palestinians. Yet Oslo included an incentive structure that did not provide much sense of urgency to Israelis to take the steps necessary for Palestinians to achieve those back-loaded benefits, or even Riyas, sure Palestinians that they would actually materialize. In addition, it contained few levers for Palestinians to induce Israel to move for ward expeditiously. Both sides soon grew weary of the extended process and its calm, placated agenda, especially its interim features, but both sides also were apprehensive about moving directly to final status negotiations and the extensive concessions that a final agreement would undoubtedly demand. The peacemaking process was based on a gradual, step by step process of arrangement making. The basic idea was to create trust and confidence between the two peoples. But the leaders of both peoples were hesitant to make hard and fate, full decisions on real issues, which undermined the process. Issues such as the final borders, the status of holy shrines in Jerusalem, the future of the Jewish settlements, the refugee problem, or how to share common aquifers remained open and were not tackled until the marathon sessions at the very end in Camp David and at Tabar in 2000 and 2001. Unstable politics on both sides. For more than 20 years, no government in Israel succeeded in win Ning re-election. Menachem Begin, in 1981, was the last Israeli prime minister to form a government on his own for a second term, and even he did not serve that full term. Despite the Nasid's attempts to stabilize electoral politics through a series of legislative reforms, support for the two main parties continued to erode. Small, special, interest parties mushroomed and exercised extraordinary leverage. Coalitions became thin, weak, and unstable. As a result, highly mo bilized interest groups could successfully threaten the life of governments. Prime ministers were preoccupied with keeping their fragile coalitions intact, cobbling together odd unions of parties with op, posing interests. Their attention focused on placating particular groups that threatened to bolt and then, immediately after, in deal, in with another coalition faction offended by the concessions to the first group. Indeed, every Israeli government after the signing of the Oslo Accord, those headed by Yitzhak Rabin, Shimon Peres, Benjamin Netanyahu, Ayad Barak, and Ariel Sharon, faced similar challenges in terms of constructing and then maintaining a coalition. Nurturing the coalition, even just keeping it intact, increase, Ingli preoccupied each successive government's leaders, especially after a honeymoon period of about a year in office. Balancing due domestic concerns with the painful concessions that the Oslo process necessarily demanded became more and more difficult as each gov government's term wore on. For Rabin and his foreign minister, Perez, that balancing act was especially complicated. Their belief that the Palestinian-Israeli conflict had changed from a zero-sum to a non-zero-sum game term put their temptation to triumph in every round of negotiations. They indicated their understanding that Arafat had to appear to his population to be winning real concessions from Israel if Palestinians were going to remain behind the Oslo process. 
Even so, the fur, gillacy of their governing coalition and their constant looking over their shoulders at domestic constituencies limited their willingness to forego victories in the negotiations. They were well aware, for X. Ample, that Palestinian saw Israeli settlement activity as a barome, tur of Israel's commitment to eventually deliver Oslo's backloaded benefits, yet not a single Israeli settlement was dismantled during their watch, and the overall number of settlers continued to increase at an alarming rate. Once Netanyahu was elected in early 1996, he made it clear that the zero-sum mentality had returned, he construed every pales, tiny and gain as an Israeli setback. Netanyahu did not openly and officially discard Oslo and continued talks with the Palestinians' UN, der American auspices. He even came to additional interim agree, ments, including the withdrawal from the West Bank city of Hebron, with the exception of a Jewish enclave, and the Y Agreement, the 16th of November 1996. In the framework of the Y Agreement, Israel agreed to transfer control over additional portions of the West Bank to the Palestine Authority, and thus de facto the entire urban popular, Shin, with the exception of that in Jerusalem, and most of the population of the refugee camps came under par governance. Nevertheless, as a result of the Y Agreement, the radical right abandoned Netanyahu's Likud party, a move that eventually helped topple his government. For the Oslo process survived under Netanyahu, but a change could be felt in the atmosphere and in relations between Israel and the Palestinians. Mutual trust was shaken. In addition to the hostile tone of the new government toward the Palestinians, the controversy surrounding the Western Wall Tunnel contributed to this change in the political climate. On the 25th of September 1996, the Israeli government opened the tunnel, which extended underneath Haram al-Sharif, an act considered by Muslims as a threat to the status quo of the mosques above. The opening of the tunnel incited demonstrations and riots during which about 40 Palestinians were killed and 100 injured. Tensions also rose as construction plans were ex panded into areas of Arab Jerusalem and in the settlements. The beginning of a new Jewish neighborhood of Har Homer in Greater J.E., Ruzalem touched a particularly raw nerve among Palestinians. Arad, Eichel, nationalist rhetoric and scorn for Palestinians began to mark official Israeli discourse. That change made it all the more difficult. For the PAR leadership to sell the idea to its constituency that PAR, tyants would bring the Palestinians their cherished goals. On the settlement issue, particularly, Palestinians could expect very little at all, since the settlers were one of Netanyahu's biggest and most enthusiastic constituencies. Netanyahu's tenny also made Palestine, Ian's for that Israel's political instability, its oscillations between right and left, sabotaged the long-term commitment and steadfastness that the Oslo process demanded. On the 17th of May 1999, Ayad Barak was elected to Prime Minister on the Labour Party ticket under the slogan, continuation of the Rabin legacy. His election raised big hopes for the rehabilitation of Reeler, shins of trust between Israel and the Palestinians, in particular, and the Arab world, in general. Barak's brief and rocky tenig, which lasted until early 2001, a bit over a year and a half, epitomized a gov, earnment with a tin ear toward both the domestic constituencies it needed in order to keep its narrow coalition afloat and Oslo's requirements of measured, continuing confidence-building measures that would reassure Palestinians that the process was headed in the right direction. Israel's move back to the right, yet again, in 2001 with the land, slide election of Sharon finally and fully reversed the logic of Oslo from mutual reassurance to a vicious cycle of violence. Indeed, Sharon's tenet marked the end of the Oslo process. All in all, is, Rail's volatile politics during the entire Oslo period induced the country's leaders to place immediate domestic concerns ahead of the long-term policies, concessions, and commitments that the peace process required. Managing domestic coalition politics in is, Rail overwhelmed foreign policy and subverted the possibility of fashioning long-range policies for the entire decade following the signing of the Declaration of Principles. In particular, None of the left-wing prime ministers succeeded in translating the overwhelming majority of the electorate expressing support for the peace pro-cess into a workable electoral majority. 
Instability in Palestinian politics also took a steep toll on the Oslo peace process, although it assumed a very different hue from Israel's. Electoral ping pong and its coalitional gyrations. Unlike Israel, the Palestine Authority had only one head, Yasser Arafat, for the entire eight years in which negotiations took place. Instability in Palestine, Ian internal politics came through veiled, ongoing struggles for or authority among the Palestine Authority, two other societal centers of power, and Israel's administration in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. These struggles drained Palestinian leaders' energy and, as in Israel, focused them on short-term, internal power jockeying. In addition, Arafat's leadership, it turns out, both masked and encouraged instar, ability and weak governmental institutions at the next levels down of the Palestine Authority. And weak governmental institutions only increased preoccupation with domestic, everyday issues instead of the big-picture issues associated with the Oslo process. Two societal centers of power posed serious challenges to Arafat as he and his aides organized the new Palestine Authority. Both of these centers, the educated, secular local leaders and the Islamic groups, matured in the course of the Intifada that began in 1987. These two centers came out of the burgeoning Palestinian university, ties in the territories, many of whose graduates later fortified their ties to each other in Israeli prisons. Many became professionals. Of 10, they were recruited on campus to serve as candidates or politi, calcarters in the highly competitive and politicized student elections. Through a variety of civic institutions, from the Boy Scouts to the Voluntary Works Program, which started as a literacy campaign and mushroomed into a multifaceted series of volunteer experiences, secular students and professionals cut their teeth as local leaders in the 1970s and 1980s, even before the Intifada began. They came not from the notable class, for the most part, but from calm, mon Palestinian families in refugee camps, villages, and towns. Five, while often focused locally, their efforts mobilized Palestinians from all over the West Bank and Gaza Strip into cross cutting civic organizations and volunteer efforts. As much as anyone, they were responsible for the emerging civil society in territories. Indeed, their construction of the organizational basis for ongoing relations beyond one's kinship group, in the absence of a Palestinian state pro protecting them and in the face of an Israeli state hounding them proved to be one of the most remarkable feats in the making of the Palestinian people. By the end of the 1980s, these organizations of civil society M employed 20,000-30,000 workers. In the absence of a state, the new Palestinian elite had cultivated alternate mechanisms in civil society. Without tax revenues, their organizations depended, in large part, on foreign sources. During the period of the First Intifada, these organizations gained momentum, and, by the early 1990s, PRO provided about 60% of services associated with medical clinics and first aid, about half of those in hospital services, about 30% of those associated with education, and almost all aid and rehabilitation services for the disabled. They also provided agricultural extension services, counseling and support for those in need, aid for former prisoners, and more. Already facing opposition from the old notable leadership, with which the Israelis worked in governing the area, the students and professionals encountered an additional, unexpected foe, the PLO, as they began to build civic institutions. Tensions between the outside PLO and the local leadership date back, in fact, to the mid-1970s. An article in the PLO's academic journal in 1976, for example, commented, it would be a big mistake if we pushed the establishment of a leadership framework within the occupied land. 6. During the Intifada, these tensions grew even worse. Tunis-based officials worried that the success of self-appointed leaders in the Terry, Tories, sustaining the uprising through local popular committees, would undermine the central authority of the PLO. Already, the characteristic pattern that would occur in the post-Oslo period was evident during the Intifada, the PLO increasingly fragmented the institutions created within civil society. The PLO's maxim was, the stronger territorial, local, movements become, 
the weaker and smaller scale the public institutions in the territory must be, 7. Because of its own fear of competitors for leadership, the PLO thwarted the construction of a civil society that broadly linked the towns and villages of the West Bank and Gaza Strip in favor of Khan, tinyed fragmentation. With the construction of the Palestine Authority, it began to take upon itself large portions of the functions that these associations of civil society had previously fulfilled. Indeed, within the framework of the Palestine Authority, different ministries were established precisely for this purpose, health, welfare, education, higher education, media, and so on. But the new government offices did not always garner the same sort of respect that the organizations of civil society did. Often, particular agencies became identified with the people who headed them, loyalists to the president. The state was much less efficient and actually provided fewer services than did the voluntary organizations. In these circumstances, the old PLO opposition to the emerging civil leadership intensified under the rule of the Palestine Authority, as it tried to impose its centralized power hierarchy on a popular, shin in which day-to-day -day authority was located at the grassroots, Arafat and his aides set out to undercut the autonomous. Authority of the new university produced secular leadership through co-optation, coercion, and forced marginalization, eight lead, errors of civic organizations, for example, were all too often hauled off to explain their actions to force 17 security officials. In 1995, the General Security Forces, al Karbat al amr circulated a cues, shenair to all the voluntary organizations, in an attempt to learn about their members, the internal structure of the organizations, their goals, means of operation, and funding sources. The question, ne'er had a chilling effect on institutions of civil society. It did not bode well for the development of democracy among the Palestinians. Much of the energy and attention of Arafat and his staff, then, was channeled into their attempt to curb the local leadership. Their success in neutering the new local leaders came, ironically, through allying with the old notable leadership and starving the new leader, ship's organizational base, the relief organizations, many of the medical, neighborhood associations, and, especially, the popular committees that had been the backbone of the Intifada, by keeping firm control of revenues, especially foreign aid. Fear of competitors for leadership from the impressive group that had emerged from Palestine's universities and Israel's prisons, in effect, led Arafat and his aides in the Palestine Authority to dismantle, rather than build, Palestine's emerging civil society. The attitude of the par leadership toward the educated secular leaders was part and parcel of its general orientation, which was to treat any domestic opposition as an enemy to be put down with force. 9. It is not surprising, then, that par officials doled out similar treatment to the second center of power in society, which had also matured during the Intifada, the Islamic groups. Spurred on by the revolution in Iran and the continuing oppressiveness of Israeli occupation, Hammers, in particular, took big strides in the 1980s in linking different elements of Palestinian Muslim society in the territories. It succeeded in appealing to a couple of key social elements, which had previously not been politically mobilized. First were those pales, Tinyans in the West Bank and Gaza Strip who, like Arab citizens of Israel in the 1950s and 1960s, faced the disorienting process of change from peasant life to that of the Dalabora. Second were Muslims, especially those in refugee camps who, during the 1980s, showed a marked increase in religious practice, such as modest dress, daily prayer, fasting, Quranic recitation, and more. The growth in the importance of Islam in the refugee camps was even faster than for the Palestinian population as a whole, which also showed marked increases in religiosity, and the new rely, just groups paid special attention to the camps. As had been the case for the secular local leaders, the universities also provided a nurturing environment for the new Islamic move, meant. Indeed, it was the support garnered by the Muslim brethren and then hammers among intellectuals, especially in the universities, that so alarmed secular PLO leaders. Once the Intifada began, the struggle between the PLO and Islamic groups intensified. One Hammer's leader, Mahmoud al-Zarar, for example, lambasted the PLO publicly in 1991, citing that corruption in the PLO, 
and its misuse of funds, 10 The Palestine National Council's declaration of a Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza in 1988, implicitly AC, accepting Israel's acceptance, was perhaps the pivotal event in driving a deep wedge between the PLO and the Islamic groups. Hammers Khan demmed this shift, as it later did the Madrid Conference in 1991 and the Oslo Accord in 1993. The idea of territorial concessions to Israel, of two states coexisting in Palestine, was anathema to the entire Islamic movement. 11 division on this basic principle, in effect, whether to accept partition of the territory that had once been Brit, Ish controlled Palestine, continued into the 21st century and the Al Aqsa Intifada, a term that itself had deep religious signal significance. Once the Declaration of Principles was signed in 1993, Hammersby came the foremost opposition in the West Bank and Gaza Strip to accommodation with Israel. It made unequivocal disparaging state mens about the agreement and Arafat's role in signing it. We can cider this to be a great historic act of treason and a dangerous one which will begin the dissolution of this leadership which has sold the struggle, sold the blood and sold the rights of the Palestinian people, 12 but its relationship both to Oslo and the Palestine or authority was more complex than this statement lets on. Hammers came to be divided between two camps. First were those who favoured, at least during the initial stage of euphoria and great hopes, integration with Arafat's popularly supported regime, piggybacking, they hoped, onto the emerging widespread image of the Palestine or authority as the appropriate government for Palestinians. Second were those who advocated sticking with the traditional goals of holy war against the Jews, liberation of the Holy Land, and, only then, establishment of a theocratic Islamic state. 13. At times, Hammer's officials accepted the reality of the new frame. Work created by the Oslo Accord and made concessions to it and the Palestine Authority. Some in the Islamic movement sought integra, shin into the Sultan, the regime, which would force Fater to take them into consideration and grant them an appropriate position and influence within the new Palestine Authority. That meant wreck, onishin, appropriate representation in national institutions, conservation of the traditional nature of Palestinian society, and, mostly, positions and budget allocations. For those opposing the agreements, renewal of guerrilla warfare was intended to bring about the breakdown of the agreements with Israel and prove that the Palestine Authority did not rule the territories, nor could it provide Israel with its most cherished goal, security. While neither camp among the Islamic groups ever wavered in the rejection of a two-state permanent solution, in the belief that Israel must ultimately be destroyed, some members did accept the notion of Liber, adding Palestine in steps, which meant approval of a Palestinian state in a portion of Palestine, and thus, implicitly, the acceptance of Israel, at least temporarily. We accept that there is government in Palestine and beside it the government of Israel for now. But in the future, we don't accept that, 14 Their acknowledgement of the institutions coming out of the Oslo Accord as at least partially legitimate, mate can be seen in the fact that some Hamas-affiliated candidates, running as individuals, even won election to the Palestine author, it is Legislative Council in 1996. Further complicating the Palestine Authority's relationship to this opposition was the transformation of Hamas and the Islamic Jihad into the primary threat in Israeli officials' minds a turn around from the early years of the Intifada, when these officials of 10 courted hammers in order to weaken the uprising's internal and external secular leadership. For par leaders, Israel's new perception that hammers was the biggest threat portended that any action par se, security forces might take against the Islamic organizations would be construed by Palestinians as doing Israel's bidding. Not only did the Islamic movement draw par officials' energy and attention away from the Oslo process, then, it also heightened the spectre that the Palestine Authority was nothing but a shill for is, rail and could never be the basis of a truly autonomous state. Beyond that, Hammers and Islamic Jihad's success in perpetrating acts of terror against Israel through the entire Oslo process and beyond made the Israeli public and its leaders feel that the Palestine or Thorite was not doing nearly enough to curb these groups and thus was not a trustworthy partner for peace. Many began to suspect that the Palestine Authority leaders, especially Arafat, were playing a double game through a complicit division of labor between the PAR and the Islamic groups. 
Early in the peace process, between the 6th of April 1994 and the 21st of August 1996, Hamas and the Islamic Jihad organization succeeded in carrying out a series of terrorist attacks in Israel's major cities, the most serious of these coming in early 1996, only months after the Asasai nation of Rabin. Tens of people were killed and hundreds wounded. These attacks fueled what had been a relatively dormant internal opposition in Israel and eroded the legitimacy of the Nasenpal, Estein Authority and of Arafat himself in Israeli eyes. The core, donated security between Israeli and Palestinian security forces, which was anchored in the agreements between the two sides and was, from the standpoint of the Israeli government and public opinion, ion, a necessary condition for continuation of the process, began to seem purposeless. In Israeli eyes, the Palestine Authority was either unable or unwilling to act against fellow Palestinians, because it feared the start of a Palestinian civil war. At the very best, as far as Israelis were concerned, the Islamic movement held a veto power over the reconciliation process between the Israelis and the Palestinians because of the Palestine Authority's inability to curb the Milai tans. At the very worst, the Palestine Authority was explicitly or implicitly sanctioning this violence, in direct violation of its pledge in the Oslo Accord, in order to bring pressure on Israel to make greater concessions. Whatever the exact relationship of the par top brass to hammers. The loss of life among Israeli citizens and the massive damage in the central areas of the big cities undercut the positive public opinion, favoring the Oslo and Cairo agreements, which led to Israel's redeployment in Gaza and Jericho in the first year of the peace process. The attacks also helped revive the opposition in Israel, which had been stunned into relative silence when Oslo was first announced, in part because of the relief and hope with which so much of the public greeted the accord. Now the attacks seem to validate the opposition's claims that this is not a peace. The public support so desperately needed for the Israelis to continue on with the Oslo pro cess eroded quickly, further magnifying the difficulties of keeping a coalition together. Indeed, the bombings were a major factor lead into the electoral defeat of Perez, the most pro-Oslo of all Israeli politicians, to Netanyahu, an outspoken foe of the peace process. Israel's harsh retaliation to the terror, in turn, chipped away at the Palestinian public's backing for Oslo. Each attack brought an Israeli riposte, including closures and enclosures that barred the movement of Palestinian labor into Israel as well as much of the movement within the West Bank and Gaza Strip. Nothing else Israel did in the West Bank and Gaza Strip caused as much hardship to Palestinians and ensuing political instability in Palestinian politics as did its policy of repeated closures. Hammer's bombings in the mid-1990s led to a new addition to the Israeli lexicon, the concept of separation, which created yet an other threat to the peace process. It involved an intentional reduction in the minimum of contact between the Israeli and Palestinian population, without giving up Israeli military control over the pal Estonians. Physical barriers included wire fences, mined areas, and reserved areas patrolled by military and police forces. In its first stage, the program was put into effect around the Gaza Strip, Al, though Jewish settlements and large military forces meant to protect them remained within the Strip. The psychological rationale of the program was that, after so many years of deep-seated ethnic conflict, wounds could not be healed by any means other than total separation of the two peoples. From the Palestinian point of view, the construction of these segmenting barriers, cutting so many Palestinian workers off from access to their jobs, just rain forced what they began to see as the apartheid character of the Israeli state. The vicious cycle of Palestinian terrorist acts and Israeli retalia. Shin worsened the economic situation for the residents of the occupied territories. In the Gaza Strip, there were reports of monetary, shin, even of starvation, making Palestinian politics more volatile and the Palestinian public more skeptical about the worth of the Oslo process. 15 The brazen attacks brought about a rise in the press of the Islamic resistance movement and the development of the image of a new Palestinian hero and Shaheed. The most famous was Yahya Ayish, also known as the engineer, who reputedly was re-sponsible for the preparation and direction of most of the attacks. 
His eventual assassination by Israeli intelligence placed him first among a pantheon of martyrs, mostly youngsters who began a S.E. Reese of suicide bombings in 1994. It also reopened the door to deadly bombings in Israel in early 1996, which apparently had been Sue's, pended by hammers for a good part of 1995. In terms of the attractiveness of cultural symbols, electoral app, peel, and threats to the peace process, the Islamic center of power posed a formidable challenge to the Palestine Authority. But ARA, FAT's options for dealing with this challenge were limited. In the first couple of years of the Palestine Authority, at least, it simply did not have efficient enough intelligence agencies to eliminate the attacks on Israel, which, in addition to all else, threatened the PA's author, Itty and very existence. Also, arresting cultural heroes and going after those considered near saints by portions of the population held their own dangers for Arafat. Using his security men, such as those in Force 17, which he had brought to Palestine with him, against the Islamic groups also had pitfalls. These security forces faced an uphill battle in gaining public trust, many local Palestinians saw the new security men, many of them born abroad, almost as foreigners. Their status as outsiders was exacerbated by a cultural and generational gap as well, Arafat's security men tended to be 10 or 20 years older than the key secular and religious leaders who were prof ing to be so popular. The danger of confronting the Islamic groups directly became Obvious to Arafat when violence quickly erupted between the Pales, Tyne Authority and the Islamic movement once the PLO's leadership relocated to Palestine. When the Palestine Authority announced a wholesale collection of firearms, ammunition, and other instruments of war from the population, the Islamic groups objected out, right. On the 22nd of November 1994, shortly after the PLO's assumption of power, a bloody clash broke out in Gaza between the PAR militia and local residents, who were demonstrating for hammers and against the Oslo process. PAR forces fired on the crowd and killed a number of people, accounts run from 13, 16 dead, and injured many others, the estimates run as high as 200 wounded. Arafat took a public reeler, Shin's beating and, as a result, attempted thereafter to avoid overt, 6, Oland conflict with Hamas and Islamic Jihad, which, of course, led Israelis, in turn, to question his commitment to Oslo. As with the secular opposition, his emerging tactic was to divide and control the Islamic groups through political and economic cooptation, particularly by doling out posts and favors. Despite his efforts, though, other violent clashes did occur over the years. Whatever the means power officials used to cope with the Islamic challenge from 1994 on, they found that dealing with the formidable Islamic opposition constantly constrained, diverted, and undermined them during the years of difficult negotiations with Israel. If the internecine struggle, in which Arafat attempted to wrest authority from the local educated leadership and their civil institutions as well as divide and coop the powerful Islamic movement, were not enough, power leaders had to deal with a third center of power, Israel, not only as a negotiating partner, but as a continue, in governing presence in the territories as well. Israel's forces still maintained control of key elements of governance throughout the West Bank and Gaza Strip, full control in Area C, security in Area B, control of key roads, access through ports and the new airport, travel between the West Bank and Gaza Strip, and more. From the early years of the occupation, Israeli officials, Wittingly and Unwit, Tingly, became players in struggles of power within Palestinian society. Israel, as we noted, had encouraged the Islamic movement at the expense of the PLO early in the Intifada. Similarly, while most of Israel's attention was directed toward neutralizing outside threats from Fatah and other violent groups during the 1970s and 1980s, the Israeli civil and military leadership also tried, without much success, thwarting the development of centers of authority headed by the new, secular local leaders in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. Glenn Robinson, who studied the first Intifada, wrote that, rather than stymie the new secular elite, the Israelis unwittingly abetted the creation of this new group of leaders. Israel, by grudgingly allowing Palestinian universities to open and ex-pand 
ironically assisted in the formation of a new political elite drawn from a far broader stratum of Palestinians than the narrowly based notable elite of earlier generations. Because of the very size of this new elite, Israeli attempts to vanquish it, through deportations, encouraged emigration, imprisonment, extended closures of univer, cities, and the like, proved futile.16. Now, with the creation of the Palestine Authority, Israel continued to have a major impact on how power in Palestinian society and politics was paused. It controlled everything from the revenue flow going to the Palestine Authority through remittance of collected taxes to travel of Palestinians to jobs in Israel and within Pargov, earned territory. The result of its continued hulking presence was to focus the Palestinian leadership on daily irritants in its relations with Israel as well as its need to demonstrate domestic control in the face of its emasculation by Israel, instead of the bigger picture of a final status agreement. Israel's continuing role in day-to-day gov, and it's also meant that Arafat could never satisfactorily respond to his critics' question of whether the new Palestinian government re-Ali governed. The Palestine Authority's preoccupation with delegitimizing other centers of authority and countering Israel in day-to-day govern, Nance led it to employ all sorts of tactics that were anathema to institution building. One scholar summarized its techniques as falling into three categories, concentration of power, surveillance, intimate dashin, and largesse that purchases quiet and supporters, brib, airy, dot, 17 Another researcher referred to its engaging in the institution, alization instead of state building, 18 Any institutions that it did build were undermined by yet other institutions that it fashioned, civil courts by security courts, police forces by official and semi-official militias, non-governmental, service organizations by so-called shadow ministries, the semi-official development agency Pector, Palestinian Economic Council for Development and Reconstruction, with presidential control of development funds, a separation of the legislature and executive by an incorporation, read, kupta, shin, of legislators into executive functions, and much, much more. Human rights abuses intimidated the opposition. 19 one patent seemed to be the transfer of everyday control to local strongmen. From among the old notables, who, although in name represent, in the Palestine Authority and the President, in fact acted on their own. Deinstitutionalization went hand in hand with Arafat's personal style of rule. His regime, notes one writer, could be labeled semi authoritarian, with personalization circling around UC Arafat al lowing patronage relations and weakened institutions. 20 Another researcher comments on Arafat's style by writing Elatat say Arafat. He added, the personalization of politics directly undermined the core political strength of the new, secular, elite, which was called collective action through institution building, 21 beyond undermining his own institutions, Arafat had a pangshan for playing musical chairs with his aides, which prevented anyone below him from concentrating enough loyalty and strength through an extended stint in a key agency to challenge him, and, as a result, from concentrating enough power to build effective institutions. Many key figures, such as Basim Abu Sharif, Hani al-Hassan, and Mahmoud Abbas, simply disappeared from politics or were shifted to less powerful posts. In many ways, Arafat resembled a New York professional dog, Walker, who constantly reigned in some and let the leash out for us, errs, all in an effort not to be dragged into the gutter himself. The F effect on Palestinian politics was to preempt transparent procedures, shuffle talent around in a way that undermined institutional stability and strength, and keep Arafat's attention on day-to-day political machinations, the street curb in front of him, instead of on the broader horizon, the long-term, delicate Oslo process. Repeated interruptions and absence of arbiters. The shift from the Madrid to the Oslo framework was momentous. It removed the negotiations from Washington's harsh glare and the pangshang of the negotiators on both sides to posture for the press instead of addressing those sitting across the table. The switch put Fater and the PLO, the key Palestinian organizations, directly into the bargaining process, rather than having their officials whisper. Ing into the ears of quasi-autonomous Palestinian negotiators from the West Bank and Gaza Strip. In addition, the Oslo talks gave the Palestinian side independent standing for the first time, 
rather than as an adjunct of the Jordanian delegation. In short, the sessions in Oslo put Israeli and Palestinian negotiators together on the same level for person-to-person -person talks in a way that had not happened before. While, for some time later, a number of Palestinian-American intellectuals maintained the illusion that success had been just around the corner in the Washington talks in 1992-1993, in fact the Norwegians had rightly seen that the Madrid framework was a dead end. But the Norwegians' success in bringing the parties into frank, direct talks on an equal footing, without the intervention of the United States, created a different series of obstacles, too. A key prob, LAM was the absence of an official, credible intermediary with sufficient clout to change the behavior of both sides. Almost immediately after the signing of the Declaration of Principles, the two sides began a litany of complaints that the other side was not living up to the terms of the signed agreement. Periodically, through the next seven years, the Israeli government and the Palestine Authority released statements specifying the other side's transgressions of the Oslo Accord and, later, of the interim agreement and subsequent pacts. Many of Israel's charges involved the ballooning of the NUM, Burr of officers in the PAR security forces. The Oslo Agreement's origi, Nali permitted 9,000 police officers and later expanded that to 18,000, but the actual number by the beginning of the Alexer Inti, farther in the various PAR security forces probably reached 45,000. The Palestine Authority, in turn, accused the Israeli government of fail in to meet one deadline after another for redeployment and withdrawal from specified territory. Even when the Oslo process was considered dead by most, after the breakdown of the Tabar talks in January 2001 and the escalation of horrible violence, the two sides continued to charge that each side was breaking this or that provi, shorn of their agreements. The strength of the process, the unmediated talks between pales. Tinian and Israeli officials, also turned out to be its weakness. No. Mechanism was built into the Declaration of Principles for Arbitra, Shun when charges flew back and forth that the agreements pro v. science were being breached. While the United States played an infor, mal role for most of the 1990s, it did not have the official status that it had had in the Madrid framework and was often reluctant to in, turvin in spiffs. Without an arbitrator or mediator, each side re sorted to threats of suspending, and actually suspending, negocia, shuns when it felt the other side had egregiously disregarded Oslo's terms. Interruptions in negotiations became more common than actual talks. Already, by December 1993, a mere three months after the his, Tarek signing, the process was deadlocked. The first deadline of that month, for the beginning of the Israeli pullout from Gaza and Jerry, Cho, was missed. In February 1994, Israeli settler Barak Goldstein's rampage in Hebron killing Muslim worshippers led PAR officials to withdraw from the negotiations temporarily. Islamic groups began their own series of attacks in Israel two months later as a response to the massacre. And so it went. Anti-Oslo militants on both sides discovered a dirty little secret, they had virtual veto power over the negotiations, because every outrageous act that they perpetrated brought yet another interruption, another setback to the peace process. With each new Palestinian terrorist act, Israel not only engaged in a new wave of arrests, it imposed closures, enclosures, house demolitions, and other collective punishments over the areas of par control as well as on those areas that remained under Israeli control. Israel delayed carrying out for their stages of the agreements, transfer of additional areas to the Palestine Authority, release of prisoners, authorization of movement between the West Bank and Gaza for students, transfer of tax funds to the par and right of passage for Palestinian workers M, ployed in Israel, which also frequently brought the peace process to a halt. In particular, the failure of both Netanyahu and Barak to hand over additional land after the Y Agreement of 1998 was signed made Palestinians extremely skeptical that any final status accord would actually be implemented. The collective punishments Israel administered led to economic stagnation and contraction in the territories, further eroding public support for the peace process. By the year 2000, 
Israeli officials had lost confidence in the Palestinian Authority's willingness and ability to rein in Islamic groups and began systematically assassinating individuals it considered to be behind attacks on Israel, following the precedent it had set with the murder of Yahya Ayish for years ear, liar. This policy further fanned Palestinians' hatred and distrust, making it more and more difficult for the two parties to move ahead in negotiations. As it became clear that the 1999 deadline for a final status agreement would not be met, Arafat announced that he would unilaterally and officially declare a state in the lands con, trolled by the Palestine Authority, fanning similar sentiments on the Israeli side. With no mechanism for arbitration, each side acted on its own to punish the other's perceived transgression of the agreements and, in so doing, hurt its own standing with the other side as a trustworthy partner. These interruptions stemming from accusations that the ad. Versary was not living up to the terms of agreements were calm, pounded on the Israeli side by recurring flirtations with Syria. As mentioned, every Israeli prime minister from the signing of the talks in 1993 through their breakdown in early 2001 stepped back from negotiations with the Palestine Authority in order to pursue an agreement with the Syrians. Probably, none of these initiatives involving Syria was more damaging to the Palestinian-Israeli peace process than the one undertaken by Barak after he was elected in 1999. It was a moment in which the stars were lined up for a possible breakthrough in the negotiations. Barak, coming from Israel's Lar, or party, replaced Netanyahu, who had repeatedly expressed his dislike of the Oslo process. While Barak had expressed his own strong reservations about Oslo as Rabin's chief of staff, he entered office on a platform of pursuing a final status agreement with the Palestinians. Beyond that, the United States had a second-term president. The likelihood of a first-term U.S. president pushing hard for each side to make the necessary concessions was small, especially after the two first-term presidents who did lean hard on the negotiating. Parties to secure Middle East progress, Jimmy Carter and the first George Bush, had not been re-elected. It became a maxim in Amory, can politics that American Jewish voters and other voters backing Israel did not respond positively to Israel's being leaned on, even if the result was as positive as the Egyptian-Israeli peace treaty. Bill Clinton, as a second-term president, did not have these concerns about re-election. Moreover, from 1993 on, he developed a deeper, sonal commitment to achieving Middle East peace. These factors indicated that the moment for serious negotiations on a peace agreement between Palestinians and Jews, after more than three quarters of a century of clashes, might be at hand. But it was at that very moment that Barak, with Clinton's apparent sup, port, backed away from negotiations with the Palestinians in order to enter into a prolonged dance with Hulfez al-Assad, the Syrian president. In the end, with Clinton meeting directly with Assad in Geneva and pressuring him mightily, the Syrians rejected the Israeli overture. But valuable time had been lost. By the time Barak turned back to the Palestinian issue in spring 2000, Clinton was near the end of his term. He no longer had the clout he had had a year before. The hastily convened last-ditch effort at Camp David in July 2000, in the summer of the Democratic and Republican nominat, in conventions for the next president, left almost no margin for error. The Declaration of Principles had set out a clear timetable and agenda for talks that would lead to a final status agreement. The timetable was intended to keep the negotiations on track. One of the most positive achievements of the Oslo process was how close the parties came to living up to the timetable for the interim agree meant it was adopted in later September 1995, only two months be, yawned the official deadline. But already then storm clouds hung over the entire process. Without an officially designated third party to deal with charges from one side or the other, Israel and the Palestine Authority themselves applied sanctions directly to one another, of, ten in the form of temporarily withdrawing from the talks. Quickly enough, those who wanted the talks to fail, the hardline opposi, shin on each side, learned that they could sabotage the process. Through acts that made the parties themselves suspend negotiations. These interruptions, along with those caused by Israel's re-curring flirtation with Syria, subverted the Oslo process, 
putting tremendous pressure on both sides as the final deadline was up, approached, and then extended. Misreading of the public on each side. Underlying all the reasons for the failure of the peace process was the nature of state society relations on each side. The best place to start looking for answers as to what went wrong is at the grassroots level. Leaders on both sides frequently misjudged the amount of popular support that they would need in order to proceed with agreements and misread how much support actually existed in the public for a two state solution. They underestimated how much the process could affect the public and how much, in turn, the affected public could shape leadership and the state of the negotiations. And, for much of the eight year period of negotiations, they were in sensitive to the delicate public private balance that any negotiations demand. Negotiations generally have a double two faced component. The first two faced element involves conveying one set of messages to the adversary, in private, and the opposite to one's constituency, publicly. To the opponent sitting across the conference table, Nego, theaters whine that it is they who are making all the meaningful con sessions while the adversary is not negotiating in good faith, not offering anything of value. At the same time, these negotiators pub, likely trumpet their gains to their constituents, don't worry. We are making only the most minor concessions to our adversaries, in no way are we retreating from our core aims. The second two faced component comes in regards to these same constituents. As Nagoti, etters are reassuring the public about how little of true value they are giving up, they also need to be preparing constituents for the AC, actual, difficult concessions that will be made. One political science theory speaks of the difficult process of making taboo subjects and red lines, for example, not giving up an inch of our birthright, into questions of public debate, such as, should we give up land? Should we swap land? How much? 22. Both Israeli and Palestinian leaders failed to address their public sufficiently in the course of negotiations and, when they did, they did very little to prepare their constituencies for the painful upcome in concessions. Barak, for example, repeatedly promised the Indi, visibility of Jerusalem, keeping from the public any hint of the sorts of compromises that his government was eventually willing to make, including ceding Arab populated portions of the city and control over what Israelis call the Temple Mount, Har Harbayat, to the Palestine Authority. Jewish public opinion in Israel and in the diaspora was simply not sufficiently prepared for the far reaching historical compromises that the Barak government proposed in 2000. The failure to lay the groundwork among Jews was particularly evident in the issues of full, or nearly full, withdrawal from the West Bank. Israeli leaders repeatedly spoke in terms of unrealistic percentages of the territories that would go to the Palestinians, ranging from 40 to 80 percent, Palestinian control over the Islamic holy shrines in Jerusalem, and the need to take moral and political responsibility for the Nakba. The Palestinian leaders were even worse in managing information to the public than Israeli ones. They did not purposely leak or dis, cuss, in a way that would generate public debate, key concessions that they would have to make, a changed meaning of the right of return from physical return to compensation for most refugees, the possibility of acceptance of a limited number of Jewish settlements, the possibility of land swaps, compromises on Jerusalem, S.E., curity concessions to Israel that would cut into the new state's SOV, Rin power, and more. Of particular sensitivity was the full right of return for refugees and their offspring, today numbering 3.5 mil, lion, to the localities from which they had been uprooted during the 1948 war and full compensation for their suffering and lost property. 23 Many of the villages that the refugees yearned for have long since disappeared or are now inhabited by Jews who have trans, formed them totally. Israeli Jews have seen massive return as tanter. Mount to the destruction of their state. The Palestinian leadership knew all this very well. But the issue was never debated in Palestine, Ian society and it was not once raised during all the talks held between 1992 and Camp David. When the time came to make those concessions in late 2000 and early 2001, Arafat felt that Palestinians were not ready for such far-reaching compromises. In fact, even before he went to Camp David, he cautioned that the Palestinians were not prepared for what the talks would bring. Perhaps he was right. But if he was, it was B. 
cause of his own earlier lack of leadership in preparing the ground properly, either in terms of the private negotiations with the Israelis or in terms of the Palestinian public. To his constituents, he showed only one face, the triumphant hero who would win for the Palestinians everything for which they had longed. Similar to Rabin and Barak, he did not expose the second face, the leader preparing his people for difficult losses in addition to the gains. Arafat's weakness at the end of the long path of negotiations re, salted in part because of his own short-sighted style of leadership, the dog-walker style he employed. But structural factors, ones built into the Oslo process and the creation of the Palestine Authority, led him to fear putting trust in his constituents, in their capacity to handle the bad news as well as the good. What were these FAC tours? For leaders to accept an agreement in which concessions are backloaded, as they were in the Oslo Agreement, requires sustaining people's confidence in the interim that the nation's true aims will be realized in the end. Leaders have to convince their followers to keep the faith. But each new concession to Israel by Arafat and his lieutenants from 1993 on brought an erosion in Palestinians' beliefs that they would ever reach their goals. Arafat, personally, and the Palestine Authority, generally, faced deteriorating approval ratings, especially after 1995, as the Palestinian population increasingly lost confidence in their ability to induce the Israelis to make the Nisses, three concessions. With violence as the only lever that Palestinians could see to X. Tracked concessions from Israel, they ironically supported the peace process in high numbers and, at the same time, the use of violence. Against Israel. For example, in late 2001, a survey indicated that 71% of Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza supported a re turn to Israel Palestine negotiations while 61% stated that armed confrontations helped achieve Palestinian rights in ways that negotiations could not. 24 The growing belief in the efficacy of VIO, Lens, which showed up in polls from late 1995 on, demonstrated a faltering faith that negotiations alone could accomplish what the Palestinian people wanted. By the summer of 2002, the Palestinian public may have been losing faith in violence as a mechanism to achieve their national goals. A poll in August of that year indicated that nearly two-thirds felt that a new approach was needed, and 72-92% supported the use of various sorts of non-violent action. 25 Arafat also continually gave mixed messages because of his conflicting aims of building a sense of Palestinism, which would be linked in the public's mind to his new government, the Palestine Authority, and making the Oslo process work. In trying to construct a national identity around the Palestine Authority, Arafat and his aides dragooned the print, radio, and television media into his efforts, building the collective identity on the basis of its opposition to the other, the Israelis.26 but it became very difficult to sustain a portrayal of Israel as both the dispossessing enemy and the partner who would deliver the key backloaded benefits of Oslo, a sovereign state, Jerusalem, and the right of return. This dilemma intensified when the peace process slowed noticeably after the assassination of Rabin. A harsh lesson learned by the leaders of both Israel and the Pales, Tyne Authority in the endgame talks in summer and fall of 2000 and January 2001 was that negotiations could not succeed without pop, Euler support. The structure of the Oslo Agreement with its symbol, ants of power between the negotiating partners, the front-loading of benefits for Israel and back-loading for Palestinians, inadvertently cut the legs out from beneath the continuing Oslo process. It eroded the backing of the public that the process needed in order to succeed, and it opened the door for the relegitimization of violence as a tool for Palestinians to achieve their goals. The resumption of violence, of course, only further undercut the public's belief that the process would succeed. And, for Israelis, the violence eroded faith. That Arafat and the Palestine Authority could be a trustworthy NE negotiating partner. Finally, negotiations demand that officials from each side indi, directly and directly address the public from the other side. As we have seen, at the celebration of the signing of the Declaration of Principles, spokespeople for both sides explicitly reassured their counter parts about their long-term intentions. At least in part, those state mens were aimed over the heads of the people sitting at the dinner to the larger public on the other side. 
Those toasts by Palestinian and Israeli officials addressed the primal fear of the other. But once the festivities were over, the leaders paid far too little attention to sustaining public support across the divide. To be sure, there were moments, such as Arafat's visit to Rabin's widow after the assassination, but these were few and far between. Israeli leaders' insensitivity to the issue of Jewish settlements in the West Bank and Gaza Strip and their penchant for collective punishment, closures, general echo, nomic sanctions, mass deportation, hassles at border crossings, ret, ribution against relatives and towns from which terrorists came, all led to the resurfacing of Palestinians' primal fear that the Israelis were bent on permanent control over them and the territories. It was of little wonder, then, when Barak made an offer at Camp the Vid in 2000 that he and most Israelis saw as historic and far-reach, in Palestinians assimilated it as just another recipe for permanent neocolonial rule over the Palestinians by Israel. Arafat, too, misjudged the importance of taking account of his Israeli public sentiments. His reluctance to clamp down on those in tent on torpedoing the peace process, his willingness even to allow violence by Islamic groups as a means of stepping up the pressure on Israel, raised the Israeli primal fear. More and more, Israelis felt denied the major public goods that the peace process was supposed to bring them, acceptance as a legitimate state and personal and collective security. And they began to feel that the Palestinians would never be satisfied, Oslo or no Oslo, until Israel were wiped off the map. Later, the al aqsa Intifada was seen by many Israel, Lees as confirmation of Palestinians' determination not to accept a compromise because of the deep-seated commitment to destroy Israel. Failure to achieve economic well-being for Palestinians Both sides recognized that the ability of the Palestine Authority to take root in the West Bank and Gaza Strip and, indeed, the ultimate success of the Oslo process rested on an improvement in the quality and standard of living of Palestinians in the territories. 27 A decade prior to Oslo had seen a marked upswing in Palestinians' economic fortunes. Oil prices had been high, which meant plenty of money flowing from Palestinians in the Gulf states back to their families in the territories. Others profited from work in Israel, with often mull, tipple jobs in a single family. By 1987, these jobs accounted for a whopping 28% of the GNP of the territories. New cars, Tel Aviv, Sean and Tenors, and houses appeared all over the West Bank. But the mid-1980s turned out to be the economic heyday for Pal, Estonians in the territories. Their standard of living had already deteriorated badly by the time of the signing on the White House lawn in 1993. The fall in oil prices, the Intifada, and an end of remittances from Palestinians in Kuwait, who were expelled at the end of the Gulf War, were the chief culprits in precipitating a sharp downturn in the economy. Still, hopes were high at the time of the signing of the Declaration of Principles, largely due to promises of an influx in capital from outside contributions and loans for the development of economic infrastructure and social institutions. Just weeks after the Oslo signing, 43 states gathered in Washington to pledge billions in aid. The entire peace process was premised on the assumption that both sides had an economic interest in making peace work, and, if mutual economic interests did not yet exist, then they could and should be created. More than anyone, Perez, with his vision of a new Middle East, personified this assumption. 28 Some sociologists even saw the process through the wider perspective of globalization with peace linking the region to the wider global economy, which would be in the interests of Israeli, Arab, and international Indus. Try.29 There was an economic euphoria that overlooked the obstacles caused by long-term hatred and ethnic divisions. In addition, L. Mens of the Palestinian leadership and social elite, like others in neighboring Arab countries, feared such an approach and viewed it as a sort of economic colonization, which would replace direct Israeli military rule in the region with indirect technological and economic control. In any case, these lofty ideas for economic integration were fall, load by equally lofty promises of new inflows of capital to the fledgling Palestine Authority. By October 1993, various donor states and agencies, including the World Bank and 40 countries, including the United States, European states, Arab states, and Japan, 
had promised inflows of $6.5 billion, with an actual transfer of $4.4 billion to be effected by 2001. Within a year, $195 per head, computed on an annual basis, had been transferred to the West Bank and Gaza Strip economy, the highest amount of per capita international aid ever awarded. The money was channeled almost entirely through the new pales, Tyne Authority, and the lion's share was kept to pay for the creation of new PAR institutions, 44% for the salaries of PAR employees of all kinds, 12.6% for the police, 11% for other governmental agencies. 30 There were also the beginnings of three way PAL, Estonian Jordanian Israeli economic initiatives, such as industrial parks, which took advantage of Israeli capital and knowledge to gather with Palestinian and Jordanian cheap labor. 31 Another source of new funds also came out of the Oslo process. According to the economic protocol of the agreement between the PLO and Israel signed in Paris in April 1994, 75% of taxes withheld from PAL, Estonians working in Israel was to be transferred to the PAR.32 Within a few years, the influx of capital and the beginnings of new economic projects began to bear some fruit throughout the West Bank and Gaza Strip. Both sides recognized that the ability of the Palestine Authority to take root in the West Bank and Gaza Strip and, indeed, the ultimate success of the Oslo process rested on an improvement in the quality and standard of living of Palestinians in the territories. 27 A decade prior to Oslo had seen a marked upswing in Palestinians' economic fortunes. Oil prices had been high, which meant plenty of money flowing from Palestinians in the Gulf states back to their families in the territories. Others profited from work in Israel, with often mall, tipple jobs in a single family. By 1987, these jobs accounted for a whopping 28% of the GNP of the territories. New cars, Tel Aviv, Sean and Tenors, and houses appeared all over the West Bank. But the mid 1980s turned out to be the economic heyday for PAL, Estonians in the territories. Their standard of living had already de deteriorated badly by the time of the signing on the White House lawn in 1993. The fall in oil prices, the Intifada, and an end of remittances from Palestinians in Kuwait, who were expelled at the end of the Gulf War, were the chief culprits in precipitating a sharp downturn in the economy. Still, hopes were high at the time of the signing of the Declaration of Principles, largely due to promises of an influx in capital from outside contributions and loans for the development of economic infrastructure and social institutions. Just weeks after the Oslo signing, 43 states gathered in Washington to pledge billions in aid. The entire peace process was premised on the assumption that both sides had an economic interest in making peace work, and, if mutual economic interests did not yet exist, then they could and should be created. More than anyone, Perez, with his vision of a new Middle East, personified this assumption. 28 Some sociologists even saw the process through the wider perspective of globalization, with peace linking the region to the wider global economy, which would be in the interests of Israeli, Arab, and international Indus. Try.29 There was an economic euphoria that overlooked the obstacles caused by long term hatred and ethnic divisions. In addition, L. Mens of the Palestinian leadership and social elite, like others in neighboring Arab countries, feared such an approach and viewed it as a sort of economic colonization, which would replace direct Israeli military rule in the region with indirect technological and economic control. In any case, these lofty ideas for economic integration were fall, load by equally lofty promises of new inflows of capital to the fledgling Palestine Authority. By October 1993, various donor states and agencies, including the World Bank and 40 countries, including the United States, European states, Arab states, and Japan, had promised inflows of $6.5 billion, with an actual transfer of $4.4 billion to be effected by 2001. Within a year, $195 per head, computed on an annual basis, had been transferred to the West Bank and Gaza Strip economy, the highest amount of per capita international aid ever awarded. The money was channeled almost entirely through the new pales, Tyne Authority, and the lion's share was kept to pay for the creation of new PAR institutions, 44% for the salaries of PAR employees of all kinds, 12.6% for the police, 
11% for other governmental agencies. 30 There were also the beginnings of three way PAL, Estonian Jordanian Israeli economic initiatives, such as industrial parks, which took advantage of Israeli capital and knowledge to gather with Palestinian and Jordanian cheap labor. 31 Another source of new funds also came out of the Oslo process. According to the economic protocol of the agreement between the PLO and Israel signed in Paris in April 1994, 75% of taxes withheld from PAL, Estonians working in Israel was to be transferred to the PAR.32 Within a few years, the influx of capital and the beginnings of new economic projects began to bear some fruit throughout the West Bank and Gaza Strip. But, even with some successes to point to, the Palestinian Econ, only from 1995, 2000 lagged far behind expectations, causing disappointment among the population. Several factors accounted for the economy's relatively poor performance, despite the great expector, shins generated, especially by the promise of huge new international investments. The gap between promised dollars from abroad and actual transfers was substantial. Continuing low oil prices curtailed the flow of cash from Arab oil exporters, as well as remittances from Palestinians working in oil exporting countries. International AGEN says held back money because of the absence of standard accounting procedures by the Arafat government. 33 In fact, rumors of rampant corruption associated with the names of PAR leaders discouraged both international aid and direct foreign investment. The whispering about corruption also lent strength to the Islamic opposition, contributed to demoralization of the population, and raised the level of crime. Additionally, tensions between the negotiating part, NERS, Israel and the Palestine Authority, slowed the flow of capital into the territories. In February 1997, Arafat estimated that Israel owed $1.3 billion to the Palestine Authority, mostly from taxes withheld on goods produced in the territories and social secu righty withheld from workers' salaries. 34 Continuing tensions also led Israel to turn down the PLO's request to open a central bank and print Palestinian money. 35. The redirection of international aid from Palestinian civic organizations to the Palestine Authority resulted in a rapid decrease in monetary support for the agencies in civil society providing social services. According to various estimates, annual support for the VAL, UNTRI organizations fell from $170, $240 million to $100, $120 mil, Lion. Precisely the people most in need of services suffered from these cutbacks, but the PAR leadership feared building up these civil organizations and continued to keep those foreign funds channeled through the Palestine Authority from them. 36 The establishment of the Palestine Authority seemed to worsen living conditions for the Palestinian population in the West Bank and Gaza Strip, rather than improve them. 37 Wealthy Palestinians in the Gerber had been expected to invest in development of the homeland. 38 But most of their private invest meant was in private construction, especially of expensive houses and service businesses, such as hotels, only a small amount went into industry. As security began to deteriorate, especially with the beginning of the cycle of Islamist attacks and Israeli retaliations and, later, with the reoccupation of the territories, so too did pre vate investments and the activity of international organizations, UN, till their funds dried up almost entirely after the beginning of the Al-Aqsa Intifada. For most of the population of the West Bank and Gaza Strip, the beginning of political autonomy had raised hopes for improvement in the quality of life. These hopes, however, went largely unrealized, with the possible exception of a thin stratum, which began to bloss, SOM as a result of the transfer of authority from Israeli military rule to the Palestine Authority.39 In fact, the opposite occurred. The stand, dart of living for most of the Palestinian population, especially in the Gaza Strip, fell after the beginning of the extended closures.40 beginning in the mid-1990s, as a result of continuing terrorist active ITs and retaliatory closures, about 95,000-150,000 Palestinian lar borers lost their jobs in Israel, and, with the implementation of the concept of separation, their places were filled by Asians and Eastern European laborists. 41 Palestinian per capita incomes actually declined. In each year following the Oslo Agreement, 
dropping by al most one quarter before stabilizing in 1998 by mid 1997 and uh, despite the disbursement of some 1.5 billion dollars in international aid more than two-thirds of palestinians expressed the view that the peace process had harmed the economy 42 the closures roy re ported led to a separation of the west bank and gaza economies and even within each of them patterns of economic autarky in addition to weakening links with the Israeli economy. 43. Compared to the economic situation after the outbreak of the Al Aksar Intifada in September 2000, the latter part of the 1990s now seem like halcyon days. The uprising inflicted a black hole recession on the territories, and a serious, but less severe, one on Israel, as well. In 2000 alone, there was a 12% drop in actual per person income and another 19% in 2001. The World Bank estimated that about three fifths of the PA's population was living below the poverty line in the midst of the Al Aqsa Intifada, and in Gaza, the fraction was as high as four fifths. The physical destruction and the destruction of par institutions prevented collection of taxes, and the Israeli refusal to transfer the taxes it collected brought about a loss of $305 million by December 2001. Only in mid-2002 did Israel begin to transfer small portions of this sum back to the Palestine Authority. But even more meaningful was the loss of $2.4 billion in gross national income. The economy simply ground to a halt at the beginning of the 21st century. In the summer of 2002, unemployment crept up incredibly to nearly 50% of the workforce. In short, the Oslo peace process was premised on a new economic dawn. Perhaps unrealistically, the new economy of the Palestine or authority was to emerge as integrated with, but not subservient to, the Israeli economy. It was to receive a shot in the arm from new inflows of capital from international organizations, Western donor can, tries, Israel itself, Arab state donors, private expatriate Palestinian and other foreign Arab investors, and direct foreign investment by Western corporations. Its own new institutions would collect taxes, and Israel would transfer revenues, as well. But, in the last half of the 1990s, a period when the world economy was in high gear, when globalization was creating unprecedented cross-border flows of capital, when Israel was experiencing a high-tech economic renaissance, and when Oslo temporarily transformed the Palestinians into the darlings of the international community, the Palestinian economy foundered and the quality of people's everyday life deteriorated. One researcher summed up the state of the economy in 2000, even before the flare-up of violence. External assistance has not established a viable economic system for Palestine, which remains geographically fragmented and heavily dependent on Israel for trade, labor export, and many other things. The Palestinian economy has yet to develop clear areas of comparative advantage and remains highly vulnerable to external shocks. There have been serious problems of institutional development. The PA's large public sector payroll, irregularities in the fiscal regime, and problems of corruption and off-the-books financing, through the monopolies, have all risen, in part, for political reasons. But whatever their short, term political utility to the regime, they all represent legacies that will weaken future economic development efforts. 44. The assumptions that promised a new economic dawn simply did not hold as the Oslo process stumbled forward. And when the peace talks finally came to a halt, replaced by the violence of the Al Aqsa Intifada, the Palestinian economy plummeted. The Road Back to Violence The Palestinian Popular Revolt quickly developed into a full-scale, intercommunal war blurring the distinction between front and rear, between civilians and fighters. During two years of escalating violence, between October 2000 and October 2002, more than 625 Israelis were killed in a total of 14,280 attacks. Some 1,380 Palestinians were killed by Israeli military forces and settlers. A total of 4,500 Israelis were injured in terrorist attacks, and the Palestinian Red Crescent Organization reported a total of 19,684 Palestinians wounded, although other groups have much higher estimates for the injured. 
All the dreams and agreements to change the currency of relationships between Palestinians and Israelis from violence to negotiations, to transform the essence of the relationship from EN, EMI to partner, all went up in flames. While immediate precipitants to the violence certainly existed, not least of which was Sharon's ill advised visit to Haram al Sharif at the end of September 2000, backed by over 100 barrack supplied security forces, the flaws in the Oslo process, particularly those that excluded the public or took it for granted, laid the groundwork. Even as frantic final status talks took place in Camp David and then in Sharm al Sheikh and Tabar, both in Egypt, and even as Prezai, Dent Clinton generated his own proposals to break the deadlock. Oslo was doomed. The skewed incentive structure with its front, loaded benefits for Israelis and backloaded promises for Palestine, Ians, the unstable and, consequently, short-sighted politics on both sides, the absence of a third party to whom each side could take its complaints, the loss of faith by Palestinians as their economic for tunes went down, and, probably what was most important of all, the failure to incorporate the public into the process, all prepared the ground for a new dance of death. It is ironic that the violence escalated at the end of a half-year of the most intensive, and seemingly productive, negotiations on final peace that Israelis and Palestinians had ever had. The course of these talks have been covered extensively elsewhere, suffice it to say here that, despite many subsequent recriminations, the two sides settled most of the outstanding issues between them. 45 The Clinton proposals in December 2000 set out in writing what the parties had actually agreed to and narrowed the choices of the still outstanding issues. Eventually, both sides accepted those proposals and, at Tabar, in early 2001, developed a comprehensive, non document, officially disowned by both sides, that will nonetheless be the template for any future settlement. By the end of January 2001, both sides were closer to agreement than ever before, as the Israeli and Palestinian negotiators themselves later acknowledged, but, at this point, the Palestinians were well into their new uprising and the fed-up is, Israeli electorate, a short time later, replaced Ayod Barak with Ariel Sharon. Negotiations ended for the foreseeable future. Israelis claimed there was no negotiating partner and some Palestinians again trumpeted the aim of a Palestinian state in all of Palestine. Each side revived the other's primal fear and existential anxiety. Ariel Sharon's provocative visit to Haram al-Sharif during the talks. On the status of Jerusalem was fuel for the fire, and, ironically, it served as a powerful recruitment tool for a renewed Palestinian rebellion. From the time of the massacre at Sabra and Shaitler during the Lebanon War in the 1980s, Sharon had become a symbol of his, Israeli oppression of Palestinians. 46 The youth took to the streets again now, threw stones, and burned Israeli and American flags. In Gaza, they tried to occupy settlements in the Netzarim enclave and, in the West Bank, stormed Jewish settlements. Israeli soldiers and settlers opened fire. An armed Palestinian militia men returned their own live fire, a marked departure from the earlier Intifada. Palestinians defined the new outbreak as a second Intifada, this time in defense of the Holy Al Aqsa Mosque, as national motives now mixed with religious symbols, as they did, increasingly, on the Israeli side, as well. The violence grew into a full fledged rebellion and thus became the fourth in the series of uprisings in Palestine joining the rebellion of 1834, the Great Arab Revolt in 1936, and the First Intifada in 1987, that framed the making of the Palestinian people. The al aqsa Intifada directed discontent not only at the Israeli occupation but also toward the inefficiency, corruption, and authoritarian rule of the Palestine Authority and its inability to bring about the expected economic development, rise in the stand, dart of living, and true liberation from Israeli occupation. The uprising also brought growing dissatisfaction with Arafat's leadership into the open. Aiming the people's wrath both outward and inward, the al aqsa Intifada was reminiscent of the Great Arab Revolt of 1936-1939. If it resembled the uprising against the British, it differed from the first rebellion against Israeli occupation. During that first Intifada, the Palestinians had strictly refrained from the use of firearms in order not to give the Israelis an excuse to use their overpowering military advantage and to preserve, 
as well, the popular color of the uprising. This time peaceful demonstrations and rock throwing were rare, because, among other reasons, the Israelis were no longer located among the major concentrations of the Palestinian popular, Shin, having redeployed in the course of the Oslo process. Instead, in the first stage, the Palestinians took up firearms against military personnel and settlers. The violence subsequently took an even more deadly turn as, again and again, Palestinian suicide bombers indiscriminately hit the civilian population within Israel's borders, with the Islamic movement, at first, usually taking responsibility. The growing use of human bombs was a huge step up in the interethnic warfare. Pales, Tinians, for the first time, found a strategic answer to Israel's overwhelming military superiority and succeeded in causing heavy losses on the Israeli side, paralyzing Israeli routines and economic and social life. Although the Islamic organizations initiated the use of this method, the underground military arms of Fater, for example, fighters of the Al-Aqsa brigades, began to sponsor the suicide bombings, as well, if only to compete for popular support. The Sway side attacks gained momentum and, in March 2002, became an almost daily event. Arab Jewish relations once again took on the familiar trappings of an interethnic war, in which not only armies and militias fought but a growing number of civilians found themselves both as pup, traitors, and victims. The chain of violence and counterviolence was further exacerbated by the Israeli army, which responded with pre size, and sometimes, tragically, not so precise, fire from helicopters, airplanes, and tanks. Afterwards, the army moved on to assassina, shins of those marked as the grassroots leaders of the Palestinian six, Olens and then, of Palestinian officials, as well.47. The goals of both sides in the renewed fighting were murky. Sometimes, each acted as if the violence was positioning it for a more advantageous position in upcoming bargaining, at other times, the violence seemed cathartic, in some instances, it seemed to be used only to mollify the public, and, in still other cases, each acted as if it could wear down and, ultimately, defeat the other, obvi, etting the need to partition the land. The last of these goals was the most ominous, bringing the primal fear of the other to the surface. Indeed, the new discourse in Israel on so-called transfer, forcibly re-moving Palestinians from the country, increased Palestinian fear. Now Palestinians began to raise the specter not only of continued occupation but also of the possibility of ethnic cleansing.48. Sharon, who was elected on the platform of the right-wing Likud party, called the national camp in Israeli political parlance, seemed to want a total nullification of the agreements and their political implications. Although he never declared this outright, 49 the policy of the Sharon government appeared to be intended to graduate, Ali and systematically destroy the agreements and the par institutional infrastructure and leadership, especially rejecting the leader, ship of Arafat, while carefully and gradually preparing Israeli and world opinion for these moves. 50 especially after the events of Seep, September 11, 2001, Sharon pushed the conception of Palestinian terror as part of the global terror against which the United States was fighting undoing the legitimacy that the Oslo Accord had conferred upon the Palestinian national movement. In any case, with the beginning of Operation Defense Shield in March 2001, Israel's military posture indicated that Israeli leaders believed that the uprising, indeed, any serious resistance to the occupation, could be defeated militarily. For his part, Arafat, ominously, more than once expressed his ambivalent relationship to the agreements with Israel. Several times, he cited to his Arabic-speaking listeners the Hudaybiyah agreement between the Prophet Muhammad and the Jewish tribes in the Arabian Peninsula. Muhammad signed this covenant during a period of weakness and out of exigency, but later, when his power increased, he broke the agreement and uprooted the tribes from their lands. Others, both in the Islamic groups and in Fater Milai, Tears, spoke openly of their belief that Palestinians could ultimately triumph completely, destroying Israel and setting up a Palestinian state in all of Palestine. Besides its brutal violence, the horror of the warfare lay in the retreat from an acceptance by each side of the inevitability and necessity of partitioning Palestine, of a two-state solution. 
One goal that emerged for the Palestinians in the process of the uprising was seeing it as a war of independence. The struggle in which the Palestinians were engaged was not unlike the wars and rebellions at the inception of other nation states, including, of course, Israel. These wars have created a set of heroic myths in the forging of new states. For Palestinians, the Intifada did certainly bring the kinds of internal struggles over the content of the national narrative and the revolt's ultimate aims that have marked the process in which new myths have been created in other new states. Here, a new martyrology, the Shahid who was willing to lay down his life through suicide bombing, was incorporated into the emerging narrative of the Palestinian people and a possible future state. The violence was seen as the antidote to continuing and creeping Israeli domination, especially through the Jewish settlements in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. At least in the earlier stages of the revolt, public opinion rallied strongly behind the suicide bombers. All sorts of new rituals, including mass funerals, wall posters, and the playing of pre-suicide videos, developed as part of the martyrology. But wars of liberation can as easily create victims among those who make them as among those at whom they are directed. In the course of the Intifada, Arafat himself seemed to become one of the Intifada's victims. Besieged in his presidential compound in Rommel, Lar during Israel's Operation Defense Shield in spring 2002, Arafat eventually bought his own freedom of movement by handing over others holed up in the compound with him. Among those in the compound with him were figures wanted by the Israelis, especially several who had allegedly participated in the assassination of an Israeli cabinet minister. Arafat's deal severely damaged his already diminishing prestige among Palestinians. Even before Arafat regained his freedom of movement, the siege itself had emphasized his weakness and his dependence on Israel, the Americans, and the Europeans. After the siege, for the first time, demands began to come from within the Palestine Authority for far-reaching governmental and legal reforms. 51 Quickly, those reforms were internationalized with the creation in July 2002 of the Task Force on Palestinian Reform, which included representatives from the United Nations, the United States, the Russian Federation, the European Union, Norway, Japan, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, and Israel, in addition to those from the Palestine. Authority. The task force S tabled seven groups examining reform in civil society, financial accountability, local government, market economy, elections, the judiciary, and the PA's administration. The furor over reform, of course, was a not so subtle swipe at the existing par leadership, S. Seely Arafat. It emphasized, too, the lack of autonomy for the Pales, Tyne Authority. Beyond the Intifada's biting Arafat's hand were more serious problems stemming from the continuing violence. With injuries to Palestinians numbering in the tens of thousands, permanent disability for a significant share of the population loomed on the Huri Zon. One study at Birzit University estimated that 13% of those wounded in the fighting would be permanently disabled. 52 initial indications were that about a quarter of these people were school age and as many 85% below 35 years of age. Institutions, too, were a major casualty of the war. Israel's upper Asian defense shield and, even more so, Operation Determined Path, begun in June 2002, inflicted the most devastating blow to the Palestine Authority's fledgling institutions. As one official put it, they sought to destroy anything that was a sign that we are a civilized people, 53 during and after the fighting. Israeli forces lev, held buildings, confiscated documents, destroyed equipment, van and dalized offices, and seized monies. In several ministries, for example, sledgehammers seem to have been used to destroy equipment and furniture, even toilets. 50 for the painstaking efforts that Palestinians had made from 1994 on in establishing a public sector were wiped away in a matter of weeks. The damage to the Palestinians was not only physical, and it was not confined to their fragile political institutions. Palestinian culture, too, came in for a battering. As in the decade after 1948, the trauma seemed to produce a lost generation. The closures of schools and universities, on top of all the mistime during the first intifada, 
not only increased functional illiteracy, it produced a generation without many of the skills that would be needed for rebuilding. As several Palestinian intellectuals lamented, it also pro-juiced youngsters whose greatest aspirations were inflicting death on themselves and others, whose hopes were not for this world but the world to come. The Oslo process was one in which, haltingly, Palestinians had begun moving their national story from victimhood and nostalgia for the lost garden and from resistance and armed struggle, to building institutions and gaining autonomy and to economic re nations and social reconstruction. It is difficult to say at this mo meant how difficult it will be to recapture the sense of purpose and the attentiveness to the challenges of internal reformation with which the Oslo period had instilled the Palestinian people within Palestine. At this writing, it is unclear whether the Intifada can truly be a war of liberation, liberating Palestinians not only from Israeli rule but from illusions about what the future holds for them. If the war of liberation can be a step toward internal reconstruction and acceptance of two states in historic Palestine, it will have succeeded. But if it leads only to the glorification of death and to the illusion that Israel, like the earlier crusader state, will simply melt away, then it will do nothing but prolong the Palestinians' bondage.